chapter one of antique hay this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org antique hay by aldous huxley chapter one gumbro theodore gumbro jr b a oxford sat in his oaken stall on the north side of the school chapel and wondered as he listened through the uneasy silence of half a thousand schoolboys to the first lesson pondered as he looked up at the vast window opposite all blue and jaundiced and bloody with nineteenth-century glass speculated in his rapid and rambling way about the existence and the nature of god standing in front of the spread brass eagle and fortified in his convictions by the sixth chapter of deuteronomy for this first sunday of term was the fifth after easter the rev pelvey could speak of these things with an enviable certainty here o israel he was booming out over the top of the portentous book the lord our god is one lord one lord mr pelvey knew he had studied theology but if theology and theosophy then why not theography and theometry why not theognomy theotrophy theotomy theogamy why not theophysics and theochemistry why not that ingenious toy the theotrope or wheel of gods why not a monumental theodrome in the great window opposite young david stood like a cock crowing on the dunghill of a tumbled giant from the middle of goliath's forehead there issued like a narwhal's budding horn a curious excrescence was it the embedded pebble or perhaps the giant's married life with all thine heart declaimed the rev pelvey and with all thy soul and with all thy might no but seriously gumbrel reminded himself the problem was very troublesome indeed god as a sense of warmth about the heart god as exultation god as tears in the eyes god as a rush of power or thought that was all right but god as truth god as two plus two equals four that wasn't so clearly all right was there any chance of their being the same were there bridges to join the two worlds and could it be that the rev pelvey m a fog horning away from behind the imperial bird could it be that he had an answer and a clue that was hardly believable particularly if one knew mr pelvey personally and gumbrel did and these words which i command thee this day retorted mr pelvey shall be in thine heart or in the heart or in the head reply mr pelvey reply gumbrel jumped between the horns of the dilemma and voted for other organs and thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up diligently to thy children gumbrel remembered his own childhood they had not been very diligently taught to him beetles black beetles his father had a really passionate feeling about the clergy mumbo jumbery was another of his favourite words an atheist and an anti-clerical of the strict old school he was not that in any case he gave himself much time to think about these things he was too busy being an unsuccessful architect as for gumbrel's mother her diligence had not been dogmatic she had just been diligently good that was all good good it was a word people only used nowadays with a kind of deprecating humorousness good beyond good and evil we are all that nowadays or merely below them like earwigs i glory in the name of earwig gumbrel made a mental gesture and inwardly declaimed but good in any case there was no getting out of that good she had been not nice not merely molto simpatica how charmingly and effectively these foreign tags assist one in the great task of calling a spade by some other name but good 
you felt the active radiance of her goodness when you were near her and that feeling was that less real and valid than two plus two the reverend pelvey had nothing to reply he was reading with a holy gusto of houses full of all good things which thou fillest not and wells digged which thou diggest not vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not she had been good and she had died when he was still a boy died but he hadn't been told that till much later of creeping and devouring pain malignant disease o oh, caro nome thou shalt fear the lord thy god said mr pelvey even when the ulcers are benign thou shalt fear he had travelled up from school to see her just before she died he hadn't known that she was going to die but when he entered her room when he saw her lying so weakly in the bed he had suddenly begun to cry uncontrollably all the fortitude the laughter even had been hers and she had spoken to him a few words only but they had contained all the wisdom he needed to live by she had told him what he was and what he should try to be and how to be it and crying still crying he had promised that he would try and the lord commanded us to do all these statutes said mr pelvey for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day and had he kept his promise gumbrell wondered had he preserved himself alive here endeth the first lesson mr pelvey retreated from the eagle and the organ presaged the coming te deum gumbrell hoisted himself to his feet the folds of his b a gown billowed nobly about him as he rose he sighed and shook his head with the gesture of one who tries to shake off a fly or an importunate thought when the time came for singing he sang on the opposite side of the chapel two boys were grinning and whispering to one another behind their lifted prayer-books gumbrell frowned at them ferociously the two boys caught his eye and their faces at once took on an expression of sickly piety they began to sing with unction they were two ugly stupid-looking louts who ought to have been apprenticed years ago to some useful trade instead of which they were wasting their own and their teachers and their more intelligent comrades time in trying quite vainly to acquire an elegant literary education the minds of dogs gumbro reflected do not benefit by being treated as though they were the minds of men o oh lord have mercy upon us have mercy upon us gumbro shrugged his shoulders and looked round the chapel at the faces of the boys lord indeed have mercy upon us he was disturbed to find the sentiment echoed on a somewhat different note in the second lesson which was drawn from the twenty-third chapter of st luke father forgive them said mr pelvey in his unvarying juicy voice for they know not what they do ah but suppose one did know what one was doing suppose one knew only too well and of course one always did know one was not a fool but this was all nonsense all nonsense one must think of something better than this what a comfort it would be for example if one could bring air cushions into chapels these polished oaken stalls were devilishly hard they were meant for stout and lusty pedagogues not for bony starvelings like himself an air cushion a oh, delicious new here endeth boomed mr pelvey closing his book on the back of the german eagle as if by magic dr jolly was ready at the organ with the benedictus it was positively a relief to stand again this oak was adamantine but air cushions alas would be too bad an example for the boys hardy young spartans it was an essential part of their education that they should listen to the word of revelation without pneumatic easement no air cushions wouldn't do the real remedy it suddenly flashed across his mind would be trousers with pneumatic seats for all occasions not merely for church-going the organ blew a thin puritan preacher's note through one of its hundred nostrils i believe with a noise like the breaking of a wave five hundred turned towards the east the view of david and goliath was exchanged for a crucifixion in the grand manner of eighteen hundred and sixty 
father forgive them for they know not what they do no no gumbrell preferred to look at the grooved stonework rushing smoothly up on either side of the great east window towards the vaulted roof preferred to reflect like the dutiful son of an architect he was that perpendicular at its best and its best is its largest is the finest sort of english gothic at its worst and smallest as in most of the colleges of oxford it is mean petty and but for a certain picturesqueness almost wholly disgusting he felt like a lecturer next slide please and the life everlasting amen like an oboe mr felby intoned the lord be with you for prayer gumbrell reflected there would be dunlop knees still in the days when he had made a habit of praying they hadn't been necessary our father the words were the same as they were in the old days but mr pelvey's method of reciting them made them sound rather different her dresses when he had leaned his forehead against her knee to say those words those words good lord that mr pelvey was oboeing out of existence were always black in the evenings and of silk and smelt of forest root and when she was dying she had said to him remember the parable of the sower and the seas that fell in shallow ground no no amen decidedly o lord show thy mercy upon us chanted obo pelvey and gumbrell trombone responded profoundly and grotesquely and grant us thy salvation no the knees were obviously less important except for people like revivalists and housemaids than the seat sedentary are commoner than genuflectory professions one would introduce little flat rubber bladders between two layers of cloth at the upper end hidden when one wore a coat would be a tube with a valve like a hollow tail blow it up and there would be perfect comfort even for the boniest even on rock how did the greeks stand marble benches in their theatres the moment had now come for the hymn this being the first sunday of the summer term they sang that special hymn written by the headmaster with music by dr jolly on purpose to be sung on the first sundays of terms the organ quietly sketched out the tune simple it was uplifting and manly one two three four one two three four one two and three and four and one two three four one two three four one two three four and one two three four one two three four one two and three four one two three four five hundred flawed adolescent voices took it up for good example's sake gumbrell opened and closed his mouth noiselessly however it was only at the third verse that he gave rein to his uncertain baritone he particularly liked the third verse it marked in his opinion the headmaster's highest poetical achievement f for slack hands and dim idle minds m f mischief still the tempter finds f f keep him captive in his lair at this point dr jolly enriched his tune with a thick accompaniment in the lower registers artfully designed to symbolize the depth the gloom and general repulsiveness of the tempter's home f f keep him captive in his lair f work will bind him dim work is p p prayer work thought gumbrell work lord how passionately he disliked work let austin have his swink to him reserved ah if only one had work of one's own proper work decent work not forced upon one by the griping of one's belly amen dr jolly blew the two sumptuous jets of reverence into the air gumbrell accompanied them with all his heart amen indeed gumbrell sat down again it might be convenient he thought to have the tail so long that one could blow up one's trousers while one actually had them on in which case it would have to be coiled round the waist like a belt or looped up perhaps and fastened to a clip on one's braces the nineteenth chapter of the acts of the apostles part of the thirty-fourth verse the headmaster's loud harsh voice broke violently out from the pulpit all with one voice for the space of about two hours cried out 
great as diana of the ephesians gumbrell composed himself as comfortably as he could on his oaken seat he was going to be one of the headmaster's real swinging sermons great as diana and venus ah these seats these seats gumbrell did not attend evening chapel he stayed at home in his lodgings to correct the sixty-three holiday task papers which had fallen to his share they lay thick piles of them on the floor beside his chair sixty-three answers to ten questions about the italian risorgimento the risorgimento of all subjects it had been one of the headmaster's caprices he had called a special master's meeting at the end of last term to tell them all about the risorgimento it was his latest discovery the risorgimento gentlemen is the most important event in modern european history and he had banged the table he had looked defiantly round the room in search of contradictors but nobody had contradicted him nobody ever did they all knew better for the headmaster was as fierce as he was capricious he was for ever discovering something new two terms ago it had been singeing after the haircut and before the shampoo there must be singeing the hair gentleman is a tube if you cut it and leave the end unsealed the water will get in and rot the tube hence the importance of singeing gentlemen singeing seals the tube i shall address the boys about it after chapel to-morrow morning and i trust that all housemasters and he had glared around him from under his savage eyebrows will see that their boys get themselves regularly singed after cutting for weeks afterwards every boy trailed behind him a faint and nauseating whiff of burning as though he were fresh from hell and now it was the risorgimento one of these days gumbel reflected it would be birth control or the decimal system or rational dress he picked up the nearest batch of papers the printed questions were pinned to the topmost of them give a brief account of the character and career of pope pius the ninth with dates wherever possible gumbel leaned back in his chair and thought of his own character with dates eighteen ninety six the first serious and conscious and deliberate lie did you break that vase theodore no mother it lay on his conscience for nearly a month eating deeper and deeper then he had confessed the truth or rather he had not confessed that was too difficult he led the conversation very subtly as he thought round through the non malleability of glass through breakages in general to this particular broken vase he practically forced his mother to repeat her question and then with a burst of tears he had answered yes it had always been difficult for him to say things directly point-blank his mother had told him when she was dying no no not that in eighteen ninety eight or eighteen ninety nine oh these dates he had made a pact with his little cousin molly that she should let him see her with no clothes on if he would do the same by her she had fulfilled her part of the bargain but he overwhelmed at the last moment by a passion of modesty had broken his promise then when he was about twelve and still at his preparatory school in nineteen o two or nineteen o three he had done badly in his exams on purpose he had been frightened of sadler who was in the same form and wanted to get the prize sadler was stronger than he was and had a genius for persecution he had done so badly that his mother was unhappy and it was impossible for him to explain in nineteen o six he had fallen in love for the first time ah much more violently than ever since with a boy of his own age platonic it had been and profound he had done badly that term too not on purpose but because he had spent so much time helping young vickers with his work vickers was really very stupid the next term he had come out staphylococcus pyrogenes as a lover of growing adolescence with spots and boils all over his face and neck gumbrell's affection ceased as suddenly as it had begun he finished that term he remembered with a second prize but it was time to be thinking seriously of pio nono with a sigh of disgusted weariness gumbrell looked at his papers what had Valerope major to say of the pontiff pius the ninth was called ferretti he was a liberal before he was a pope a kindly man of less than average intelligence he thought that all difficulties could be settled by a little good will a few reforms and a political amnesty he wrote several encyclicals and a syllabus gumbrell admired the phrase 
about less than average intelligence Valerope major should have at least one mark for having learnt it so well by heart he turned to the next paper higgs was of opinion that pius the ninth was a good but stupid man who thought he could settle the risorgimento with a few reforms and a political armistice Beddoes was severer pius nine was a bad man who said that he was infallible which showed he had a less than average intelligence sopwith minor shared the general opinion about pio's intelligence and displayed a great familiarity with the wrong dates Clegweller was voluminous and informative pius nine was not so clever as his prime minister cardinal antonelli when he came to the tiara he was a liberal and metternich said he had never reckoned on a liberal pope he then became a conservative he was kindly but not intelligent and he thought garibaldi and cavour would be content with a few reforms and an amnesty at the top of garstang's paper was written i have had measles all the holidays so have been unable to read more than the first thirty pages of the book pope pius nine does not come into these pages of the contents of which i will proceed to give the following precis and the precis duly followed Gumbrell would have liked to give him full marks but the business-like answer of appiard called him back to a better sense of his duty pius nine became pope in eighteen forty six and died in eighteen seventy eight he was a kindly man but his intelligence was below the Gumbrell laid the paper down and shut his eyes no this was really impossible definitely it couldn't go on it could not go on there were thirteen weeks in the summer term there would be thirteen in the autumn and eleven or twelve in the spring and then another summer of thirteen and so it would go on for ever for ever it wouldn't do he would go away and live uncomfortably on his three hundred or no he would go away and he would make money that was more like it money on a large scale easily he would be free and he would live for the first time he would live behind his closed eyes he saw himself living over the plushy floors of some vast and ignoble ritz slowly he walked at ease with confidence over the plushy floors and there at the end of a long vista there was myra vivish waiting this time for him coming forward impatiently to meet him his abject lover now not the cool free laughing mistress who had lent herself contemptuously once to his pathetic and silent importunity and then after a day withdrawn the gift again over the plushy floors to dine not that he was in love with myra any longer but revenge is sweet he sat in his own house the chinese statues looked out from the niches the malolos passionately meditated slept and were more than alive the goyas hung on the walls there was a boucher in the bathroom and when he entered with his guests what a piazzetta exploded above the dining-room mantelpiece over the ancient wine they talked together and he knew everything they knew and more he gave he inspired it was the others who assimilated and were enriched after dinner there were mozart quartets he opened his portfolios and showed his daumier his tiepolos his canaletto sketches his drawings by picasso and lewis and the purity of his naked angre and later talking of odalisk there were orgies without fatigue or disgust and the women were pictures and lust in action art over the empty plains forty horses impelled him towards mantua rub-a-dub a dub a dub with the silencer out towards the most romantic city in all the world when he spoke to women how easily and insolently he spoke now they listened and laughed and looked at him sideways and dropped their eyelids over the admission the invitation of their glance with phyllis once he had sat for how long in a warm and moonless darkness saying nothing risking no gesture and in the end they had parted reluctantly and still in silence phyllis now was with him once again in the summer night but this time he spoke now softly now in the angry breathless whisper of desire he reached out and took her and she was naked in his arms all chance encounters all plotted opportunities recurred he knew now how to live how to take advantage of them over the empty plains towards mantua towards mantua he slid along at ease free and alone he explored the horrors of roman society visited athens and seville to unamuno and papini he conversed familiarly in their own tongues he understood perfectly and without effort the quantum theory to his friend sheerwater 
he gave half a million for physiological research he visited schoenberg and persuaded him to write still better music he exhibited to the politicians the full extent of their stupidity and their wickedness he set them working for the salvation not the destruction of humanity once in the past when he had been called upon to make a public speech he had felt so nervous that he was sick the thousands who listened to him now bent like wheat under the wind of his eloquence but it was only by the way and occasionally that he troubled himself to move them he found it easy now to come to terms with every one he met to understand all points of view to identify himself with even the most unfamiliar spirit and he knew how everybody lived and what it was like to be a mill girl a dustman an engine driver a jew an anglican bishop a confidence trickster accustomed as he was to being swindled and imposed upon without protest he now knew the art of being brutal he was just dressing down that insolent porter at the continental who had complained that ten francs wasn't enough and had got as a matter of historic fact another five in addition when his landlady gave a knock opened the door and said dinner is ready mr gumbrell feeling a little ashamed at having been interrupted in what was after all one of the ignobler and more trivial occupations of his new life gumbel went down to his fatty chop and green peas it was the first meal to be eaten under the new dispensation he ate it for all that it was unhappily indistinguishable from the meals of the past with elation and a certain solemnity as though he were partaking of a sacrament he felt buoyant with the thought that at last he was doing something about life when the chop was eaten he went upstairs and after filling two suitcases and a gladstone bag with the most valued of his possessions addressed himself to the task of writing to the headmaster he might have gone away of course without writing but it would be nobler more in keeping he thought with his new life to leave a justification behind or rather not a justification a denouncement he picked up his pen and denounced End of chapter one chapter two of antic hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two gumbrel senior occupied a tall narrow-shouldered and rachitic house in a little obscure square not far from paddington there were five floors and a basement with beetles and nearly a hundred stairs which shook when any one ran too rudely down them it was a prematurely old and decaying house in a decaying quarter the square in which it stood was steadily coming down in the world the houses which a few years ago had all been occupied by respectable families were now split up into squalid little maisonettes and from the neighbouring slums which along with most other unpleasant things the old bourgeois families had been able to ignore invading bands of children came to sport on the once sacred pavements mr gumbrel was almost the last survivor of the old inhabitants he liked his house and he liked his square social decadence had not affected the fourteen plane trees which adorned its little garden and the gambols of the dirty children did not disturb the starlings who came evening by evening in summer time to roost in their branches on fine evenings he used to sit out on his balcony waiting for the coming of the birds and just at sunset when the sky was most golden there would be a twittering overhead in the black innumerable flocks of starlings would come sweeping across on the way from their daily haunts to their roosting places chosen so capriciously among the tree-planted squares and gardens of the city and so tenaciously retained year after year to the exclusion of every other place why his fourteen plane trees should have been chosen mr gumbrel could never imagine there were plenty of larger and more umbrageous gardens all round but they remained birdless while every evening from the larger flocks 
a faithful legion detached itself to settle clamorously among his trees they sat and chattered till the sun went down and twilight was passed with intervals every now and then of silence that fell suddenly and inexplicably on all the birds at once lasted through a few seconds of thrilling suspense to end as suddenly and senselessly in an outburst of the same loud and simultaneous conversation the starlings were mr gumbrell's most affectionately cherished friends sitting out on his balcony to watch and listen to them he had caught at the shut of treacherous evenings many colds and chills on the liver he had laid up for himself many painful hours of rheumatism these little accidents did nothing however to damp his affection for the birds and still on every evening that could possibly be called fine he was always to be seen in the twilight sitting on the balcony gazing up round spectacled and rapt at the fourteen plain trees the breezes stirred in his grey hair tossing it up in long light wisps that fell across his forehead and over his spectacles and then he would shake his head impatiently and the bony hand would be freed for a moment from its unceasing combing and clutching of the sparse grey beard to push back the stray tendrils to smooth and reduce to order the whole ruffled head the birds chattered on the hand went back to its clutching and combing once more the wind blew darkness came down and the gas lamps round the square lit up the outer leaves of the plane trees touched the privet bushes inside the railings with an emerald light behind them was impenetrable night instead of shorn grass and bedded geraniums there was mystery there were endless depths and the birds at last were silent mr gumbel would get up from his iron chair stretch his arms and his stiff cold legs and go in through the french window to work the birds were his diversion when they were silent it was time to think of serious matters to-night however he was not working for always on sunday evenings his old friend porteus came to dine and talk breaking in unexpectedly at midnight gumbel jr found them sitting in front of the gas fire in his father's study my dear fellow what on earth are you doing here gumbrell senior jumped up excitedly at his son's entrance the light silky hair floated up with the movement turned for a moment into a silver aureole then subsided again mr porteous stayed where he was calm solid and undishevelled as a seated pillar box he wore a monocle on a black ribbon a black stock tie that revealed above its double folds a quarter of an inch of stiff white collar a double-breasted black coat a pair of pale check trousers and patent leather boots with cloth tops mr porteous was very particular about his appearance meeting him casually for the first time one would not have guessed that mr porteous was an expert on late latin poetry and he did not mean that you should guess thin-limbed bent and agile in his loose crumpled clothes gumbrell senior had the air beside mr porteous of a strangely animated scarecrow what on earth the old gentleman repeated his question gumbrell junior shrugged his shoulders i was bored i decided to cease being a schoolmaster he spoke with a fine airy assumption of carelessness how are you mr porteous thank you invariably well 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 said gumbrell senior sitting down again i must say i'm not surprised i'm only surprised that you stood it not being a born pedagogue for as long as you did whatever induced you to think of turning usher i can't imagine he looked at his son first through his spectacles then over the top of them the motives of the boy's conduct revealed themselves to neither vision what else was there for me to do asked gumbrell junior pulling up a chair towards the fire you gave me a pedagogue's education and washed your hands of me no opportunities no openings i had no alternative 
and now you reproach me mr gumbrell made an impatient gesture you're talking nonsense he said the only point of the kind of education you had is this it gives a young man leisure to find out what he's interested in you apparently weren't sufficiently interested in anything i'm interested in everything interrupted gumbrell jr which comes to the same thing said his father parenthetically as being interested in nothing and he went on from the point at which he had been interrupted you weren't sufficiently interested in anything to want to devote yourself to it that was why you sought the last refuge of feeble minds with classical educations you became a schoolmaster come come said mr porteous i do a little teaching myself i must stand up for the profession gumbel senior let go his beard and brushed back the hair that the wind of his own vehemence had brought tumbling into his eyes i don't denigrate the profession he said not at all it would be an excellent profession if every one who went into it were as much interested in teaching as you are in your job porteous or i in mine it's these undecided creatures like theodore who ruin it by drifting in until all teachers are geniuses and enthusiasts nobody will learn anything except what they teach themselves still said mr porteous i wish i hadn't had to learn so much by myself i wasted a lot of time finding out how to set to work and where to discover what i wanted gumbrell jr was lighting his pipe i have come to the conclusion he said speaking in little jerks between each suck of the flame into the bowl that most people ought never to be taught anything at all he threw away the match lord have mercy upon us they are dogs what's the use of teaching them anything except to behave well to work and obey facts theories the truth about the universe what good are those to them teach them to understand why it only confuses them makes them lose hold of the simple real appearance not more than one in a hundred can get any good out of a scientific or literary education and you're one of the ones asked his father that goes without saying gumbrell jr replied i think you mayn't be so far wrong said mr porteous when i think of my own children for example he sighed i thought they'd be interested in the things that interested me they don't seem to be interested in anything but behaving like little apes not very anthropoid ones either for that matter at my eldest boy's age i used to sit up most of the night reading latin texts he sits up or rather stands reels trots up dancing and drinking do you remember st bernard vigile tota nocta luxuriosus non solum patienter the ascetic and the scholar only watch patiently said et libentur ut suam expleat wo tatum what the wise man does out of a sense of duty the fool does for fun and i've tried very hard to make him like latin well in any case said gumbrell jr you didn't try to feed him on history that's the real unforgivable sin and that's what i've been doing up till this evening encouraging boys of fifteen and sixteen to specialize in history hours and hours a week making them read bad writers generalizations about subjects on which only our ignorance allows us to generalize teaching them to reproduce these generalizations in horrid little essays of their own rotting their minds in fact with a diet of soft vagueness scandalous it was if these creatures are to be taught anything it should be something hard and definite latin that's excellent mathematics physical science let them read history for amusement certainly but for heaven's sake don't make it the staple of education gumbrell jr spoke with the greatest earnestness as though he were an inspector of schools making a report it was a subject on which at the moment he felt very profoundly he felt profoundly on all subjects while he was talking about them i wrote a long letter to the headmaster about the teaching of history this evening he added it's most important he shook his head thoughtfully most important ora novissima tempora pessima sunt ve je lemus said mr porteous in the words of st peter damianus very true gumbrell senior applauded and talking about bad times theodore what do you propose to do now may i ask i mean to begin by making some money gumbrell senior put his hands on his knees bent forward and laughed ha 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 he had a profound 
bell-like laugh that was like the croaking of a very large and melodious frog you won't he said and shook his head till the hair fell into his eyes you won't and he laughed again to make money said mr porteous one must be really interested in money and he's not said gumbrel senior none of us are when i was still uncommonly hard up mr porteous continued we used to lodge in the same house with a russian jew who was a furrier that man was interested in money if you like it was a passion an enthusiasm an idea he could have led a comfortable easy life and still have made enough to put by something for his old age but for his high abstract ideal of money he suffered more than michelangelo ever suffered for his art he used to work nineteen hours a day and the other five he slept lying under his bench in the dirt breathing into his lungs the stink and the broken hairs he is now very rich indeed and does nothing with his money doesn't want to do anything doesn't know what one does do with it he desires neither power nor pleasure his desire for lucre is purely disinterested he reminds me of browning's grammarian i have a great admiration for him mr porteous's own passion had been for the poems of notker babulus and st bernard it had taken him nearly twenty years to get himself and his family out of the house where the russian furrier used to lodge but notker was worth it he used to say notker was worth even the weariness and the pallor of a wife who worked beyond her strength even the shabbiness of ill-dressed and none too well-fed children he had readjusted his monocle and gone on but there had been occasions when it needed more than the monocle and the careful distinguished clothes to keep up his morale still those times were over now notker had brought him at last a kind of fame even indirectly a certain small prosperity gumbrel senior turned once more towards his son and how do you propose he asked to make this money gumbrel junior explained he had thought it all out in the cab on the way from the station it came to me this morning he said in chapel during service monstrous put in gumbrel senior with a genuine indignation monstrous these mediaeval survivals in schools chapel indeed it came gumbrel junior went on like an apocalypse suddenly like a divine inspiration a grand and luminous idea came to me the idea of gumbrel's patent small clothes and what are gumbrel's patent small clothes a boon to those whose occupation is sedentary gumbrel junior had already composed his prospectus and his first advertisements a comfort to all travellers civilization's substitute for steetopagism indispensable to first-nighters the concert-goer's friend the lectulus dei floridus intoned mr porteous gazo phylacium ecclesi cythera benesonans dei kimbalum jubilationis christi promptuarium mysteriorium fide ora pro nobis your small clothes sound to me like one of my old litanies theodore we want scientific descriptions not litanies said gumbrel senior what are gumbrel's patent small clothes scientifically then said gumbrel junior my patent small clothes may be described as trousers with a pneumatic seat inflatable by means of a tube fitted with a valve the whole constructed of stout seamless red rubber enclosed between two layers of cloth i must say said gumbrel senior on a tone of somewhat grudging approbation i have heard of worse inventions you are too stout porteous to be able to appreciate the idea we gumbrels are all a bony lot when i have taken out a patent for my invention his son went on very business-like and cool i shall either sell it to some capitalist or i shall exploit it commercially myself in either case i shall make money which is more i may say than you or any other gumbrel have ever done quite right said gumbrel senior quite right and he laughed very cheerfully and nor will you you can be grateful to your intolerable aunt flo for having left you that three hundred a year you'll need it but if you really want a capitalist he went on i've exactly the man for you he's a man who has a mania for buying tudor houses and making them more tudor than they are i pulled half a dozen of the wretched things to pieces and put them together again differently for him he doesn't sound much good to me said his son ah but that's only his vice only his amusement his business gumbrel senior hesitated well what is his business well it seems to be everything patent medicine trade newspapers bankrupt tobacconist stock 
he's talked to me about those and heaps more he seems to flit like a butterfly in search of honey or rather money and he makes it well he pays my fees and he buys more tudor houses and he gives me luncheons at the ritz that's all i know well there's no harm in trying i'll write to him said gumbrell senior his name is boldero he'll either laugh at your idea or take it and give you nothing for it still he looked at his son over the top of his spectacles if by any conceivable chance you ever should become rich if 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 and he emphasized the remoteness of the conditional by raising his eyebrows a little higher by throwing out his hands in a dubious gesture a little farther at every repetition of the word if why then i've got exactly the thing for you look at this really delightful little idea i had this afternoon he put his hand in his coat pocket and after some sorting and sifting produced a sheet of squared paper on which was roughly drawn the elevation of a house for any one with eight or ten thousand to spend this would be this would be gumbrell senior smoothed his hair and hesitated searching for something strong enough to say of his little idea well this would be much too good for most of the greasy devils who do have eight or ten thousand to spend he passed the sheet to gumbrell junior who held it out so that both mr porteous and himself could look at it gumbrell senior got up from his chair and standing behind them leant over to elucidate and explain you see the idea he said anxious lest they should fail to understand a central block of three stories with low wings of only one ending in pavilions with a second floor and the flat roofs of the wings are used as gardens you see protected from the north by a wall in the east wing there is the kitchen and the garage with the maids rooms and the pavilion at the end the west is a library and it has an arched loggia along the front and instead of a solid superstructure corresponding to the maids rooms there's a pergola with brick piers you see and in the main block there's a spanish sort of balcony along the whole length at first floor level that gives a good horizontal line and you get the perpendiculars with coins and raised panels and the roof's hidden by a balustrade and there are balustrades along the open sides of the roof gardens on the wings all in brick it is this is the garden front the entrance front will be admirable too do you like it grumble junior nodded very much he said his father sighed and taking the sketch put it back into his pocket you must hurry up with your ten thousand he said and you porteous and you i've been waiting so long to build your splendid house laughing mr porteous got up from his chair and long dear gumbrell he said may you continue to wait for my splendid house won't be built this side of new jerusalem and you must go on living a long time yet a long long time mr porteous repeated and carefully he buttoned up his double-breasted coat carefully as though he were adjusting an instrument of precision he took out and replaced his monocle then very erect and neat very soldierly and pillar boxical he marched towards the door you've kept me very late to-night he said unconscionably late the front door closed heavily behind mr porteous's departure gumbrell senior came upstairs again into the big room on the first floor smoothing down his hair which the impetuosity of his ascent had once more disarranged that's a good fellow he said of his departed guest a splendid fellow i always admire the monocle said gumbrell junior irrelevantly but his father turned the irrelevance into relevance he couldn't have come through without it i believe it was a symbol a proud flag poverty squalid not fine at all the monocle made a kind of difference you understand i'm always so enormously thankful i had a little money i couldn't have stuck it without it needs strength more strength than i've got he clutched his beard close under the chin and remained for a moment pensively silent the advantage of porteous's line of business he went on at last reflectively is that it can be carried on by oneself without collaboration there's no need to appeal to any one outside oneself or to have any dealings with other people at all if one doesn't want to that's so deplorable about architecture there's no privacy so to speak always this horrible jostling with clients and builders and contractors and people before one can get anything done it's really revolting i'm not good at people most of them i don't like at all not at all mr gumbrell repeated with vehemence i don't deal with them very well it isn't my business my business is architecture but i don't often get a chance of practising it not properly gumbrell senior smiled rather sadly still he said i can do something i have my talent i have my imagination they can't take those from me 
come and see what i've been doing lately he led the way out of the room and mounted two steps at a time towards a higher floor he opened the door of what should have been in a well-ordered house the best bedroom and slipped into the darkness don't rush in he called back to his son for god's sake don't rush in you'll smash something wait till i've turned on the light it's so like these asinine electricians to have hidden the switch behind the door like this Crumble junior heard him fumbling in the darkness there was suddenly light he stepped in the only furniture in the room consisted of a couple of long trestle tables on these on the mantelpiece and all over the floor were scattered confusedly like the elements of a jumbled city a vast collection of architectural models there were cathedrals there were town halls universities public libraries there were three or four elegant little skyscrapers there were blocks of offices huge warehouses factories and finally dozens of magnificent country mansions complete with their terrace gardens their noble flights of steps their fountains and ornamental waters and grandly bridged canals their little rococo pavilions and garden houses aren't they beautiful gumbrel senior turned enthusiastically towards his son his long gray hair floated wistfully about his head his spectacles flashed and behind them his eyes shone with emotion beautiful gumbrel junior agreed when you're really rich said his father i'll build you one of these and he pointed to a little village of chatsworth's clustering at one end of a long table round the dome of a vaster and austere st peter's look at this one for example he picked his way nimbly across the room seized the little electric reading lamp that stood between a railway station and a baptistery on the mantelpiece and was back again in an instant trailing behind him a long flex so that as it tautened out twitched one of the crowning pinnacles off the top of a skyscraper near the fireplace look he repeated look he switched on the current and moving the lamp back and forth up and down in front of the miniature palace see the beauty of the light and shade he said there underneath the great ponderous cornice isn't that fine and look how splendidly the pilasters carry up the vertical lines and then the solidity of it the size the immense impending bleakness of it he threw up his arms he turned his eyes upwards as though standing overwhelmed at the foot of some huge precipitous facade the lights and shadows vacillated wildly through all the city of palaces and domes as he brandished the lamp in ecstasy above his head and then he had suddenly stooped down he was peering and pointing once more into the details of his palace then there's the doorway all florid and rich with carving how magnificently and surprisingly it flowers out of the bare walls like the colossal writing of darius like the figures graven in the ball face of the precipice over behistun unexpected and beautiful and human human in the surrounding emptiness gumbrel senior brushed back his hair and turned smiling to look at his son over the top of his spectacles very fine gumbrel junior nodded to him but isn't the wall a little too blank you seem to allow very few windows in this vast palazzo true his father replied very true he sighed i'm afraid this design would hardly do for england it's meant for a place where there's some sun where you do your best to keep the light out instead of letting it in as you have to do it here windows are the curse of architecture in this country your walls have to be like sieves all holes it's heartbreaking if you wanted me to build you this house you'd have to live in barbados or somewhere like that there's nothing i should like better said gumbrel junior another great advantage of sunny countries gumbrel senior pursued is that one can really live like an aristocrat in privacy by oneself no need to look out on the dirty world or to let the dirty world look in on you here's this great house for example looking out on the world through a few dark portholes and a single cavernous doorway but look inside he held his lamp above the courtyard that was at the heart of the palace gumbrel junior leaned and looked like his father all the life looks inwards into a lovely courtyard a more than spanish patio look there at the treble tiers of arcades the vaulted cloisters for your cool peripatetic meditations the central triton spouting white water into a marble pool the mosaic work on the floor and flowering up the walls brilliant against the white stucco and there's the archway that leads out into the gardens and now you must come and have a look at the garden front he walked round with his lamp to the other side of the table there was suddenly a crash the wire had twitched a cathedral from off the table it lay on the floor in disastrous ruin as though shattered by some appalling cataclysm 
hell and death said gumbrel senior in an outburst of elizabethan fury he put down the lamp and ran to see how irreparable the disaster had been they are so horribly expensive these models he explained as he bent over the ruins tenderly he picked up the pieces and replaced them on the table it might have been worse he said at last brushing the dust off his hands though i am afraid that dome will never be quite the same again picking up the lamp once more he held it high above his head and stood looking out with a melancholy satisfaction over his creations and to think he said after a pause that i have been spending these last days designing model cottages for workmen at blenchley i am in luck to have got the job of course but really that a civilized man should have to do jobs like that it's too much in the old days these creatures built their own hovels and very nice and suitable they were too the architects busied themselves with architecture which is the expression of human dignity and greatness which is man's protest not his miserable acquiescence you can't do much protesting in a model cottage at seven hundred pounds a time a little no doubt you can protest a little you can give your cottage decent proportions and avoid sordidness and vulgarity but that's all it's really a negative process you can only begin to protest positively and actively when you abandon the petty human scale and build for giants when you build for the spirit and the imagination of man not for his little body model cottages indeed mr gumbrell snorted with indignation when i think of alberti and he thought of alberti alberti the noblest roman of them all the true and only roman for the romans themselves had lived their own actual lives sordidly and extravagantly in the middle of a vulgar empire alberti and his followers in the renaissance lived the ideal roman life they put plutarch into their architecture they took the detestable real cato the brutus of history and made of them roman heroes to walk as guides and models before them before alberti there were no true romans and with peronese's death the race began to wither towards extinction and when i think of brunelleschi gumbrell senior went on to remember with passion the architect who had suspended on eight thin flying ribs of marble the lightest of all domes and the loveliest and when of michelangelo the grim enormous apse and of wren and of palladio when i think of all these gumbrell senior waved his arms and was silent he could not put into words what he felt when he thought of them gumbrell junior looked at his watch half past two he said time to go to bed End of chapter two chapter three of antique hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three mr gumbrell surprise was mingled with delight this is indeed a pleasure delight was now the prevailing emotion expressed by the voice that advanced as yet without a visible source from the dark recesses of the shop the pleasure mr bojanus is mine cumbrell closed the shop door behind him a very small man dressed in a frock coat popped out from a canyon that opened a mere black crevice between two stratified precipices of mid-season suitings and advancing into the open space before the door bowed with an old world grace revealing a nacreous scalp thinly mantled with long damp creepers of brown hair and to what may i ask do i owe this pleasure sir mr bojanus looked up archly with a sideways cock of his head that tilted the rigid points of his waxed moustache the fingers of his right hand were thrust into the bosom of his frock coat and his toes were turned out in the dancing master's first position a light spring great coat is it or a new suit i notice his eye travelled professionally up and down gumbrell's long thin form i notice that the garments you are wearing at present mr gumbrell look how shall i say well a trifle neglige as the french would put it a trifle neglige 
gumbrell looked down at himself he resented mr bojanus's neglige he was pained and wounded by the aspersion neglige and he had fancied that he really looked rather elegant and distinguished but after all he always looked that even in rags no that he looked positively neat like mr porteous positively soldierly in his black jacket and his musical comedy trousers and his patent leather shoes and the black felt hat didn't that just add the foreign the southern touch which saved the whole composition from banality he regarded himself trying to see his clothes garments mr bojanus had called them garments good lord through the tailor's expert eyes there were sagging folds about the overloaded pockets there was a stain on his waistcoat the knees of his trousers were baggy and puckered like the bare knees of elan fourmont and rubens's fur coat portrait at vienna yes it was all horribly neglige he felt depressed but looking at mr bojanus's studied and professional correctness he was a little comforted that frock coat for example it was like something in a very modern picture such a smooth and wrinkled cylinder about the chest such a sense of pure and abstract conicness in the sleekly rounded skirts nothing could have been less neglige he was reassured i want you he said at last clearing his throat importantly to make me a pair of trousers to a novel specification of my own it's a new idea and he gave a brief description of gumbrell's patent small clothes mr bojanus listened with attention i can make them for you he said when the description was finished i can make them for you if you really wish mr gumbrell he added thank you said gumbrell and do you intend may i ask mr gumbrell to wear these these garments guiltily gumbrell denied himself only to demonstrate the idea mr bojanus i am exploiting the invention commercially you see commercially i see mr gumbrell perhaps you would like a share suggested gumbrell mr bojanus shook his head it wouldn't do for my clientele i fear mr gumbrell you could hardly expect the best people to wear such things couldn't you mr bojanus went on shaking his head i know them he said i know the best people well and he added with an irrelevance that was perhaps only apparent between ourselves mr gumbrell i am a great admirer of lenin so am i said gumbrell theoretically but then i have so little to lose to lenin i can afford to admire him but you mr bojanus you the prosperous bourgeois oh purely in the economic sense of the word mr bojanus mr bojanus accepted the explanation with one of his old-world bows you would be among the first to suffer if an english lenin were to start his activities here there mr gumbel if i may be allowed to say so you are wrong mr bojanus removed his hand from his bosom and employed it to emphasize the points of his discourse when the revolution comes mr gumbel the great and necessary revolution as alderman beckford called it it won't be the owning of a little money that'll get a man into trouble it'll be his class habits mr gumbel his class speech his class education it'll be shibboleth all over again mr gumbel mark my words the red guards will stop people in the street and ask them to say some such word as towel if they call it towel like you and your friends mr gumbel why then mr bojanus went through the gestures of pointing a rifle and pulling the trigger he clicked his tongue against his teeth to symbolize the report that'll be the end of them but if they say tay all like the rest of us mr grumble it'll be past friend and long live the proletariat long live tay all i'm afraid you may be right said grumble i'm convinced of it said mr bojanus it's my clients mr grumble it's the best people that the other people resent it's their confidence their ease it's the habit their money and their position give them of ordering people about it's the way they take their place in the world for granted 
it's their prestige which the other people would like to deny but can't it's all that mr gumbrell that's so galling gumbrell nodded he himself had envied his secure friends their power of ignoring the humanity of those who were not of their class to do that really well one must always have lived in a large house full of clockwork servants one must never have been short of money never at a restaurant ordered the cheaper thing instead of a more delicious one must never have regarded a policeman as anything but one's paid defender against the lower orders never for a moment have doubted one's divine right to do within the accepted limits exactly what one liked without a further thought to anything or any one but oneself and one's own enjoyment gumbrell had been brought up among these blessed beings but he was not one of them alas or fortunately he hardly knew which and what good do you expect the revolution to do mr bojanus he asked at last mr bojanus replaced his hand in his bosom none whatever mr gumbrell he said none whatever but liberty gumbrell suggested equality and all that what about those mr bojanus mr bojanus smiled up at him tolerantly and kindly as he might have smiled at some one who had suggested shall we say that evening trousers should be turned up at the bottom liberty mr gumbrell he said you don't suppose any serious-minded person imagines a revolution is going to bring liberty do you the people who make the revolution always seem to ask for liberty but do they ever get it mr gumbrell mr bojanus cocked his head playfully and smiled look at history mr gumbrell look at history first it's the french revolution they ask for political liberty and they gets it then comes the reform bill then forty eight then all the franchise acts and votes for women always more and more political liberty and what's the result mr gumbrell nothing at all who's freer for political liberty not a soul mr gumbrell there was never a greater swindle hatched in the old of history and when you think ow oh, these poor young men like shelley talked about it it's pathetic said mr bojanus shaking his head really pathetic political liberty's a swindle because a man doesn't spend his time being political he spends it sleeping eating amusing himself a little and working mostly working when they'd got all the political liberty they wanted or found they didn't want they began to understand this and so now it's all for the industrial revolution mr gumbrell but bless you that's as big a spindle as the other how can there ever be liberty under any system no amount of profit-sharing or self-government by the workers no amount of hygienic conditions or cocoa villages or recreation grounds can get rid of the fundamental slavery the necessity of working liberty why it doesn't exist there's no liberty in this world only gilded cages and then mr gumbrell even suppose you could somehow get rid of the necessity of working suppose a man's time were all leisure would he be free then i say nothing of the natural slavery of eating and sleeping and all that mr gumbrell i say nothing of that because that if i may say so would be too hair-splitting and metaphysical but what i do ask you is this and mr bojanus wagged his forefinger almost menacingly at the sleeping partner in this dialogue would a man with unlimited leisure be free mr gumbrell i say he would not not unless he happened to be a man like you or me mr gumbrell a man of sense a man of independent judgment an ordinary man would not be free because he wouldn't know how to occupy his leisure except in some way that would be forced on him by other people people don't know how to entertain themselves now they leave it to the other people to do it for them they swallow what's given them they have to swallow it whether they like it or not cinemas newspapers magazines gramophones football matches wireless telephones take them or leave them if you want to amuse yourself the ordinary man can't leave them he takes and what's that but slavery and so you see mr grimble mr bojanus smiled with a kind of roguish triumph you see that even in the purely hypothetical case of a man with the indefinite leisure there still would be no freedom and the case as i have said is purely 
hypothetical at any rate so far as concerns the sort of people who want a revolution and as for the sort of people who do enjoy leisure even now why i think mr grumble you and i know enough about the best people to know that freedom except possibly sexual freedom is not their strongest point and sexual freedom what's that mr virginius dramatically inquired you and i mr grumble he answered confidentially we know it's an horrible hideous slavery that's what it is or am i wrong mr grumble quite right quite right mr bojanus gumbrel hastened to reply from all of which continued mr bojanus it follows that except for a few a very few people like you and me mr gumbrel there's no such thing as liberty it's an oaks mr gumbrel an horrible plant and if i may be allowed to say so mr bojanus lowered his voice but still spoke with emphasis a bloody swindle but in that case mr bojanus why are you so anxious to have a revolution gumbrel inquired thoughtfully mr bojanus twisted to a finer point his waxed moustaches well he said at last it would be a nice change i was always one for change and a little excitement and then there's the scientific interest you never quite know how an experiment will turn out do you mr gumbrel i remember when i was a boy my old dad a great gardener he was a regular floriculturist you might say mr gumbel he tried the experiment of grafting a sprig of gloire de dijon on to a black currant bush and would you believe it the roses came out black coal black mr gumbel nobody would ever have guessed that if the thing had never been tried and that's what i say about the revolution you don't know what'll come of it till you try black roses blue roses who knows mr gumbel who knows who indeed gumbrel looked at his watch about those trousers he added those garments corrected mr bojanus ah yes should we say next tuesday let us say next tuesday gumbrel opened the oak shop door good morning mr bojanus mr bojanus bowed him out as though he had been a prince of the blood the sun was shining and at the end of the street between the houses the sky was blue gauzily the distances faded to a soft rich indistinctness there were veils of golden muslin thickening down the length of every vista on the trees in the hanover square gardens the young leaves were still so green that they seemed to be a light green fire and the city trunks looked blacker and dirtier than ever it would have been a pleasant and apposite thing if a cuckoo had started calling but though the cuckoo was silent it was a happy day a day gumbrel reflected as he strolled oddly along to be in love from the world of tailors gumbrel passed into that of the artificial pearl merchants and with a still keener appreciation of the amorous qualities of this clear spring day he began a leisured march along the perfumed pavements of bond street he thought with a profound satisfaction of those sixty-three papers on the resigimento how pleasant it was to waste time and bond street offered so many opportunities for wasting it agreeably he trotted round the spring exhibition at the grosvenor and came out a little regretting he had to confess his eighteen pence for admission after that he pretended that he wanted to buy a grand piano when he had finished practising his favourite passages on the magnificent instrument to which they obsequiously introduced him he looked in for a few moments as sotheby's sniffed among the ancient books and strolled on again admiring the cigars the lucid scent bottles the socks the old masters the emerald necklaces everything in fact in all the shops he passed forthcoming exhibition of works by casimir lipiat the announcement caught his eye and so poor old lipiat was on the warpath again he reflected as he pushed open the doors of the albemarle galleries poor old lipiat dear old lipiat even he liked lipiat though he had his defects it would be fun to see him again gumbrel found himself in the midst of a dismal collection of etchings he passed them in review wondering why it was that in these hard days when no painter can sell a picture almost any dull fool who can scratch a conventional etcher's view of two boats a suggested cloud in the flat sea should be able to get rid of his prints by the dozen and at guineas apiece he was interrupted in his speculations by the approach of the assistant in charge of the gallery he came up shyly and uncomfortably but 
with the conscientious determination of one ambitious to do his duty and make good he was a very young man with pale hair to which heavy oiling had given a curious grayish colour and a face of such childish contour and so imburb that he looked like a little boy playing at grown-ups he had only been at this job a few weeks and he found it very difficult this he remarked with a little introductory cough pointing to one view of the two boats and the flat sea is an earlier state than this and he pointed to another view where the boats were still two and the sea seemed just as flat though possibly on a closer inspection it might really have been flatter indeed said gamble the assistant was rather pained by his coldness he blushed but constrained himself to go on some excellent judges he said prefer the earlier state though it is less highly finished ah beautiful atmosphere isn't it the assistant put his head on one side and pursed his childish lips appreciatively gamble nodded with aspiration the assistant indicated the shattered rump of one of the boats a wonderful feeling in this passage he said redder than ever very intense said gamble the assistant smiled at him gratefully that's the word he said delighted intense that's it very intense he repeated the word several times as though to make sure of remembering it when the occasion next presented itself he was determined to make good i see mr lippiot is to have a show here soon remarked gamble who had had enough of the boats he is making the final arrangements with mr albemarle at this very moment said the assistant triumphantly with the air of one who produces at the dramatic and critical moment a rabbit out of the empty hat you don't say so gumbel was duly impressed then i'll wait till he comes out he said and sat down with his back to the boats the assistant returned to his desk and picked up the gold-belted fountain pen which his aunt had given him when he first went into business last christmas very intense he wrote in capitals on a half sheet of note paper the feeling in this passage is very intense he studied the paper for a few moments then folded it up carefully and put it away in his waistcoat pocket always make a note of it that was one of the business mottoes he had himself written out so laboriously in indian ink and old english lettering he had hung over his bed between the lord is my shepherd which his mother had given him and a quotation from dr frank crane a smiling face sells more goods than a clever tongue still a clever tongue the young assistant had often reflected was a very useful thing especially in this job he wondered whether one could say that the composition of a picture was very intense mr albemarle was very keen on the composition he noticed but perhaps it was better to stick to plain fine which was a little commonplace perhaps but very safe he would ask mr albemarle about it and then there was all that stuff about plastic values and pure plasticity he sighed it was all very difficult a chap might be as willing and eager to make good as he liked but when it came to this about atmosphere and intense passages and plasticity well really what could a chap do make a note of it it was the only thing in mr albemarle's private room casimir lippiat thumped the table sighs mr albemarle he was saying sighs and vehemence and spiritual significance that's what the old fellows had and we haven't he gesticulated as he talked his face worked and his green eyes set in their dark charred orbits were full of a troubled light the forehead was precipitous the nose long and sharp in the bony and almost fleshless face the lips of the wide mouth were surprisingly full precisely precisely said mr albemarle in his juicy voice he was a round smooth little man with a head like an egg he spoke he moved with a certain pomp a butlerish gravity that were evidently meant to be ducal that's what i set myself to recapture lippiot went on the size of the masterfulness of the masters he felt a warmth running through him as he spoke flushing his cheeks pulsing hotly behind the eyes as though he had drunk a draught of some heartening red wine his own words elated him and drunkenly gesticulating he was as though drunken the greatness of the masters he felt it in him he knew his own power he knew he knew he could do all that they had done nothing was beyond his strength egg-headed albemarle confronted him impeccably the butler exasperatingly serene albemarle too should be fired he struck the table once more he broke out again it's been my mission he shouted all these years all these years time had worn the hair from his temples the high steep forehead seemed higher than it really was 
he was forty now the turbulent young lipiot who had once declared that no man could do anything worth doing after he was thirty was forty now but in these fiery moments he could forget the years he could forget the disappointments the unsold pictures the bad reviews my mission he repeated and by god i feel i know i can carry it through warmly the blood pulsed behind his eyes quite said mr albemarle nodding the egg quite and how small the scale is nowadays lippia went on rhapsodically how trivial the conception how limited the scope you see no painter sculptor poets like michelangelo no scientist artist like leonardo no mathematician courtiers like boscovich no impresario musicians like handel no geniuses of all trades like wren i have set myself against this subject specialization of ours i stand alone opposing it with my example lippiot raised his hand like the statue of liberty standing colossal and alone nevertheless began mr albemarle painter poet musician cried lippiot i am all three i there is a danger of how shall i put it dissipating one's energies mr albemarle went on with determination discreetly he looked at his watch this conversation he thought seemed to be prolonging itself unnecessarily there is a greater danger in letting them stagnate and atrophy lippiot retorted let me give you my experience vehemently he gave it out in the gallery among the boats the views of the grand canal and the firth of forth Gumble placidly ruminated poor old lippiot he was thinking dear old lippiot even in spite of his fantastic egotism such a bad painter such a bombinating poet such a loud emotional improviser on the piano and going on like this year after year pegging away at the same old things always badly and always without a penny always living in the most hideous squalor magnificent and pathetic old lippiot the door suddenly opened and a loud unsteady voice now deep and harsh now breaking to shrillness exploded into the gallery like a veronese it was saying enormous vehement a great swirling composition swirling composition mentally the young assistant made a note of that but much more serious of course much more spiritually significant much more lippiot Cumbrel had risen from his chair had turned had advanced holding out his hand why it's Cumbrel, good lord and lippiot seized the proffered hand with an excruciating cordiality he seemed to be in exuberantly good spirits we're settling about my show mr albemarle and i he explained you know Gumbrel, mr albemarle pleased to meet you said mr albemarle our friend mr lippiot he added richly has the true artistic temp it's going to be magnificent lippiot could not wait till mr albemarle had finished speaking he gave Gumbrel a heroic blow on the shoulder artistic temperament as i was saying pursued mr albemarle he is altogether too impatient and too enthusiastic for us poor people a ducal smile of condescension accompanied this graceful act of self-abasement who move in the prosaic practical work-a-day world lippiat laughed aloud discordant peal he didn't seem to mind being accused of having an artistic temperament he seemed indeed to enjoy it if anything fire and water he said aphoristically brought together beget steam mr albemarle and i go driving along like a steam engine push push he worked his arms like a pair of alternate pistons he laughed but mr albemarle only coldly and courteously smiled i was just telling mr albemarle about the great crucifixion i've just been doing it's as big and headlong as a veronese but much more serious more behind them the little assistant was expounding to a new visitor the beauties of the etchings very intense he was saying the feeling in this passage the shadow indeed clung with an insistent affection round the stern of the boat and what a fine what a he hesitated for an instant and under his pale oiled hair his face became suddenly very red what a swirling composition he looked anxiously at the visitor the remark had been received without comment he felt immensely relieved they left the galleries together lippiat set the pace striding along at a great rate and with a magnificent brutality through the elegant and leisured crowd gesticulating and loudly talking as he went he carried his hat in his hand his tie was brilliantly orange people turned to look at him as he passed and he liked it he had indeed a remarkable face a face that ought by rights to have belonged to a man of genius lippiot was aware of it the man of genius he liked to say bears upon his brow a kind of mark of cain 
by which men recognize him at once and having recognized generally stone him he would add with that peculiar laugh he always uttered whenever he said anything rather bitter or cynical a laugh that was meant to show that the bitterness the cynicism justifiable as events might have made them were really only a mask and that beneath it the artist was still serenely and tragically smiling the piat thought a great deal about the ideal artist that titanic abstraction stalked within his own skin he was it a little too consciously perhaps this time he kept repeating they'll be bowled over this time it's going to be terrific and with the blood beating behind his eyes with the exultant consciousness and certainty of power growing and growing in him with every word he spoke lippiot began to describe the pictures there would be at his show he talked about the preface he was writing to the catalogue the poems that would be printed in it by way of literary compliment to the pictures he talked he talked gumbrell listened not very attentively he was wondering how any one could talk so loud could boast so extravagantly it was as though the man had to shout in order to convince himself of his own existence poor lippiot after all these years gumbrell supposed he must have some doubts about it ah but this time this time he was going to bowl them all over you're pleased then with what you've done recently he said at the end of one of lippiot's long tirades pleased exclaimed lippiot i should think i was gumbrell might have reminded him that he had been as well pleased in the past and that they had by no means been bowled over he preferred however to say nothing lippiot went on about the size and universality of the old masters he himself it was tacitly understood was one of them they parted near the bottom of tottenham court road lippiot to go northward to his studio off maple street gumbrell to pay one of his secret visits to those rooms of his in great russell street he had taken them nearly a year ago now two little rooms over a grocer's shop promising himself goodness only knew what adventures in them but somehow there had been no adventures still it had pleased him all the same to be able to go there from time to time when he was in london and to think as he sat in solitude before his gas fire that there was literally not a soul in the universe who knew where he was he had an almost childish affection for mysteries and secrets good-bye said gumbrell raising his hand to the salute and now beat up some people for dinner on friday for they had agreed to meet again he turned away thinking that he had spoken the last words but he was mistaken oh by the way said lippiot who had also turned to go but who now came stepping quickly after his companion can you by any chance lend me five pounds only to go after the exhibition you know i'm a bit short poor old lippiot but it was with reluctance that gumbrell parted from his treasury notes End of chapter three Chapter Four of Antique Hay by Aldous Huxley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four. Lippiot had a habit, which some of his friends found rather trying, and not only friends, for Lippiot was ready to let the merest acquaintances, the most absolute strangers even, into the secrets of his inspiration a habit of reciting at every possible opportunity his own verses he would declaim in a voice loud and tremulous with an emotion that never seemed to vary with the varying subject matter of his poems for whole quarters of an hour at a stretch would go on declaiming till his auditors were overwhelmed with such a confusion of embarrassment and shame that the blood rushed to their cheeks and they dared not meet one another's eyes he was declaiming now not merely across the dinner-table to his own friends but to the whole restaurant for at the first reverberating lines of his latest the conquistador there had been a startled turning of heads a craning of necks from every corner of the room the people who came to this soho restaurant because it was notoriously so artistic looked at one another significantly and nodded they were getting their money's worth this time and lippiot with a fine air of rapt unconsciousness went on with his recitation look down on mexico conquistador that was the refrain the conquistador lippiot had made it clear was the artist and the veil of mexico on which he looked down 
the towered cities of tlacopan and chalco of tenoch titlan and iztapalapan symbolized well it was difficult to say precisely what the universe perhaps look down cried lipiat with a quivering voice look down conquistador there on the valley's broad green floor there lies the lake the jewelled cities gleam chalco and tlacopan awaiting the coming man look down on mexico conquistador land of your golden dream not dream said gumbrel putting down the glass from which he had been profoundly drinking you can't possibly say dream you know why do you interrupt me lipiot turned on him angrily his wide mouth twitched at the corners his whole long face worked with excitement why don't you let me finish he allowed his hand which had hung awkwardly in the air above him suspended as it were at the top of a gesture to sink slowly to the table imbecile he said and once more picked up his knife and fork but really gumbrel insisted you can't say dream can you now seriously he had drunk the best part of a bottle of burgundy and he felt good-humoured obstinate and a little bellicose and why not lipiot asked oh because one simply can't gumbrel leaned back in his chair smiled and caressed his drooping blond moustache not in this year of grace nineteen twenty two but why lipiot repeated with exasperation because it's altogether too late in the day declared precious mr mer captain rushing up to his emphasis with flutes and roaring like a true conquistador to fall back however at the end of the sentence rather ignominiously into a breathless confusion he was a sleek comfortable young man with smooth brown hair parted in the centre and conducted in a pair of flowing curves across the temples to be looped in damp curls behind his ears his face ought to have been rather more exquisite rather more refinedly dix huitiem than it actually was it had a rather gross snouty look which was sadly out of harmony with mr mer captain's inimitably graceful style for mr mer captain had a style and he used it delightfully in his middle articles for the literary weeklies his most precious work however was that little volume of essays prose poems vignettes and paradoxes in which he had so brilliantly illustrated his favourite theme the pettiness the simian limitations the insignificance and the absurd pretentiousness of homo soi-disant sapiens those who met mr murk captain personally often came away with the feeling that perhaps after all he was right in judging so severely of humanity too late in the day he repeated times of change sunt lacrimi rerum no set muta mur in illis he laughed his own applause quote hominis tot disputandum est said gumbrel taking another sip of his bone superieure at the moment he was all for mer captain but why is it too late lipiot insisted mr mer captain made a delicate gesture ça se sent mon cher ami he said ça ne s'explique pas satan it is said carries hell in his heart so it was with mr mer captain wherever he was it was paris dreams in nineteen twenty two he shrugged his shoulders after you've accepted the war swallowed the russian famine said gumbrel dreams they belong to the ronston epoch said mr mer captain with a little titter le rêve ah 
lipiot dropped his knife and fork with a clatter and leaned forward eager for battle now i have you he said now i have you on the hip you've given yourselves away you've given away the secret of your spiritual poverty your weakness and pettiness and impotence impotence you malign me sir said gumbrel shearwater ponderously stirred he had been silent all this time sitting with hunched shoulders his elbows on the table his big round head bent forward absorbed apparently in the slow meticulous crumbling of a piece of bread sometimes he put a piece of crust in his mouth and under the bushy brown moustache his jaw moved slowly ruminatively with a sideways motion like a cow's he nudged gumbrel with his elbow as he said be quiet lipiot went on torrentially you're afraid of ideals that's what it is you daren't admit to having dreams oh i call them dreams he added parenthetically i don't mind being thought a fool and old-fashioned the words shorter and more english besides it rhymes with gleams ha ha and lipiot laughed his loud titan's laugh the laugh of cynicism which seems to belie but which for those who have understanding reveals the high positive spirit within ideals they're not sufficiently genteel for you civilized young men you've quite outgrown that sort of thing no dream no religion no morality i glory in the name of earwig said gumbel he was pleased with that little invention it was felicitous it was well chosen one's an earwig in sheer self-protection he explained but mr Merkopton refused to accept the name of earwig at any price what there is to be ashamed of in being civilized i really don't know he said in a voice that was now the bulls now the piping robins no if i glory in anything it's in my little rococo boudoir and the conversations across the polished mahogany and the delicate lascivious witty little flirtations on ample sofas inhabited by the soul of crabillon fils we needn't all be russians i hope these revolting dostoevskys mr murkoptan spoke with a profound feeling nor all utopians homo au naturel mr murkoptan applied his thumb and forefinger to his alas too snout-like nose sa pu and as for homo a la h g wells sa ne pu pas assez what i glory in is the civilized middle way between stink and asepsis give me a little musk a little intoxicating feminine exhalation the bouquet of old wine and strawberries a lavender bag under every pillow and potpourri in the corners of the drawing-room readable books amusing conversation civilized women graceful art and dry vintage music with a quiet life and reasonable comfort that's all i ask for talking about comfort gumbrel put in before lipiot had time to fling his answering thunders i must tell you about my new invention pneumatic trousers he explained blow them up perfect comfort you see the idea you're a sedentary man murkoptan let me put you down for a couple of pairs mr murkoptan shook his head too wellsian he said too horribly utopian they'd be ludicrously out of place in my boudoir and besides my sofa is well enough sprung already thank you but what about tolstoy shouted lipiot letting out his impatience in a violent blast mr murkoptan waved his hand russian he said russian and michelangelo alberti said gumbrel very seriously giving them all a piece of his father's mind alberti was much the better architect i assure you and pretentiousness what pretentiousness said mr murkoptan i prefer old borromini and the baroque what about beethoven went on lipiot what about blake where do they come in under your scheme of things mr murkoptan shrugged his shoulders they stay in the hall he said i don't let them into the boudoir 
you disgust me said Lapierre with rising indignation and making wider gestures you disgust me you and your odious little sham eighteenth-century civilization your piddling little poetry your art for art's sake instead of for god's sake your nauseating little copulations without love or passion your hoggish materialism your bestial indifference to all that's unhappy and your yelping hatred of all that's great charming charming murmured mr murkaptan who was pouring oil on his salad how can you ever hope to achieve anything decent or solid when you don't even believe in decency or solidity i look about me and lippiat cast his eyes wildly round the crowded room and i find myself alone spiritually alone i strive on by myself by myself he struck his breast a giant a solitary giant i have set myself to restore painting and poetry to their rightful position among the great moral forces they have been amusements they have been mere games for too long i am giving my life for that my life his voice trembled a little people mock me hate me stone me deride me but i go on i go on for i know i am right and in the end they too will recognize that i have been right it was a loud soliloquy one could fancy that lippiat had been engaged in recognizing himself all the same said gumbel with a cheerful stubbornness i persist that the word dreams is inadmissible inadmissible repeated mr Mercatan, imparting to the word an additional significance by giving it its french pronunciation in the age of rostand well and good but now now said gumbel the word merely connotes freud it's a matter of literary tact explained mr Mercatan. have you no literary tact no said lippiat with emphasis thank god i haven't i have no tact of any kind i do things straightforwardly frankly as the spirit moves me i don't like compromises he struck the table the gesture startlingly let loose a peal of cracked and diabolic laughter gumbel and lippiat and mr mur captain look quickly up even shearwater lifted his great spherical head and turned towards the sound the large disc of his face a young man with a blond fan-shaped beard stood by the table looking down at them through a pair of bright blue eyes and smiling equivocally and disquietingly as though his mind were full of some nameless and fantastic malice come sta la sua terribilta he asked and taking off his preposterous bowler hat he bowed profoundly to lippia how i recognize my buonarotti he added affectionately lippiat laughed rather uncomfortably and no longer on the titanic scale how i recognize my coleman he echoed rather feebly on the contrary cumbrell corrected how almost completely i fail to recognize this beard he pointed to the blond fan why may i ask more russianism said mr murkaptan and shook his head ah why indeed coleman lowered his voice to a confidential whisper for religious reasons he said and made the sign of the cross christ-like in my behaviour like every good believer i imitate the saviour and cultivate a beaver there be beavers which have made themselves beavers for the kingdom of heaven's sake but there are some beavers on the other hand which were so born from their mother's womb he burst into a fit of outrageous laughter which stopped as suddenly and as voluntarily as it had begun lippiat shook his head hideous he said hideous moreover coleman went on without paying any attention i have other and alas less holy reasons for this change of face it enables one to make such delightful acquaintances in the street you hear some one saying beaver as you pass and you immediately have the right to put rush up and get into conversation i owe to this dear symbol and he caressed the golden beard tenderly with the palm of his hand the most admirably dangerous relations magnificent said gumbel drinking his own health i shall stop shaving at once shearwater looked round the table with raised eyebrows and a wrinkled forehead this conversation is rather beyond me he said gravely under the formidable moustache under the thick 
tufted eyebrows the mouth was small and ingenuous the mild grey eyes full of an almost childish inquiry what does the word beaver signify in this context you don't refer i suppose to the rodent castor fibre but this is a very great man said coleman raising his bowler tell me who he is our friend shearwater said gumbrell the physiologist coleman bowed physiological shearwater he said accept my homage to one who doesn't know what a beaver is i resign all my claims to superiority there's nothing else but beavers in all the papers tell me do you never read the daily express no nor the daily mail shearwater shook his head nor the mirror nor the sketch nor the graphic nor even for i was forgetting that physiologists must surely have liberal opinions even the daily news shearwater continued to shake his large spherical head nor any of the evening papers no coleman once more lifted his hat o oh, eloquent just and mighty death he exclaimed and replaced it on his head you never read any papers at all not even our friend mer captain's delicious little middles in the weeklies how is your delicious little middle by the way coleman turned to mr mer captain and with the point of his huge stick gave him a little prod in the stomach sa marche les tripes hein he turned back to shearwater not even those he asked never said shearwater have more serious things to think about than newspapers and what serious thing may i ask well at the present moment said shearwater i am chiefly preoccupied with the kidneys the kidneys in an ecstasy of delight coleman thumped the floor with the ferrule of his stick the kidneys tell me all about kidneys this is of the first importance this is really life and i shall sit down at your table without asking permission a buonarotti here and in the teeth of mer Captain, and without so much as thinking about this species of gumbrel who might as well not be there at all i shall sit down and talking of sitting said gumbrel i wish i could persuade you to order a pair of my patent pneumatic trousers they will coleman waved him away not now not now he said i shall sit down and listen to the physiologue talking about runions while i myself actually eat them saute saute mark my words laying his hat and stick on the floor beside him he sat down at the end of the table between lippiot and shearwater two believers he said laying his hand for a moment on lippiot's arm and three black-hearted unbelievers confronted a buona rati you and i are both croyants et pratiquants as mer captain would say i believe in one devil father quasi almighty samuel and his wife the woman of whoredom ha ha he laughed his voracious artificial laugh here's an end to any civilized conversation mr mer captain complained hissing on the c labiating lingeringly on the v of civilized and giving the first two eyes their fullest value the word in his mouth seemed to take on a special and a richer significance coleman ignored him tell me you physiologue he went on tell me about the physiology of the archetypal man this is most important buona rati shares my opinion about this i know has the archetypal man a buio rectum as mer captain would say again or not everything depends on this as voltaire realizes ages ago his feet as we know already on inspired authority were straight feet and the sole of his feet were like the sole of a calf's foot but the viscera you must tell us something about the viscera mustn't he buona rati and where are my rognon son he shouted at the waiter you revolt me said lippiat not mortuarily i ope coleman turned with solicitude to his neighbour then shook his head mortuarily i fear kiss me arty and i die happy he blew a kiss into the air but why is the physiologue so slow up pachyderm up answer you hold the key to everything the key i tell you the key i remember when i used to hang about the biological laboratories at school eviscerating frogs crucified with pins they were belly upwards like little green christs i remember once when i was sitting there quietly poring over the entrails in came the laboratory boy and said to the stinx usher please sir may i have the key of the absolute and would you believe it that usher calmly put his hand in his trouser pocket and fished out a small yale key and gave it him without a word what a gesture the key of the absolute but it was only the absolute alcohol the urchin wanted 
to pickle some loathsome fetus in i suppose god rot his soul in peace and now cast a fibre out with your key tell us about the archetypal man tell us about the primordial atom tell us about the bio rectum ponderously shearwater moved his clumsy frame leaning back in his chair he scrutinized coleman with a large benevolent curiosity the eyes under the savage eyebrows were mild and gentle behind the fearful disguise of the moustache he smiled poutingly like a baby who sees the approaching bottle the broad domed forehead was serene he ran his hand through his thick brown hair scratched his head meditatively and then when he had thoroughly examined had comprehended and duly classified the strange phenomenon of coleman opened his mouth and uttered a little good-natured laugh of amusement voltaire's question he said at last in a slow deep voice seemed at the time he asked it an unanswerable piece of irony it would have seemed almost equally ironic to his contemporaries if he had asked whether god had a pair of kidneys we know a little more about the kidneys nowadays if he had asked me i should answer why not the kidneys are so beautifully organized they do their work of regulation with such a miraculous it's hard to find another word such a positively divine precision such knowledge and wisdom that there's no reason why your archetypal man whoever he is or any one else for that matter should be ashamed of owning a pair coleman clapped his hands the key he cried the key out of the trouser pocket of babes and sucklings it comes the genuine unique yale how right i was to come here to-night but holy sephiroth there's my trollop he picked up his stick jumped from his chair and threaded his way between the tables a woman was standing near the door coleman came up to her pointed without speaking to the table and returned driving her along in front of him tapping her gently over the haunches with his stick as one might drive a docile animal to the slaughter allow me to introduce said coleman the sharer of my joys and sorrows la compagne de mes nuits blanches et de mes jours plutôt sales in a word zoe qui ne comprend pas le français que me déteste avec une passion égale à la mienne et qui mangera ma foi des oignons pour faire honneur au physiologue have some burgundy gumbrel proffered the bottle zoe nodded and pushed forward her glass she was dark-haired had a pale skin and eyes like round blackberries her mouth was small and floridly curved she was dressed rather depressingly like a picture by augustus john in blue and orange her expression was sullen and ferocious and she looked about her with an air of profound contempt shearwater's no better than a mystic fluted mr murkoptan a mystical scientist really one hadn't reckoned on that like a liberal pope said gumbel poor metternich you remember pio nono and he burst into a fit of esoteric laughter of less than average intelligence he murmured delightedly and refilled his glass it's only the deliberately blind who wouldn't reckon on the combination lipiat put in indignantly what are science and art what are religion and philosophy but so many expressions in human terms of some reality more than human newton and bohem and michelangelo what are they doing but expressing in different ways different aspects of the same thing alberti i beg you said gumbel i assure you he was the better architect fee donc said mr Marcotton, san cola a la quattro fontana but he got no further lipiat abolished him with a gesture one reality he cried there is only one reality one reality coleman reached out a hand across the table and caressed zoe's bare white arm and that is calipigis zoe japped at his hand with her fork we are all trying to talk about it continued lipiat the physicists have formulated their laws which are after all no more than stammering provisional theories about a part of it the physiologists are penetrating into the secrets of life psychologists into the mind and we artists are trying to say what is revealed to us about the moral nature the personality of that reality which is the universe mr murkoptan threw up his hands in affected horror oh barbaridad bar barbaridad nothing less than the pure castilian would relieve his feelings but all this is meaningless quite right about the chemists and physicists said shearwater they are always trying to pretend that they are nearer the truth than we are they take their crude theories as facts and try to make us accept them when we're dealing with life oh they are sacred their theories laws of nature they call them and they talk about their 
known truths and our romantic biological fancies what a fuss they make when we talk about life bloody fools said shearwater mild and crushing nobody but a fool could talk of mechanism in face of the kidneys and there are actually imbeciles who talk about the mechanism of heredity and reproduction all the same began mr mer captain very earnestly anxious to deny his own life there are eminent authorities i can only quote what they say of course i can't pretend to know anything about it myself but reproduction reproduction coleman murmured the word to himself ecstatically delightful and horrifying to think they all come to that even the most virginal that they were all made for that little she-dogs in spite of their china-blue eyes what sort of a mandrake shall we produce zoe and i he asked turning to shearwater how i should like to have a child he went on without waiting for an answer i shouldn't teach it anything no language nothing at all just a child of nature i believe it would really be the devil and then what fun it would be if it suddenly started to say beckos like the children in herodotus and buonarotti here would paint an allegorical picture of it and write an epic called the ignoble savage and cast a fibre would come and sound its kidneys and investigate its sexual instincts and mayor captain would write one of his inimitable middle articles about it and gumbo would make it a pair of patent trousers and zoe and i would look parentally on and fairly swell with pride shouldn't we zoe zoe preserved her expression of sullen unchanging contempt and did not deign to answer ah how delightful it would be i long for posterity i live in hopes i stope against stope's eye zoe threw a piece of bread which caught him on the cheek a little below the eye coleman leaned back and laughed and laughed till the tears rolled down his face End of chapter four chapter five of antique hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five one after another they engaged themselves in the revolving doors of the restaurant trotted round in the moving cage of glass and ejected themselves into the coolness and darkness of the street shearwater lifted up his large face and took two or three deep breaths too much carbon dioxide and ammonia in there he said it is unfortunate that when two or three are gathered together in god's name or even in the more civilized name of Mercaptan of the delicious middle Mercaptan dexterously parried the prod which coleman aimed at him it is altogether deplorable that they should necessarily empest the air lipiat had turned his eyes heavenwards what stars he said and what prodigious gaps between the stars a real light opera summer night and Mercaptan began to sing in fragmentary german the barcarolle from the tales of hoffmann liebe nacht der schern nacht o stille mein tumtitum te tum te tum delicious offenbach ah if only we could have a third empire another comic napoleon that would make paris look like paris again titty tumty ti tum they walked along without any particular destination but simply for the sake of walking through this soft cool night coleman led the way tapping the pavement at every step with the fair rule of his stick the blind leading the blind he explained ah if only there were a ditch a crevasse a great hole full of stinging centipedes and dung how gleefully i should lead you all into it i think you would do well said shearwater gravely to go and see a doctor coleman gave vent to a howl of delight does it occur to you he went on that at this moment we are walking through the midst of seven million distinct and separate individuals each with distinct and separate lives and all completely indifferent to our existence seven million people each one of whom thinks himself quite as important as each of us does millions of them are now sleeping in an impested atmosphere hundreds of thousands of couples are at this moment engaged in mutually caressing one another in a manner too hideous to be thought of but in no way differing from the manner in which each of us performs delightfully passionately and beautifully his similar work of love thousands of women are now in the throes of parturition and of both sexes thousands are dying 
of the most diverse and appalling diseases or simply because they have lived too long thousands are drunk thousands have overeaten thousands have not had enough to eat and they are all alive all unique and separate and sensitive like you and me it's a horrible thought ah if i could lead them all into that great hole of centipedes he tapped and tapped on the pavement in front of him as though searching for the crevasse at the top of his voice he began to chant o oh, all ye beasts and cattle curse ye the lord curse him and vilify him for ever all this religion sighed Merkaptan, what with lipiot on one side being a muscular christian artist and coleman on the other howling the black mass really he elaborated an italianate gesture and turned to zoe what do you think of it all he asked zoe jerked her head in coleman's direction i think he's a bloody swine she said they were the first words she had spoken since she had joined the party hear hear cried coleman and he waved his stick in the warm yellow light of the coffee stall at hyde park corner loitered a little group of people among the peaked caps and the chauffeur's dust coats among the weather-stained workmen's jackets and the knotted handkerchiefs there emerged an alien elegance a tall tubed hat and a silk-faced overcoat a cloak of flame-coloured satin and in bright coppery hair a great spanish comb of carved tortoiseshell well i'm damned said gumbel as they approached i believe it's myra vivige so it is said lipiot peering in his turn he began suddenly to walk with an affected swagger kicking his heels at every step looking at himself from outside his divining eyes pierced through the veil of cynical je m'en fichisme to the bruised heart beneath besides he didn't want any one to guess the viviche is it coleman quickened his rapping along the pavement and who is the present incumbent he pointed at the top hat can it be bruin ops said gumbrell dubiously ops coleman yelled out the name ops the top hat turned revealing a shirt front a long grey face a glitter of circular glass over the left eye who the devil are you the voice was harsh and arrogantly offensive i am that i am said coleman but i have with me he pointed to shearwater to gumbrell to zoe a physiologue a pedagogue and a priapagogue for i leave out of account mere artists and journalists whose titles do not end with the magic syllable and finally indicating himself plain dog which being interpreted cabalistically backwards signifies god all at your service he took off his hat and bowed the top hat turned back towards the spanish comb who is this horrible drunk it inquired mrs vivige did not answer him but stepped forward to meet the newcomers in one hand she held a peeled hard-boiled egg and a thick slice of bread and butter in the other and between her sentences she bit at them alternately coleman she exclaimed and her voice as she spoke seemed always on the point of expiring as though each word were the last utterly faintly and breakingly from a deathbed the last with all the profound and nameless significance of the ultimate word it's a very long time since i heard you raving last and you theodore darling why do i never see you now gumbrell shrugged his shoulders because you don't want to i suppose he said myra laughed and took another bite at her bread and butter she laid the back of her hand for she was still holding the butt end of her hard-boiled egg on lipiot's arm the titan who had been looking at the sky seemed to be surprised to find her standing there you he said smiling and wrinkling up his forehead interrogatively it's to-morrow i'm sitting for you casimir isn't it ah you remembered the veil parted for a moment poor lipiot and happy Merkaptan, always happy gallantly Merkaptan kissed the back of the hand which held the egg i might be happier he murmured rolling up at her from the snouty face a pair of small brown eyes puis je espere mrs viviche laughed expiringly from her inward deathbed and turned on him without speaking her pale unwavering glance her eyes had a formidable capacity for looking and expressing nothing they were like the pale blue eyes which peer out of the siamese cat's black velvet mask bellissima murmured Merkaptan, flowering under their cool light mrs viviche addressed herself to the company at large we have had the most appalling evenings she said haven't we bruin 
bruin ops said nothing but only scowled he didn't like these damned intruders the skin of his contracted brows oozed over the rim of his monocle on to the shining glass i thought it would be fun myra went on to go to that place of hampton court where you have dinner on an island and dance what is there about islands put in Mercaptan in a deliciously whimsical parenthesis that makes them so peculiarly voluptuous kithera monkey island capri germa de monde another charming middle coleman pointed his stick menacingly mr Mercaptan stepped quickly out of range so we took a cab mrs Vaviche continued and set out and what a cab my god a cab with only one gear and that the lowest a cab as old as the century a museum specimen a collector's piece they had been hours and hours on the way and when they got there the food they were offered to eat the wine they were expected to drink from her eternal deathbed mrs Vaviche cried out in unaffected horror everything tasted as though it has been kept soaking for a week in the river before being served up rather weedy with that delicious typhoid flavour of tim's water there was tim's even in the champagne they had not been able to eat so much as a crust of bread hungry and thirsty they had re-embarked in their antique taxi and here at last they were at the first outpost of civilization eating for dear life oh a terrible evening mrs Lavish concluded the only thing which kept up my spirits was the spectacle of bruin's bad temper you've no idea bruin what an incomparable comic you can be bruin ignored the remark with an expression of painfully repressed disgust he was eating a hard-boiled egg myra's caprices were becoming more and more impossible that campton court business had been bad enough but when it came to eating in the street in the middle of a lot of filthy workmen well really that was rather too much mrs Vaviche looked about her am i never to know who this mysterious person is she pointed to shearwater who was standing a little apart from the group his back leaning against the park railings and staring thoughtfully at the ground the physiologue coleman explained and he has the key the key the key he hammered the pavement with his stick gumbrell performed the introduction in more commonplace style you don't seem to take much interest in us mr shearwater myra called expiringly shearwater looked up mrs Vaviche regarded him intently through pale unwavering eyes smiling as she looked that queer downward turning smile which gave to her face through its mask of laughter a peculiar expression of agony you don't seem to take much interest in us she repeated shearwater shook his heavy head no he said i don't think i do why don't you why should i there's not time to be interested in everything one can only be interested in what's worth while and we're not worth while not to me personally replied shearwater with candour the great wall of china the political situation in italy the habits of tree matodes all these are more interesting in themselves but they aren't interesting to me i don't permit them to be i haven't the leisure and what do you allow yourself to be interested in shall we go said bruin impatiently he had succeeded in swallowing the last fragment of his hard-boiled egg mrs Vaviche did not answer did not even look at him shearwater who had hesitated before replying was about to speak but coleman answered for him be respectful he said to mrs Vaviche. this is a great man he reads no papers not even those in which our mer captain so beautifully writes he does not know what a beaver is and he lives for nothing but the kidneys mrs Vaviche smiled her smile of agony kidneys but what a memento mori there are other portions of the anatomy she threw back her cloak revealing an arm a bare shoulder a slant of pectoral muscle she was wearing a white dress that leaving her back and shoulders bare came up under either arm to a point in front and was held there by a golden thread about the neck for example she said and twisted her hand several times over and over making the slender arm turn at the elbow as though to demonstrate the movement of the articulations and the muscular play memento vivere mr Mercaptan aptly commented vivimus mea lesbia atoque amemus mrs Vaviche dropped her arm and pulled the cloak back into place she looked at shearwater who had followed all her movements with conscientious attention and who now nodded with an expression of interrogation on his face as though to ask what next 
we all know that you've got beautiful arms said bruin angrily there's no need for you to make an exhibition of them in the street at midnight let's get out of this he laid his hand on her shoulder and made as if to draw her away we'd better be going goodness knows what's happening behind us he indicated with a little movement of the head the loiterers round the coffee stall some disturbance among the canaille mrs vaviche looked round the cab drivers and the other consumers of midnight coffee had gathered in an interested circle curious and sympathetic round the figure of a woman who was sitting like a limp bundle tied up in black cotton and mackintosh on the stall-keeper's high stool leaning wearily against the wall of the booth a man stood beside her drinking tea out of a thick white cup every one was talking at once mayn't the poor wretches talk asked mrs Vaviche, turning back to bruin i never knew any one who had the lower classes on the brain as much as you have i loathe them said bruin i hate every one poor or ill or old can't abide them they make me positively sick quel homme bien né piped mr murkupton and how well and frankly you express what we all feel and lack the courage to say lippiot gave vent to indignant laughter i remember when i was a little boy bruin went on my old grandfather used to tell me stories about his childhood he told me that when he was about five or six just before the passing of the reform bill of thirty two there was a song which all right-thinking people used to sing with a chorus that went like this rot the people blast the people damn the lower classes i wish i knew the rest of the words in the tune it must have been a good song coleman was enraptured with the song he shouldered his walking-stick and began marching round and round the nearest lamp-post chanting the words to a stirring march tune rot the people blast the people he marked the rhythm with heavy stamps of his feet ah if only they'd invent servants with internal combustion machines said bruin almost pathetically however well trained they are they always betray their humanity occasionally and that is really intolerable how tedious is a guilty conscience gumbrell murmured the quotation but mr shearwater said myra bringing back the conversation to more congenial themes hasn't told us yet what he thinks of arms nothing at all said shearwater i'm occupied with the regulation of the blood at the moment but is it true what he says theodore she appealed to gumbrell i should think so gumbrell's answer was rather dim and remote he was straining to hear the talk of bruin's canaille and mrs Vavish's question seemed a little irrelevant i used to do carton jobs the man with the teacup was saying at a van an old pony of me own and didn't do so badly neither the only trouble was me lifting furniture and heavy weights about the place because i had malaria out in india in the war nor even you compel me to violate the laws of modesty nor even mrs Vavish went on smiling painfully speaking huskily expiringly of legs a spring of blasphemy was touched in coleman's brain neither delighteth he in any man's legs he shouted and with an extravagant show of affection he embraced zoe who caught hold of his hand and bit it it comes back on you when you get tired like malaria does the man's face was sallow and there was an air of peculiar listlessness and hopelessness about his misery it comes back on you and then you go down with fever and you're as weak as a child shearwater shook his head nor even of the heart mrs Vavish lifted her eyebrows ah now the inevitable word has been pronounced the real subject of every conversation has appeared on the scene love mr shearwater but as i says recapitulated the man with the teacup we didn't do so badly after all we had nothing to complain about had we flory the black bundle made an affirmative movement with its upper extremity that's one of the subjects said shearwater like the great wall of china and the habits of tree metodes i don't allow myself to be interested in mrs Vavish laughed breathed out a little good god of incredulity and astonishment and asked why not no time he explained you people of leisure have nothing else to do or think about i'm busy and so naturally less interested in the subject than you and i take care what's more to limit such interest as i have i was going up ludgate ill one day with a van load of stuff for a chap in clerkenwell i was leading jerry up the hill jerry's the name of our old pony one can't have everything shearwater was explaining not all at the same time in any case i've arranged my life for work now i'm quietly married i simmer away domestically quelle horreur said mr mark captain 
all the louis quinze abbe and him were shocked and revolted by the thought but love questioned mrs Laviche. love love lipiat echoed he was looking up at the milky way all of a sudden out jumps a copper at me how old is that orse he says it ain't fit to draw a lord it limps in all four feet he says no it doesn't i says none of your answering back he says take it outer the shafts at once but i know all about love already i know precious little still about kidneys but my good shearwater how can you know all about love before you've made it with all women off we goes me and the cop and the orse up in front of the police court magistrate or are you one of those imbeciles mrs Vaviche went on who speak of women with a large w and pretend we're all the same poor theodore here might possibly think so in his feebler moments grumble smiled vaguely from a distance he was following the man with the teacup into the magistrate's stuffy court and Murkoptan certainly does because all the women who ever sat on his dis huitiem sofa certainly were exactly like one another and perhaps casimir does too all women look like his absurd ideal but you sherwater you're intelligent surely you don't believe anything so stupid sherwater shook his head the copy gave evidence against me limping in all four feet e says it wasn't i says and the police court vet e bore me out the horse has been very well treated e says but e's old e's very old i know he's old i says but where am i going to find the price for a young one x square minus y square sherwater was saying equals x plus y times x minus y and the equation holds good whatever the values of x and y it's the same with your love business mrs Vaviche. the relation is still fundamentally the same whatever the value of the unknown personal quantities concern little individual ticks and peculiarities after all what do they matter what indeed said coleman ticks mere ticks sheep ticks horse ticks bed bugs tapeworms taint worms guinea worms liver flukes the oris must be destroyed says the beak he's too old for work but i'm not i says i can't get an old age pension at thirty-two can i how am i to earn my living if you take away what i earns my living by mrs Vaviche smiled agonizingly here's a man who thinks personal peculiarities are trivial and unimportant she said you're not even interested in people then i don't know what you can do e says i'm only here to administer the law seems a queer sort of law i says what law is it shearwater scratched his head under his formidable black moustache he smiled at last his ingenuous childish smile no he said no i suppose i'm not it hadn't occurred to me until you said it but i suppose i'm not no he laughed quite delighted it seemed by this discovery about himself what law is it e says the cruelty to animals law that's what it is e says the smile of mockery and suffering appeared and faded one of these days said mrs Vaviche, you may find them more absorbing than you do now meanwhile said shearwater i couldn't find a job air and having been working on my own my own master like couldn't get unemployment pay so when we heard of jobs at portsmouth we thought we'd try to get one even if it did mean walking there meanwhile i had my kidneys hopeless he says to me quite hopeless more than two hundred come for three vacancies so there was nothing for it but to walk back again took us four days it did this time she was very bad on the way very bad being nearly six months gone our first it is things will be harder still when it comes from the black bundle there issued a sound of quiet sobbing look here said gumbrel making a sudden eruption into the conversation this is really too awful he was consumed with indignation and pity he felt like a prophet in nineveh there are two wretched people here said gumbrel and gumbrel told them breathlessly what he had overheard it was terrible terrible all the way to portsmouth and back again on foot without proper food and the woman's with child coleman exploded with delight gravid he kept repeating gravid gravid the laws of gravity first formulated by newton now recodified by the immortal einstein god said let newstein be and there was light and god said let there be light and there was darkness o'er the face of the earth he roared with laughter between them they raised five pounds mrs Laviche undertook to give them to the black bundle the cabin made way for her as she advanced there was an uncomfortable silence the black bundle lifted a face that was old and worn like the face of a statue in the portal of a cathedral an old face but one was aware somehow that it belonged to a woman still young by the reckoning of years her hands trembled as she took the notes and when she opened her mouth to speak her hardly articulate whisper of gratitude one saw that she had lost several of her teeth the party disintegrated all went their ways mr murk Captain, to his rococo boudoir his sweet barocco bedroom in sloane street 
comyn and zoe towards goodness only knew what scenes of intimate life in pimlico lippiat to his studio off the tottenham court road alone silently brooding and perhaps too consciously bowed with unhappiness but the unhappiness poor titan was real enough for had he not seen mrs vaviche and the insufferable the stupid and loutish ops driving off in one taxi must finish up with a little dancing myra had huskily uttered from that deathbed on which her restless spirit forever and wearily exerted itself obediently bruin had given an address and they had driven off but after the dancing oh was it possible that that odious bad-blooded young cad was her lover and that she should like him it was no wonder that lippiot should have walked bent like atlas under the weight of a world and when in piccadilly a belated and still unsuccessful prostitute sidled out of the darkness as he strode by unseeing in his misery when she squeaked up at him a despairing cheer up ducky lippiat suddenly threw up his head and laughed titanically with the terrible bitterness of a noble soul in pain even the poor drabs at the street corners were affected by the unhappiness that radiated out from him wave after throbbing wave like music he liked to fancy into the night even the wretched drabs he walked on more desperately bowed than ever but bent no further adventure on his way gumbrell and shearwater both lived in paddington they set off in company up park lane walking in silence gumbrell gave a little skip to get himself into step with his companion to be out of step when steps so loudly and flat-footedly flapped on empty pavements was disagreeable he found was embarrassing it was somehow dangerous stepping like this out of time one gave oneself away so to speak one made the night aware of two presences when there might if steps sounded in unison be only one heavier more formidable more secure than either of the separate two in unison then they flapped up bark lane a policeman and the three poets sulking back to back on their fountain were the only human things besides themselves under the mauve electric moons it's appalling it's horrible said gumbel at last after a long long silence during which he had indeed been relishing to the full the horror of it all life don't you know what's appalling shearwater inquired he walked with his big head bowed his hands clasped behind his back and clutching his hat walked clumsily with sudden lurches of his whole massive anatomy wherever he was shearwater always seemed to take up the space that two or three ordinary people would normally occupy cool fingers of wind passed refreshingly through his hair he was thinking of the experiment he meant to try in the next few days down at the physiological laboratory you'd put a man on an ergometer in a heated chamber and set him to work hours at a time he'd sweat of course prodigiously you'd make arrangements for collecting the sweat weighing it analyzing it and so on the interesting thing would be to see what happened at the end of a few days the man would have got rid of so much of his salts that the blood composition might be altered and all sorts of delightful consequences might follow it ought to be a capital experiment gumbrell's exclamation disturbed him what's appalling he asked rather irritably those people at the coffee stall gumbrell answered it's appalling that human beings should have to live like that worse than dogs dogs have nothing to complain of shearwater went off at a tangent nor guinea pigs nor rats it's these blasted anti-vivisection maniacs who make all the fuss but think cried gumbrell what these wretched people have had to suffer walking all the way to portsmouth in search of work and the woman with child it's horrifying and then the way of people of that class are habitually treated one has no idea of it until one has actually been treated that way oneself in the war for example when one went to have one's mitral murmurs listened to by the medical board they treated one then as though one belonged to the lower orders like all the rest of the poor wretches it was a real eye-opener one felt like a cow being got into a train and to think that the majority of one's fellow-beings passed their whole lives being shoved about like maltreated animals hum said shearwater if you went on sweating indefinitely he supposed you would end by dying gumbrell looked through the railings at the profound darkness of the park fast it was and melancholy with a string here and there of receding lights terrible he said and repeated the word several times terrible terrible all the legless soldiers grinding barrel organs all the hawkers of toys stamping their leaky boots in the gutters of the strand at the corner of cursitor street and chancery lane the old woman with matches forever holding to her left eye a handkerchief as yellow and dirty as the winter fog what was wrong with the eye he had never dared to look but hurried past as though she were not there or sometimes when the fog was more than ordinarily cold and stifling paused for an instant with averted eyes to drop a brown coin into her tray of matches and then there were the murderers hanged 
at eight o'clock while one was savouring almost with voluptuous consciousness the final dream haunted doze there was the physical charwoman who used to work at his father's house until she got too weak and died there were the lovers who turned on the gas and the ruined shopkeepers jumping in front of trains had one a right to be contented and well fed had one a right to one's education and good taste a right to knowledge and conversation and the leisurely complexities of love he looked once more through the railings at the park's impenetrable rustic night at the lines of beaded lamps he looked and remembered another night years ago during the war when there were no lights in the park and the electric moons above the roadway were in almost total eclipse he had walked up this street alone full of melancholy emotions which though the cause of them was different were in themselves much the same as the melancholy emotions which swelled windily up within him to-night he had been most horribly in love what did you think he asked abruptly of myra viviche think said sheerwater i don't know that i thought very much about her not a case for ratiocination exactly is she she seemed to me entertaining enough as women go i said i'd lunch with her on thursday Gumbrell felt all of a sudden the need to speak confidentially there was a time he said in a tone that was quite unreally airy off-hand and disengaged years ago when i totally lost my head about her totally those tear-wet patches on his pillow cold against his cheek in the darkness and oh the horrible pain of weeping vainly for something that was nothing that was everything in the world towards the end of the war it was i remember walking up this dismal street one night in the pitch darkness writhing with jealousy he was silent spectrally like a dim haunting ghost he had hung about her dumbly dumbly imploring appealing the weak silent man she used to call him and once for two or three days out of pity out of affection out of a mere desire perhaps to lay the tiresome ghost she had given him what his mournful silence implored only to take it back almost as soon as accorded that other night when he had walked up this street before desire had eaten out his vitals and his body seemed empty sickingly and achingly void jealousy was busily reminding him with an unflagging malice of her beauty of her beauty and the hateful ruffian hands which now caressed the eyes which looked on him that was all long ago she is certainly handsome said cheerwater commenting at one or two removes on gumbrell's last remark i can see that she might make any one who got involved in her decidedly uncomfortable after a day or two's continuous sweating it suddenly occurred to him one might perhaps find sea-water more refreshing than fresh water that would be queer gumbrell burst out ferociously laughing but there were other times he went on jauntily when other people were jealous of me ah revenge revenge in the better world of the imagination it was possible to get one's own back what fiendish vendettas were there carried to successful ends i remember once writing her a quatrain in french he had written it years after the whole thing was over he had never sent it to any one at all but that was all one how did it go ah yes and he recited with suitable gestures pisque nous sommes là je dois vous servir sans trop de honte que je ne garde pas le compte ca sa mauvaise de six fois rather prettily turned i flatter myself rather elegantly gross gumbrell's laughter went hooting past the marble arch it stopped rather suddenly however at the corner of the edgware road he had suddenly remembered mr murkopton and the thought depressed him End of chapter five chapter six of antique hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six it was between whitefield street and the tottenham court road in a heavenly muse as he liked to call it for he had a characteristic weakness for philosophical paranomasia that casimir lipiat lived and worked you passed under an archway of bald and sooty brick and at night when the green gas-lamp underneath the arch through livid lights and enormous architectural shadows you could fancy yourself at the entrance of one of Peronese's prisons and you found yourself in a long cul-de-sac flanked on either side by low buildings having stabling for horses below and less commodiously stabling for human beings in the attics above an old-fashioned smell of animals 
mingled with the more progressive stink of burnt oil the air was a little thicker here it seemed than in the streets outside looking down the mews on even the clearest day you could see the forms of things dimming and softening the colours growing richer and deeper with every yard of distance it was the best place in the world lippiot used to say for studying aerial perspective that was why he lived there but you always felt about poor lippiot that he was facing misfortune with a just a little too self-consciously mrs vivetia's taxi drove in under the paranesian arch drove in slowly and as though with a gingerly reluctance to soil its white wheels on pavements so sordid the cabman looked round inquiringly this right he asked with a white gloved finger mrs Leviche prodded the air two or three times indicating that he was to drive straight on halfway down the mews she wrapped the glass the man drew up never been down ere before he said for the sake of making a little conversation while mrs Leviche fumbled for her money he looked at her with a polite and slightly ironic curiosity that was frankly mingled with admiration you're lucky said mrs Leviche. we poor decayed gentlewomen you see what we're reduced to and she handed him a florin slowly the taxi man unbuttoned his coat and put the coin away in an inner pocket he watched her as she crossed the dirty street placing her feet with a meticulous precision one after the other in the same straight line as though she were treading a knife edge between goodness only knew what invisible gulfs floating she seemed to go with a little spring at every step in the skirt of her summery dress white it was with a florid pattern printed in black all over it blowing airily out around her swaying march decayed gentlewomen indeed the driver started his machine with an unnecessary violence he felt for some reason positively indignant between the broad double doors through which the horses passed to their fodder and repose were little narrow human doors for the yahoos lippiot used to say in his large elusive way and when he said it he laughed with the loud and bell-mouthed cynicism of one who sees himself as a misunderstood and embittered prometheus at one of these little yahoo doors mrs Leviche halted and rapped as loudly as a small and stiff hinged knocker would permit patiently she waited several small and dirty children collected to stare at her she knocked again and again waited more children came running up from the farther end of the mews two young girls of fifteen or sixteen appeared at a neighbouring doorway and immediately gave tongue in whoops of mirthless hyena-like laughter have you ever read about the pied piper of hamelin mrs Leviche asked the nearest child terrified it shrank away i thought not she said and knocked again there was a sound at last of heavy feet slowly descending steep stairs the door opened welcome to the palazzo it was lippiot's heroic formula of hospitality welcome at last mrs Leviche corrected and followed him up a narrow dark staircase that was as steep as a ladder he was dressed in a velveteen jacket and linen trousers that should have been white but needed washing he was dishevelled and his hands were dirty did you knock more than once he asked looking back over his shoulder more than twenty times mrs Leviche justifiably exaggerated i'm infinitely sorry protested lippiot i get so deeply absorbed in my work you know did you wait long the children enjoyed it at any rate mrs Leviche was irritated by a suspicion which was probably after all quite unjustified that casimir had been rather consciously absorbed in his work that he had heard her first knock and plunged the more profoundly into those depths of absorption where the true artist always dwells or at any rate ought to dwell 
to rise at her third appeal with a slow pained reluctance cursing perhaps at the importunity of a world which thus noisily interrupted the flow of his inspiration queer the way they stare at one she went on with a note in her dying voice of a petulance that the children had not inspired does one look such a guy lippiat threw open the door at the head of the stairs and stood there on the threshold waiting for her queer he repeated not a bit and as she moved past him into the room he laid his hand on her shoulder and fell into step with her leaving the door to slam behind them merely an example of the mob's instinctive dislike of the aristocratic individual that's all oh why was i born with a different face thank god i was though and so were you but the difference has its disadvantages the children throw stones they didn't throw stones mrs Vavish was too truthful this time they halted in the middle of the studio it was not a very large room and there were too many things in it the easel stood near the centre of the studio round it lepiat kept a space permanently cleared there was a broad fairway leading to the door and another narrower and tortuously winding between boxes and piled up furniture and tumbled books gave access to his bed there was a piano and a table permanently set with dirty plates and strewed with the relics of two or three meals bookshelves stood on either side of the fireplace and lying on the floor were still more books piles on dusty piles mrs Vavish stood looking at the picture on the easel abstract again she didn't like it and lippiat who had dropped his hand from her shoulder had stepped back the better to see her stood earnestly looking at mrs Vavish. may i kiss you he asked after a silence mrs Vavish turned towards him smiling agonizingly her eyebrows ironically lifted her eyes steady and calm and palely brightly inexpressive if it really gives you any pleasure she said it won't i may say to me you make me suffer a great deal said lippiat and said it so quietly and unaffectedly that myra was almost startled she was accustomed with casimir to noisier and more magniloquent protestations i'm very sorry she said and really she felt sorry but i can't help it can i i suppose you can't he said you can't he repeated and his voice had now become the voice of prometheus in his bitterness nor can tigresses he had begun to pace up and down the unobstructed fairway between his easel and the door lippiat liked pacing while he talked you like playing with the victim he went on he must die slowly reassured mrs Vavish faintly smiled this was the familiar casimir so long as he could talk like this could talk like an old-fashioned french novel it was all right he couldn't really be so very unhappy she sat down on the nearest unencumbered chair lippiat continued to walk back and forth waving his arms as he walked but perhaps it's good for one to suffer he went on perhaps it's unavoidable and necessary perhaps i ought to thank you can an artist do anything if he's happy would he ever want to do anything what is art after all but a protest against the horrible inclemency of life he halted in front of her with arms extended in a questioning gesture mrs Vavish slightly shrugged her shoulders she really didn't know she couldn't answer ah but that's all nonsense he burst out again all rot i want to be happy and contented and successful and of course i should work better if i were and i want oh above everything everything i want you to possess you completely and exclusively and jealously and for ever and the desire is like rust corroding my heart it's like moth-eating holes in the fabric of my mind and you merely laugh he threw up his hands and let them limply fall again but i don't laugh 
said mrs vavish on the contrary she was very sorry for him and what was more he rather bored her for a few days once she had thought she might be in love with him his impetuosity had seemed a torrent strong enough to carry her away she had found out her mistake very soon after that he had rather amused her and now he rather bored her no decidedly she never laughed she wondered why she still went on seeing him simply because one must see some one or why are you going to go on with my portrait she asked lippia sighed yes he said i suppose i'd better be getting on with my work work it's the only thing portrait of a tigress the cynical titan spoke again or shall i call it portrait of a woman who has never been in love that would be a very stupid title said mrs vavish or portrait of the artist's heart disease that would be good that would be damned good lippiat laughed very loudly and slapped his thighs he looked mrs vavish thought peculiarly ugly when he laughed his face seemed to go all to pieces not a corner of it but was wrinkled and distorted by the violent grimace of mirth even the forehead was ruined when he laughed foreheads are generally the human part of people's faces let the nose twitch and the mouth grin and the eyes twinkle as monkeyishly as you like the forehead can still be calm and serene the forehead still knows how to be human but when casimir laughed his forehead joined in the general disintegrating grimace and sometimes even when he wasn't laughing when he was just vivaciously talking his forehead seemed to lose its calm and would twitch and wrinkle itself in a dreadful kind of agitation portrait of the artist's heart disease she didn't find it so very funny the critics would think it was a problem picture lippiat went on and so it would be by god so it would be you are a problem you're the sphinx i wish i were oedipus and could kill you all this mythology mrs vavish shook her head he made his way through the intervening litter and picked up a canvas that was leaning with averted face against the wall near the window he held it out at arm's length and examined it his head critically cocked on one side oh it's good he said softly it's good look at it and stepping out once more into the open he propped it up against the table so that mrs vavish could see it without moving from her chair it was a stormy vision of her it was myra seen so to speak through a tornado he had distorted her in the portrait had made her longer and thinner than she really was had turned her arms into sleek tubes and put a bright metallic polish on the curve of her cheek the figure in the portrait seemed to be leaning backwards a little from the surface of the canvas leaning sideways too with the twist of an ivory statuette carved out of the curving tip of a great tusk only somehow in lippiat's portrait the curve seemed to lack grace it was without point it had no sense you've made me look said mrs vavish at last as though i were being blown out of shape by the wind all this show of violence what was the point of it she didn't like it she didn't like it at all but casimir was delighted with her comment he slapped his thighs and once more laughed his restless sharp-featured face to pieces yes by god he shouted by god that's right blown out of shape by the wind that's it you've said it he began stamping up and down the room again gesticulating the wind the great wind that's in me he struck his forehead the wind of life the wild west wind i feel it inside me blowing blowing it carries me along with it for though it's inside me it's more than i am it's a force that comes from somewhere else it's life itself it's god it blows me along in the teeth of opposing fate it makes me work on fight on he was like a man who walks along a sinister road at night 
and sings to keep up his own spirits to emphasize and magnify his own existence and when i paint when i write or improvise my music it bends the things i have in my mind it pushes them in one direction so that everything i do has the look of a tree that streams northeast with all its branches and all its trunk from the root upwards as though it were trying to run from before the atlantic gale lippiot stretched out his two hands and with fingers splayed out to the widest and trembling in the excessive tension of the muscles moved them slowly upwards and sideways as though he were running his palms up the stem of a little wind wizened tree on a hilltop above the ocean mrs Vavish continued to look at the unfinished portrait it was as noisy and easy and immediately effective as a vermouth advertisement in the streets of padua canzano bonomelli campari illustrious names giotto and montagne mouldered meanwhile in their respective chapels and look at this lippiot went on he took down the canvas that was clamped to the easel and held it out for her inspection it was one of casimir's abstract paintings a procession of machine-like forms rushing up diagonally from right to left across the canvas with as it were a spray of energy blowing back from the crest of the wave towards the top right-hand corner in this painting he said i symbolize the artist's conquering spirit rushing on the universe making it its own he began to declaim look down conquistador there on the valley's broad green floor there lies the lake the jewelled cities gleam chalco and Tlacopan awaiting the coming man looking down on mexico conquistador land of your golden dream or the same idea in terms of music and lippiot dashed to the piano and evoked a distorted ghost of scryabin you see he asked feverishly when the ghost was laid again and the sad cheap jangling had faded again into silence you feel the artist rushes on the world conquers it gives a beauty imposes a moral significance he returned to the picture this will be fine when it's finished he said tremendous you feel the wind blowing there too and with a pointing finger he followed up the onrush of the forms the great southwester driving them on like leaves from an enchanter fleeing only not chaotically not in disorder they are blown so to speak in column of four by a conscious wind he leaned the canvas against the table and was free again to march and brandish his conquering fists life he said life that's the great essential thing you've got to get life into your art otherwise it's nothing and life only comes out of life out of passion and feeling it can't come out of theories that's the stupidity of all this chatter about art for art's sake and the aesthetic emotions and purely formal values and all that it's only the formal relations that matter one subject is just as good as another that's the theory you've only got to look at the pictures of the people who put it into practice to see that it won't do life comes out of life you must paint with passion and the passion will stimulate your intellect to create the right formal relations and to paint with passion you must paint things that passionately interest you moving things human things nobody except a mystical pantheist like van gogh can seriously be as much interested in napkins apples and bottles as in his lover's face or the resurrection or the destiny of man could montaigne have devised his splendid compositions if he had painted arrangements of chianti flasks and cheeses instead of crucifixions martyrs and triumphs of great men nobody but a fool could believe it and could i have painted that portrait if i hadn't loved you if you weren't killing me ah bonomelli and illustrious canzano passionately i paint passion i draw life out of life and i wish them joy 
of their bottles and their canadian apples and their muddy table napkins with the beastly folds in them that looked like loops of tripe once more lipiot disintegrated himself with laughter then was silent mrs vavish nodded slowly and reflectively i think you're right she said yes he was surely right there must be life life was the important thing that was precisely why his paintings were so bad she saw now there was no life in them plenty of noise there was and gesticulation and a violent galvanized twitching but no life only the theatrical show of it there was a flaw in the conduit somewhere between the man and his work life leaked out he protested too much but it was no good there was no disguising the deadness her portrait was a dancing mummy he bored her now did she even positively dislike him behind her unchanging pale eyes mrs Vavish wondered but in any case she reflected one needn't always like the people with whom one associates there are music halls as well as confidential boudoirs some people are admitted to the tea-party and the tete-a-tete -tete. others on a stage invisible poor things to themselves do their little song and dance roll out their characteristic patter and having provided you with your entertainment are dismissed with their due share of applause but then what if they become boring well said lipiot at last he had stood there motionless for a long time biting his nails i suppose we'd better begin our sitting he picked up the unfinished portrait and adjusted it on the easel i've wasted a lot of time he said and there isn't after all so much of it to waste he spoke gloomily and his whole person had become all of a sudden curiously shrunken and deflated there isn't so much of it he repeated and sighed i still think of myself as a young man young and promising don't you know casimir lipiot it's a young promising sort of name isn't it but i'm not young i've passed the age of promise every now and then i realize it and it's painful it's depressing mrs Vavish stepped up on the model's dais and took her seat is that right she asked lipiot looked first at her then at his picture her beauty his passion were they only to meet on the canvas ops was her lover time was passing he felt tired that'll do he said and began painting how young are you he asked after a moment twenty-five i should imagine said mrs Vavish. twenty-five good lord it's nearly fifteen years since i was twenty-five fifteen years fighting all the time god how i hate people sometimes everybody it's not their malignity i mind i can give them back as good as they give me it's their power of silence and indifference it's their capacity for making themselves deaf here am i with something to say to them something important and essential and i've been saying it for more than fifteen years i've been shouting it they pay no attention i bring them my head and heart on a charger and they don't even notice that the things are there i sometimes wonder how much longer i can manage to go on his voice had become very low and it trembled one's nearly forty you know the voice faded huskily away into silence languidly and as though the business exhausted him he began mixing colours on his palette mrs Vavish looked at him no he wasn't young at the moment indeed he seemed to have become much older than he really was an old man was standing there peaked and sharp and worn he had failed he was unhappy but the world would have been unjuster less discriminating if it had given him success some people believe in you she said there was nothing else for her to say lipiot looked up at her you he asked mrs Vavish nodded deliberately it was a lie but was it possible to tell the truth and then there is the future she reassured him and her faint deathbed voice seemed to prophesy with a perfect certainty you're not forty yet you've got twenty thirty years of work in front of you and there were others after all who had to wait a long time sometimes till after they were dead great men blake for instance she felt positively ashamed it was like a little talk by dr frank crane but she felt still more ashamed 
when she saw that casimir had begun to cry and that the tears were rolling one after another slowly down his face he put down his palette he stepped on to the dais he came and knelt at mrs vavish's feet he took one of her hands between his own and he bent over it pressing it to his forehead as though it were a charm against unhappy thoughts sometimes kissing it soon it was wet with tears he wept almost in silence it's all right mrs vavish kept repeating it's all right and she laid her free hand on his bowed head she patted it comfortingly as one might pat the head of a large dog that comes and thrusts its muzzle between one's knees she felt even as she made it how meaningless and unintimate the gesture was if she had liked him she would have run her fingers through his hair but somehow his hair rather disgusted her it's all right all right but of course it wasn't all right and she was comforting him under false pretenses and he was kneeling at the feet of somebody who simply wasn't there so utterly detached so far away she was from all this scene and all his misery you're the only person he said at last who cares or understands mrs Vavish could almost have laughed he began once more to kiss her hand beautiful and enchanting myra you were always that but now you're good and dear as well now i know you're kind poor casimir she said why was it that people always got involved in one's life if only one could manage things on the principle of the railways parallel tracks that was the thing for a few miles you'd be running at the same speed there'd be delightful conversation out of the windows you'd exchange the omelette in your restaurant car for the vol au vent in theirs and when you'd said all there was to say you'd put on a little more steam wave your hand blow a kiss and away you'd go forging ahead along the smooth polished rails but instead of that there were these dreadful accidents the points were wrongly set the trains came crashing together or people jumped on as you were passing through the stations and made a nuisance of themselves and wouldn't allow themselves to be turned off poor casimir but he irritated her he was a horrible bore she ought to have stopped seeing him you can't wholly dislike me then but of course not my poor casimir if you knew how horribly i loved you he looked up at her despairingly but what's the good said mrs Vavish. have you ever known what it's like to love some one so much that you feel you could die of it so that it hurts all the time as though there were a wound have you ever known that mrs Vavish smiled her agonizing smile nodded slowly and said perhaps and one doesn't die you know one doesn't die lippiot was leaning back staring fixedly up at her the tears were dry on his face his cheeks were flushed do you know what it is he asked to love so much that you begin to long for the anodyne a physical pain to quench the pain in the soul you don't know that and suddenly with his clenched fist he began to bang the wooden dais on which he was kneeling blow after blow with all his strength mrs Vavish leant forward and tried to arrest his hand you're mad casimir she said you're mad don't do that she spoke with anger lippiath laughed till his face was all broken up with the grimace and proffered for her inspection his bleeding knuckles the skin hung in little white tags and tatters and from below the blood was slowly oozing up to the surface look he said and laughed again then suddenly with an extraordinary agility he jumped to his feet bounded from the dais and began once more to stride up and down the fairway between his easel and the door by god he kept repeating by god by god i feel it in me i can face the whole lot of you the whole damned lot yes and i shall get the better of you yet an artist he called up that traditional ghost and it comforted him he wrapped himself with a protective gesture within the ample folds of its bright mantle an artist doesn't fail under unhappiness he gets new strength from it the torture makes him sweat new masterpieces he began to talk about his books his poems and pictures all the great things in his head the things he had already done he talked about his exhibition ah by god 
that would astonish them that would bowl them over this time the blood mounted to his face there was a flush over the high projecting cheekbones he could feel the warm blood behind his eyes he laughed aloud he was a laughing lion he stretched out his arms he was enormous his arms reached out like the branches of a cedar the artist walked across the world and the mangy dogs ran yelping and snapping behind him the great wind blew and blew driving him on it lifted him and he began to fly mrs Vavish, listen it didn't look as though he would get much further with the portrait End of chapter six chapter seven of antique hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven it was press day the critics had begun to arrive mr albemarle circulated among them with a ducal amiability the young assistant hovered vaguely about straining to hear what the great men had to say and trying to pretend that he wasn't eavesdropping lippiot's pictures hung on the walls and lippiot's catalogue thick with its preface and its explanatory notes was in all hands very strong mr albemarle kept repeating very strong indeed it was his password for the day little mr clew who represented the daily post was inclined to be enthusiastic how well he writes he said to mr albemarle looking up from the catalogue and how well he paints what impasto 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 the young assistant sidled off unobtrusively to the desk and made a note of it he would look the word up in grubb's dictionary of art and artists later on he made his way back circuitously and as though by accident into mr clue's neighbourhood mr clue was one of those rare people who have a real passion for art he loved painting all painting indiscriminately in a picture gallery he was like a turk in a harem he adored them all he loved memling as much as raphael he loved grunewald and michelangelo holman hunt and manet romney and tintoretto how happy he could be with all of them sometimes it is true he hated but that was only when familiarity had not yet bred love at the first post-impressionist exhibition for example in nineteen eleven he had taken a very firm stand this is an obscene farce he had written then now however there was no more passionate admirer of matisse's genius as a connoisseur and kunstforscher mr clue was much esteemed people would bring him dirty old pictures to look at and he would exclaim at once why it's an el greco a piazzetta or some other suitable name asked how he knew he would shrug his shoulders and say but it's signed all over his certainty and his enthusiasm were infectious since the coming of el greco into fashion he had discovered dozens of early works by that great artist for lord petersfield's collection alone he had found four early el grecos all by pupils of bassano lord peter field's confidence in mr clue was unbounded not even that affair of the primitives had shaken it it was a sad affair lord peter field's duccio had shown signs of cracking the estate carpenter was sent for to take a look at the panel he had looked a worse seasoned piece of illinois hickory he said i've never seen after that he looked at the simone martini for that on the contrary he was full of praise smooth-grained well seasoned 
it wouldn't crack no not in a hundred years a nicer slice of board never came out of america he had a hyperbolical way of speaking lord petersfield was extremely angry he dismissed the estate carpenter on the spot after that he told mr clew that he wanted a giorgione and mr clew went out and found him one which was signed all over i like this very much said mr clew pointing to one of the thoughts with which lippiot had prefaced his catalogue genius he adjusted his spectacles and began to read aloud is life genius is a force of nature in art nothing else counts the modern impotents who are afraid of genius and who are envious of it have invented in self-defence the notion of the artist the artist with his sense of form his style his devotion to pure beauty etc etc but genius includes the artist every genius has among very many others the qualities attributed by the impotence to the artist the artist without genius is a carver of fountains through which no water flows very true said mr clew very true indeed he marked the passage with his pencil mr albemarle produced the password very strongly put he said i have always felt that myself said mr clew el greco for example good morning what about el greco said a voice all in one breath the thin long skin-covered skeleton of mr mallard hung over them like a guilty conscience mr mallard wrote every week in the hebdo model digest he had an immense knowledge of art and a sincere dislike of all that was beautiful the only modern painter whom he really admired was hodler all others were treated by him with a merciless savagery he tore them to pieces in his weekly articles with all the holy gusto of a calvinist iconoclast smashing images of the virgin what about el greco he repeated he had a peculiarly passionate loathing of el greco mr clew smiled up at him propitiatingly he was afraid of mr mallard his enthusiasms were no match for mr mallard's erudite and logical disgusts i was merely quoting him as an example he said an example i hope of incompetent drawing baroque composition disgusting forms garish colouring and hysterical subject matter mr mallard showed his old ivory teeth in a menacing smile those are the only things which el greco's work exemplifies mr clew gave a nervous little laugh what do you think of these he asked pointing to lippiot's canvases they look to me very ordinarily bad answered mr mallard the young assistant listened appalled in a business like this how was it possible to make good all the same said mr clew courageously i like that bowl of roses in the window with the landscape behind number twenty nine he looked in the catalogue and there's a really charming little verse about it o oh, beauty of the rose goodness as well as perfume exhaling who gazes on these flowers on this blue hill and ripening field he knows where duty leads and that the nameless powers in a rose can speak their will really charming mr clew made another mark with his pencil but commonplace commonplace mr mallard shook his head and in any case a verse can't justify a bad picture what an unsubtle harmony of colour and how uninteresting the composition is that receding diagonal it's been worked to death he too made a mark in his catalogue a cross and a little circle arranged like the skull and crossbones on a pirate's flag mr mallard's catalogues were always covered with these little marks they were his symbols of condemnation mr albemarle meanwhile had moved away to greet the new arrivals to the critic of the daily cinema he had to explain that there were no portraits of celebrities the reporter from the evening planet had to be told which were the best pictures mr lippiot he dictated is a poet 
and philosopher as well as a painter his catalogue is a hmm declaration of faith the reporter took it down in shorthand and very nice too he said i'm most grateful to you sir most grateful and he hurried away to get to the cattle show before the king should arrive mr albemarle affably addressed himself to the critic of the morning globe i always regard this gallery said a loud and cheerful voice full of bulls and canaries in chorus as positively a mauvais lieu such exhibitions and mr mur captain shrugged his shoulders expressively he halted to wait for his companion mrs viviche had lagged behind reading the catalogue as she slowly walked along it's a complete book she said full of poems and essays and short stories even so far as i can see oh the usual cracker mottoes mr mur captain laughed i know the sort of thing look after the past and the future will look after itself god squared minus man squared equals art plus life times art minus life the higher the art the fewer the morals only that's too nearly good sense to have been invented by lippiot but i know the sort of thing i could go on like that for ever mr mercaptan was delighted with himself i'll read you one of them said mrs viviche a picture is a chemical combination of plastic form and spiritual significance crikey said mr mercaptan those who think that a picture is a matter of nothing but plastic form are like those who imagine that water is made of nothing but hydrogen mr mercaptan made a grimace what writing he exclaimed le style c'est l'homme lippiot hasn't got a style argal inexorable conclusion lippiot doesn't exist my word though look at those horrible great nudes there like caracas with cubical muscles samson and delilah said mrs viviche would you like me to read about them certainly not mrs viviche did not press the matter casimir she thought must have been thinking of her when he wrote this little poem about poets and women crossed genius torments the sweating of masterpieces she sighed those leopards are rather nice she said and looked at the catalogue again an animal is a symbol and its form is significant in the long process of adaptation evolution has refined and simplified and shaped till every part of the animal expresses one desire a single idea man who has become what he is not by specialization but by generalization symbolizes with his body no one thing he is a symbol of everything from the most hideous and ferocious bestiality to godhead dear me said mr mercaptan a canvas of mountains and enormous clouds like nascent sculptures presented itself aerial alps mrs viviche began to read aerial alps of amber and of snow junonian flesh and bosomy alabaster carved by the wind's uncertain hands mr mercaptan stopped his ears please please he begged number seventeen said mrs viviche is called woman on a cosmic background a female figure stood leaning against a pillar on a hilltop and beyond was a blue night with stars underneath is written for one at least she is more than the starry universe mrs viviche remembered that lippiot had once said very much that sort of thing to her so many of casimir's things remind me she said of those italian vermouth advertisements you know senzano bonamelli and all these i wish they didn't this woman in white with her head in the great bear she shook her head poor casimir mr mercaptan roared and squealed with laughter bonomelli he said that's precisely it what a critic myra i take off my hat they moved on and what's this grand transformation scene he asked mrs viviche 
looked at the catalogue it's called the sermon on the mount she said and really do you know i rather like it all that crowd of figures slanting up the hill and the single figures on the top it seems to me very dramatic my dear protested mr markupton and in spite of everything said mrs vavish feeling suddenly and uncomfortably that she had somehow been betraying the man he's really very nice you know very nice indeed her expiring voice sounded very decidedly ah c'est femme exclaimed mr murkopton c'est femme they're all pacifies and leaders they all in their hearts prefer beasts to men savages to civilized beings even you myra i really believe he shook his head mrs vavish ignored the outburst very nice she repeated thoughtfully only rather a bore her voice expired altogether they continued their round of the gallery End of chapter seven chapter eight of antic hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight critically in the glasses of mr bojanus's fitting-room cumbrell examined his profile his back view inflated the patent small clothes bulged bulged decidedly though with a certain gracious opulence that might in a person of the other sex have seemed only deliciously natural in him however gumbrell had to admit the opulence seemed a little misplaced and paradoxical still if one has to suffer in order to be beautiful one must also expect to be ugly in order not to suffer practically the trousers were a tremendous success he sat down heavily on the hard wooden bench of the fitting-room and was received as though on a lap of bounding resiliency the patent small clothes there was no doubt would be proof even against marble and the coat he comforted himself would mask with its skirts the too decided bulge or if it didn't well there was no help for it one must resign oneself to bulging that was all very nice he declared at last mr bojanus who had been watching his client in silence and with a polite but also gumbel could not help feeling a somewhat ironical smile coughed it depends he said precisely what you mean by nice he cocked his head on one side and the fine waxed end of his moustache was like a pointer aimed up at some remote star gumbel said nothing but catching sight once more of his own side view nodded a dubious agreement if by nice continued mr bojanus you mean comfortable well and good if however you mean elegant then mr gumbrell i fear i must disagree but elegance said gumbrell feebly playing the philosopher is only relative mr bojanus there are certain african negroes among whom it is considered elegant to pierce the lips and distend them with wooden plates until the mouth looks like a pelican's beak mr bojanus placed his hand in his bosom and slightly bowed very possibly mr gumbrell he replied but if you'll pardon my saying so we are not african negroes gumbrell was crushed deservedly he looked at himself again in the mirrors do you object he asked after a pause to all eccentricities in dress mr bojanus would you put us all into your elegant uniform certainly not replied mr bojanus there are certain walks of life in which eccentricity in appearance is positively a sine qua non mr gumbrell and i might almost say de rigueur in which walks of life mr bojanus may i ask you refer perhaps to the artistic walks sombreros and byronic collars and possibly velveteen trousers though all that sort of thing is surely a little out of date nowadays enigmatically mr bojanus smiled a playful sphinx he thrust his right hand deeper into his bosom and with his left twisted to a finer needle the point of his moustache not artists mr gumbrell he shook his head in practice they may show themselves a little eccentric and negligee but they have no need to look 
unusual on principle it's only the politicians who need to do it on principle it's only de rigueur as one might say in the political walks mr gumbrell you surprise me said gumbrell i should have thought that it was to the politician's interest to look respectable and normal but it is still more to his interest as a leader of men to look distinguished mr bojanus replied will not precisely distinguished he corrected himself because that implies that politicians look distingue which i regret to say mr gumbrell they very often don't distinguishable is more what i mean eccentricity is their badge of office suggested gumbrell he sat down luxuriously on the patent small clothes that's more like it said mr bojanus tilting his moustaches the leader has got to look different from the other ones in the good old days they always wore their official badges the leader had his livery like every one else to show who he was that was sensible mr gumbrell nowadays he has no badge at least not for ordinary occasions for i don't count privy councillors uniforms and all that sort of once a year fancy dress ease reduced to dressing in some eccentric way or making the most of the peculiarities of his personal appearance a very haphazard method of doing things mr gumbrell very haphazard gumbrell agreed mr bojanus went on making small neat gestures as he spoke some of them he said wear ooge collars like mr gladstone some wear orchids and eyeglasses like joe chamberlain some let their air grow like lord george some wear curious ats like winston churchill some put on black shirts like this mussolini and some put on red ones like garibaldi some turn up their moustaches like the german emperor some turn them down like clemenceau some grow whiskers like turpits i don't speak of all the uniforms orders ornaments head-dresses feathers crowns buttons tattooings earrings sashes swords train sierras urums thumums and what not mr gumbrell that have been used in the past and in other parts of the world to distinguish the leader we who know our history mr gumbrell we know all about that gumbrell made a deprecating gesture you speak for yourself mr bojanus he said mr bojanus bowed pray continue said gumbrell mr bojanus bowed again well mr gumbrell he said the point of all these things as i've already remarked is to make the leader look different so that he can be recognized at the first coup d'oeil as you might say by the erd he happens to be leading for the ooman erd mr gumbrell is an erd which can't do without a leader sheep for example and never notice that they had a leader nor rooks bees on the other hand i take it av at least when they're swarming correct me mr gumbrell if i'm wrong natural history was never as you might say my forty nor mine protested gumbrell as for elephants and wolves mr gumbrell i can't pretend to speak of them with first and knowledge nor llamas nor locusts nor squab pigeons nor lemmings but human beings mr gumbrell those i can claim to talk of with authority if i may say so in all modesty and not as the scribes i have made a special study of them mr gumbrell and my profession has brought me into contact with very numerous specimens gumbrell could not help wondering where precisely in mr bojanus's museum he himself had his place the human erd mr bojanus went on must have a leader and a leader must have something to distinguish him from the erd it's important for his interests that he should be recognized easily see a baby reaching out of a bath and you immediately think of peer's soap see the white air waving out behind and think of lloyd george that's the secret but in my opinion mr gumbrell the old system was much more sensible give them regular uniforms and badges i say make cabinet ministers wear feathers in their air then the people would be looking to a real fixed symbol of leadership not to the peculiarities of the mere individuals beards and air and funny collars change but a good uniform is always the same give them feathers that's what i say mr gumbrell feathers will increase the dignity of the state and lessen the importance of the individual and that concluded mr bojanus with emphasis that mr gumbrell will be all to the good but you don't mean to tell me said gumbrell that if i chose to show myself to the multitude in my inflated trousers i could become a leader do you i know said mr bojanus you'd have to have the talent for talking and ordering people about to begin with 
feathers wouldn't give the genius but they magnified the effect of what there was cumberl got up and began to divest himself of the small clothes he unscrewed the valve and the air whistled out dyingly he too sighed curious he said pensively that i've never felt the need for a leader i've never met any one i felt i could wholeheartedly admire or believe in never any one i wanted to follow it must be pleasant i should think to hand oneself over to somebody else it must give you a warm splendid comfortable feeling mr bojanus smiled and shook his head you and i mr gumbrell he said were not the sort of people to be impressed with feathers or even by talking and ordering about we may not be leaders ourselves but at any rate we aren't the erd not the main herd perhaps not any erd mr bojanus insisted proudly gumbrell shook his head dubiously and buttoned up his trousers he was not sure now he came to think of it that he didn't belong to all the herds by a sort of honorary membership and temporarily as occasion offered as one belongs to the union at the sister university or to the, the naval and military club while one's own is having its annual clean-out shearwater's herd lippiot's herd mr mercaptan's herd mrs viviche's herd the architectural herd of his father the educational herd but that thank god was now bleeding on distant pastures the herd of mr bojanus he belonged to them all a little to none of them completely nobody belonged to his herd how could they no chameleon can live with comfort on a tartan he put on his coat i'll send the garments this evening said mr bojanus cumberl left his shop at the theatrical wigmakers in leicester square he ordered a blond fan-shaped beard to match his own hair and moustache he would at any rate be his own leader he would wear a badge a symbol of authority and coleman had said that there were dangerous relations to be entered into by the symbol's aid ah now he was provisionally a member of coleman's herd it was all very depressing End of chapter eight chapter nine of antique hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine fan-shaped blonde mounted on gauze and guaranteed undetectable it arrived from the wig-maker preciously packed in a stout cardboard box six times too large for it and accompanied by a quarter of a pint of the choicest spirit gum in the privacy of his bedroom gumbrel uncoffined it held it out for his own admiration caressed its silkiness and finally tried it on holding it provisionally to his chin in front of the looking-glass the effect he decided immediately was stunning was grandiose from melancholy and all too mild he saw himself transformed on the instant into a sort of jovial henry the eighth into a massive rabelaisian man broad and powerful and exuberant with vitality and hair the proportions of his face were startlingly altered the podium below the mouth had been insufficiently massive to carry the stately order of the nose and the ratiocinative attic of the forehead noble enough no doubt in itself had been disproportionately high the beard now supplied the deficiencies in the stylobate and planted now on a firm basement of will the order of the senses the aerial attic of ideas reared themselves with a more classical harmoniousness of proportion it only remained for him to order from mr bojanus an american coat padded out at the shoulders as squarely and heroically as a doublet of the cento, and he would look the complete rabelaisian man great eater deep drinker stout fighter prodigious lover clear thinker creator of beauty seeker of truth and prophet of heroic grandeurs fitted out with coat and beard he could qualify for the next vacancy among the cenobites of thelema he removed his beard put his beaver up as they used to say in the fine old days of chivalry he would have to remember that little joke for coleman's benefit he put his beaver up ha ha and stared ruefully at the far from rabelaisian figure which now confronted him 
the moustache that was genuine enough which had looked in conjunction with the splendid work of art below so fierce and manly served by itself he now perceived only droopily to emphasize his native mildness and melancholy it was a dismal affair which might have belonged to maurice barre in youth a slanting flagging sagging thing such as could only grow on the lip of an assiduous cultivator of the me and would become as one grew older ludicrously out of place on the visage of a roaring nationalist if it weren't that it fitted in so splendidly with the beard if it weren't that it became so marvellously different in the new context he had now discovered for it he would have shaved it off then and there mournful appendage but now he would transform it he would add to it its better half zadig's quatrain to his mistress when the tablet on which it was written was broken in two became a treasonable libel on the king so this moustache thought gumbel as gingerly he applied the spirit gum to his cheeks and chin this moustache which by itself serves only to betray me becomes as soon as it is joined to its missing context an amorous arm for the conquest of the fair sex a little far-fetched he decided a little ponderous and besides as so few people had read zadig not much use in conversation cautiously and with neat meticulous finger-tips he adjusted the transformation to his gummed face pressed it firmly held it while it stuck fast the portals of thelema opened before him he was free of those rich orchards those halls and courts those broad staircases winding in noble spirals within the flanks of each of the fair round towers and it was coleman who had pointed out the way he felt duly grateful one last look at the complete man one final and definitive constatation that the mild and melancholy one was for the time at least no more and he was ready in all confidence to set out he selected a loose light great coat not that he needed a coat at all for the day was bright and warm but until mr bojanus had done his labour of padding he would have to broaden himself out in this way even if it did mean that he might be uncomfortably hot to fall short of complete manhood for fear of a little inconvenience would be absurd he slipped therefore into his light coat a toga mr bojanus called it a very neat toga in real west country whipcord he put on his broadest and blackest felt hat for breadth above everything was what he needed to give him completeness breadth of stature breadth of mind breadth of human sympathy breadth of smile breadth of humour breadth of everything the final touch was a massive an antique malacca cane belonging to his father if he had possessed a bulldog he would have taken it out on a leash but he did not he issued into the sunshine unaccompanied but unaccompanied he did not mean to remain for long these warm bright may days were wonderful days for being in love on and to be alone on such days was like a malady it was a malady from which the mild and melancholy man suffered all too frequently and yet there were millions of superfluous women in the country millions of them every day in the streets one saw thousands of them passing and some were exquisite were ravishing the only possible soul-mates thousands of unique soul-mates every day the mild and melancholy one allowed them to pass for ever but to-day to-day he was the complete and rabelaisian man he was bearded to the teeth the imbecile game was at its height there would be opportunities and the complete man could know how to take them no he would not be unaccompanied for long outside in the square the fourteen plane trees glowed in their young unsullied green at the end of every street the golden muslin of the haze hung in an unwrinkled curtain that thinned away above the sky's gauzy horizon to transparent nothing against the intenser blue the dim conch-like murmur that in a city is silence 
seemed hazily to identify itself with the golden mistiness of summer and against this dim wide background the yells of the playing children detached themselves distinct and piercing beaver they shouted beaver and is it cold up there full of playful menace the complete man shook at them his borrowed malacca he accepted their prompt hail as the most favourable of omens at the first tobacconists gumbrel bought the longest cigar he could find and trailing behind him expiring blue wreaths of cuban smoke he made his way slowly and with an ample swagger towards the park it was there under the elms on the shores of the ornamental waters that he expected to find his opportunity that he intended how confidently behind his gargantuan mask to take it the opportunity offered itself sooner than he expected he had just turned into the queen's road and was sauntering past whiteley's with the air of one who knows that he has a right to a good place to two or three good places even in the sun when he noticed just in front of him peering intently at the new season's models a young woman whom in his mild and melancholy days he would have only hopelessly admired but who now to the complete man seemed a destined and accessible prey she was fairly tall but seemed taller than she actually was by reason of her remarkable slenderness not that she looked disagreeably thin far from it it was a rounded slenderness the complete man decided to consider her as tubular flexible and tubular like a section of boa constrictor should one say she was dressed in clothes that emphasized this serpentine slimness in a close-fitting grey jacket that buttoned up to the neck and a long narrow grey skirt that came down to her ankles on her head was a small sleek black hat that looked almost as though it were made of metal it was trimmed on one side with a bunch of dull golden foliage those golden leaves were the only touch of ornament in all the severe smoothness and unbroken tubularity of her person as for her face that was neither strictly beautiful nor strictly ugly but combined elements of both beauty and ugliness into a whole that was unexpected that was oddly and somehow unnaturally attractive pretending he too to take an interest in the new season's models Cumberland made squinting sideways over the burning tip of his cigar an inventory of her features the forehead that was mostly hidden by her hat it might be pensively and serenely high it might be of that degree of lowness which in men is villainous but in women is only another a rather rustic one perhaps rather canille even but definitely another attraction there was no telling as for her eyes they were green and limpid set wide apart in her head they looked out from under heavy lids and through openings that slanted up towards the outer corners her nose was slightly aquiline her mouth was full-lipped but straight and unexpectedly wide her chin was small round and firm she had a pale skin a little flushed over the cheekbones which were prominent on the left cheek close under the corner of the slanting eye she had a brown mole such hair as gumbrell could see beneath her hat was pale and inconspicuously blonde when she had finished looking at the new season's models she moved slowly on halting for a moment before the travelling trunks and the fitted picnic baskets dwelling for a full minute over the corsets passing the hats for some reason rather contemptuously but pausing which seemed strained for a long pensive look at the cigars and wine as for the tennis rackets and cricket bats the school outfits and the gentlemen's hosiery she hadn't so much as a look for one of them but how lovingly she lingered before the boots and shoes her own feet the complete man noticed with satisfaction had an elegance of florid curves and while other folk walked on neat's leather she was content to be shod with nothing coarser than mottled serpent's skin slowly they drifted up queen's road lingering before every jeweller's every antiquarian's every milliner's on the way the stranger gave him no opportunity and indeed gumbrell reflected how should she for the imbecile game on which he was relying is a travelling piquet for two players 
not a game of patience no sane human being could play it in solitude he would have to make the opportunity himself all that was mild in him all that was melancholy shrank with a sickened reluctance from the task of breaking with what consequences delicious and perilous in the future or in the case of the deserved snub immediately humiliating a silence which by the tenth or twelfth shop window had become quite unbearably significant the mild and melancholy one would have drifted to the top of the road sharing with that community of tastes which is the basis of every happy union her enthusiasm for brass candlesticks and toasting forks imitation chippendale furniture gold watch bracelets and low-waisted summer frocks would have drifted to the top of the road and watched her dumbly disappearing for ever into the green park or along the blank pavements of the bayswater road would have watched her for ever disappear and then if the pubs had happened to be open would have gone and ordered a glass of port and sitting at the bar would have savoured still dumbly among the other drinkers the muddy grapes of the duoro and his own unique loneliness that was what the mild and melancholy one would have done but the sight as he gazed earnestly into an antiquary's window of his own powerful bearded face reflected in a sham hepplewhite mirror reminded him that the mild and melancholy one was temporarily extinct and that it was the complete man who now dawdled smoking his long cigar up the queen's road towards the abbey of thelema he squared his shoulders in that loose toga of mr bojanus's he looked as copious as francois premier the time he decided had come it was at this moment that the reflection of the stranger's face joined itself in the little mirror as she made a little movement away from the old welsh dresser in the corner to that of his own she looked at the spurious hepawite their eyes met in the hospitable glass cumbrel smiled the corners of the stranger's wide mouth seemed faintly to move like petals of the magnolia her eyelids came slowly down over her slanting eyes cumbrel turned from the reflection to the reality if you want to say beaver he said you may the complete man had made his first speech i want to say nothing said the stranger she spoke with a charming precision and distinctness lingering with a pretty emphasis on the in of nothing mm, nothing it sounded rather final she turned away she moved on but the complete man was not one to be put off by a mere ultimatum there he said falling into step with her now i've had it the deserved snub honour is saved prestige duly upheld now we can get on with our conversation the mild and melancholy one stood by gasping with astonished admiration you are very very impertinent said the stranger smiling and looking up from under the magnolia petals it is in my character said the complete man you mustn't blame me one cannot escape from one's heredity that's one's share of original sin there is always grace said the stranger gumbrel caressed his beard true he replied i advise you to pray for it his prayer the mild and melancholy one reflected had already been answered the original sin in him had been self-corrected here is another antique shop said gumbrel shall we stop and have a look at it the stranger glanced at him doubtfully but he looked quite serious they stopped how revolting this sham cottage furniture is gumbrel remarked the shop he noticed was called ye old farm house the stranger who had been on the point of saying how much she liked those lovely old welsh dressers gave him her heartiest agreement so vo vulgar so horribly refined so refined and artistic she laughed on a descending chromatic scale this was excitingly new poor aunt aggie with her arts and crafts and her old english furniture and to think she had taken them so seriously she saw in a flash the fastidious lady that she now was with louis whatever it was furniture at home and jewels and young poets to tea and real artists in the past when she had imagined herself entertaining real artists it had always been among really artistic furniture aunt aggie's furniture but now no oh no this man was probably an artist his beard and that big black hat but not poor very well dressed 
yes it's funny to think that there are people who call that sort of thing artistic one's quite sorry for them she added with a little hiss you have a kind heart said gumble i'm glad to see that not ver very kind i'm afraid she looked at him sideways and significantly as the fastidious lady would have looked at one of the poets well kind enough i hope said the complete man he was delighted with his new acquaintance together they disembogued into the bayswater road it was here gumbrel reflected that the mild and melancholy one would dumbly have slunk away to his glass of port and his loneliness among the alien topers at the bar but the complete man took his new friend by the elbow and steered her into the traffic together they crossed the road together entered the park i still think you are very, very impertinent said the lady what induced you to follow me with a single comprehensive gesture gumbrel indicated the sun the sky the green trees airily glittering the grass the emerald lights and violet shadows of the rustic distance on a day like this he said how could i help it original sin oh the complete man modestly shook his head i lay no claim to originality in this the stranger laughed this was nearly as good as a young poet at the tea-table she was very glad that she'd decided after all to put on her best suit this afternoon even if it was a little stuffy for the warmth of the day he too she noticed was wearing a great coat which seemed rather odd is it original he went on to go and tumble stupidly like an elephant into a pitfall head over ears at first sight she looked at him sideways then closed down the magnolia petals and smiled this was going to be the real thing one of those long those interminable or at any rate indefinitely renewable conversations about love witty subtle penetrating and bold like the conversations in books like the conversations across the tea-table between brilliant young poets and ladies of quality grown fastidious through an excessive experience fastidious and a little weary but still in their subtle way insatiably curious suppose we sit down suggested gumbrel and he pointed to a couple of green iron chairs standing isolated in the middle of the grass close together and with their fronts slanting inwards a little towards one another in a position that suggested a confidential intimacy at the prospect of the conversation that inevitably was about to unroll itself he felt decidedly less elated than did his new friend if there was anything he disliked it was conversations about love it bored him oh it bored him most horribly this minute analysis of the passion that young women always seemed to expect one at some point or other in one's relation with them to make how love alters the character for both good and bad how physical passion need not be incompatible with the spiritual how a hateful and tyrannous possessiveness can be allied in love with the most unselfish solicitude for the other party oh he knew all this and much more so well so well and whether one can be in love with more than one person at a time whether love can exist without jealousy whether pity affection desire can in any way replace the full and genuine passion how often he had had to thrash out these dreary questions and all the philosophic speculations were equally familiar all the physiological and anthropological and psychological facts in the theory of the subject he had ceased to take any interest unhappily a discussion of the theory always seemed to be an essential preliminary to the practice of it he sighed a little wearily as he took his seat on the green iron chair but then recollecting that he was now the complete man and that the complete man must do everything with a flourish and a high hand he leaned forward and smiling with a charming insolence through his beard began tiresias you may remember was granted the singular privilege of living both as a man and a woman ah this was the genuine young poet supporting an elbow on the back of her chair and leaning her cheek against her hand she disposed herself to listen and where necessary brilliantly to interpolate it was through half-closed eyes that she looked at him and she smiled faintly in a manner which she knew from experience to be enigmatic and though a shade haughty though a tiny bit mocking and ironical exceedingly attractive an hour and a half later they were driving towards an address in bloxham gardens mida vale 
the name seemed vaguely familiar to gumbrell bloxham gardens perhaps one of his aunts had lived there once it's a dr dreadful little masonette she explained full of awful things we had to take it furnished it's so impossible to find anything now gumbrell leaned back in his corner wondering as he studied that averted profile who or what this young woman could be she seemed to be in the obvious movement to like the sort of things one would expect people to like she seemed to be as highly civilized in mr murkopton's rather technical sense of the term as free of all prejudices as the great exponent of civilization himself she seemed from coolly dropped hints to possess all the dangerous experience all the assurance and easy ruthlessness of a great lady whose whole life is occupied in the interminable affairs of the heart the senses and the head but by a strange contradiction she seemed to find her life narrow and uninteresting she had complained in so many words that her husband misunderstood and neglected her had complained by implication that she knew very few interesting people the masonette in bloxham gardens was certainly not very splendid six rooms on the second and third floors of a peeling stucco house and the furniture decidedly higher purchase and the curtains and cretons brightly modern positively futurist what one has to put up with in furnished flats the lady made a grimace as she ushered him into the sitting-room and while she spoke the word she really managed to persuade herself that the furniture wasn't theirs that they had found all this sordid stuff cluttering up the rooms not chosen it oh with pains themselves not doggedly paid for it month by month our own things she murmured vaguely are stored in the riviera it was there under the palms among the gaudy melon flowers and the croupier that the fastidious lady had last held her salon of young poets in the riviera that would explain now she came to think of it a lot of things if explanation ever became necessary the complete man nodded sympathetically other people's tastes he held up his hands they both laughed but why do we think of other people he added and coming forward with a conquering impulsiveness he took both her long fine hands in his and raised them to his bearded mouth she looked at him for a second then dropped her eyelids took back her hands i must go and make the tea she said the servants the plural was a pardonable exaggeration are out gallantly the complete man offered to come and help her these scenes of intimate life had a charm all their own but she would not allow it no no she was very firm i simply forbid you you must stay here i won't be a moment and she was gone closing the door carefully behind her left to himself gumbel sat down and filed his nails as for the young lady she hurried along to her dingy little kitchen lit the gas put the kettle on set out the teapot and the cups on a tray and from the biscuit box where it was stored took out the remains of a chocolate cake which had already seen service at the day before yesterday's tea-party when all was ready here she tiptoed across to her bedroom and sitting down at her dressing-table began with hands that trembled a little with excitement to powder her nose and heighten the colour of her cheeks even after the last touch had been given she still sat there looking at her image in the glass the lady and the poet she was thinking the grand dame and the brilliant young man of genius she liked young men with beards but he was not an artist in spite of the beard in spite of the hat he was a writer of sorts so she gathered but he was reticent he was delightfully mysterious she too for that matter the great lady slips out masked into the street touches the young man's sleeve come with me she chooses does not let herself passively be chosen the young poet falls at her feet she lifts him up one is accustomed to this sort of thing she opened her jewel-box took out all her rings there were not many of them alas and put them on two or three of them on second thought she took off again they were a little she suspected with a sudden qualm in other people's taste he was very clever very artistic only that seemed to be the wrong word to use he seemed to know all the new things all the interesting people perhaps he would introduce her to some of them and he was so much at ease behind his knowledge so well assured but for her part she felt pretty certain she had made no stupid mistakes she too had been had looked at any rate which was the important thing very much at ease she liked young men with beards they looked so russian catherine of russia had been one of the great ladies with caprices masked in the streets 
young poet come with me or even young butcher's boy but no but that no that was going too far too low still life life it was there to be lived life to be enjoyed and now and now she was still wondering what would happen next when the kettle which was one of those funny ones which whistle when they come to the boil began fitfully at first then under full steam unflaggingly to sound its mournful otherworldly note she sighed and bestirred herself to attend to it let me help you gumble jumped up as she came into the room what can i do he hovered rather ineptly round her the lady put down her tray on the little table n -n nothing she said n -n nothing he imitated her with a playful mockery am i good for n -n nothing at all he took one of her hands and kissed it nothing that's of the uh, least importance she sat down and began to pour out the tea the complete man also sat down so to adore at first sight he asked as not of the uh, least importance she shook her head smiled raised and lowered her eyelids one was so well accustomed to this sort of thing it had no importance sugar she asked the young poet was safely there sparkling across the tea-table he offered love and she with the easy heartlessness of one who is so well accustomed to this sort of thing offered him sugar he nodded please but if it's of no importance to you he went on then i'll go away at once the lady laughed her section of a descending chromatic scale oh no you won't she said you can't and she felt that the grande dame had made a very fine stroke quite right the complete man replied i couldn't he stirred his tea but who are you he looked up at her suddenly you devilish female he was genuinely anxious to know and besides he was paying her a very pretty compliment what do you do with your dangerous existence i enjoy life she said i think one ought to enjoy life don't you i think it's one's first duty she became quite grave one ought to enjoy every moment of it she said oh passionately adventurously newly excitingly uniquely the complete man laughed a conscientious hedonist i see she felt uncomfortably that the fastidious lady had not quite lived up to her character she had spoken more like a young woman who finds life too dull and daily and would like to get on to the cinema i'm very conscientious she said making significant play with the magnolia petals and smiling her riddling smile she must retrieve the great catherine's reputation i could see that from the first mocked the complete man with a triumphant insolence conscience doth make cowards of us all the fastidious lady only contemptuously smiled have a little chocolate cake she suggested her heart was beating she wondered she wondered there was a long silence gumbrel finished his chocolate cake gloomily drank his tea and did not speak he found all at once that he had nothing to say his jovial confidence seemed for the moment to have deserted him he was only the mild and melancholy one foolishly disguised as a complete man a sheep in beaver's clothing he entrenched himself behind his formidable silence and waited waited at first sitting in his chair then when this total inactivity became unbearable striding about the room she looked at him for all her air of serene composure with a certain disquiet what on earth was he up to now what could he be thinking about frowning like that he looked like a young jupiter bearded and burly though not she noticed quite so burly as he had appeared in his overcoat making ready to throw a thunderbolt perhaps he was thinking of her suspecting her seeing through the fastidious lady and feeling angry at her attempted deception or perhaps he was bored with her perhaps he was wanting to go away well let him go she didn't mind or perhaps he was just made like that a moody young poet that seemed on the whole the most likely explanation it was also the most pleasing and romantic she waited they both waited gumbrel looked at her and was put to shame by the spectacle of her quiet serenity he must do something he told himself he must recover the complete man's lost morale desperately he came to a halt in front of the one decent picture hanging on the walls it was an eighteenth-century engraving of raphael's transfiguration better he always thought in black and white than in its bleakly coloured original that's a nice engraving he said very nice the mere fact of having uttered at all was a great comfort to him a real relief yes she said that belongs to me i found it in a second-hand shop not far from here photography he pronounced with that temporary earnestness which made him seem an enthusiast about everything is a mixed blessing 
has made it possible to reproduce pictures so easily and cheaply that all the bad artists who were well occupied in the past making engravings of good men's paintings are now free to do bad original work of their own all this was terribly impersonal he told himself terribly off the point he was losing ground he must do something drastic to win it back but what she came to his rescue i bought another at the same time she said the last communion of st jerome by who is it i forget ah you mean domenichino's st jerome the complete man was afloat again poussin's favourite picture mine too very nearly i'd like to see that it's in my room i'm afraid but if you don't mind he bowed if you don't she smiled graciously to him and got up this way she said and opened the door it's a lovely picture gumbrell went on loquaciously now behind her as they walked down the dark corridor and besides i have a sentimental attachment to it there used to be a copy of an engraving of it at home when i was a child and i remember wondering and wondering oh it went on for years every time i saw the picture wondering why on earth that old bishop for i did not know it was a bishop should be handing the naked old man a five shilling piece she opened a door they were in her very pink room grave in its solemn and subtly harmonious beauty the picture hung over the mantelpiece hung there among the photographs of the little friends of her own age like some strange object from another world from within that chipped gilt frame all the beauty all the grandeur of religion looked darkly out upon the pink room the little friends of her own age all deliciously nubile sweetly smiled turned up their eyes clasped persian cats or stood jauntily feet apart hand in the breeches pocket of the land girl's uniform the pink roses on the wallpaper the pink and white curtains the pink bed the strawberry-coloured carpet filled all the air with the rosy reflections of nakedness and life and utterly remote absorbed in their grave solemn ecstasy the robed and mitred priest held out the dying saint yearningly received the body of the son of god the ministrants looked gravely on the little angels looped in the air above a gravely triumphant festoon the lion slept at the saint's feet and through the arch beyond the eye travelled out over a quiet country of dark trees and hills there it is she waved towards the mantelpiece but gumbel had taken it all in long ago you see what i mean by the five shilling piece and stepping up to the picture he pointed to the round bright wafer which the priest holds in his hand and whose averted disc is like the essential sun at the centre of the picture's harmonious universe those were the days of five shilling pieces he went on you're probably too young to remember those large lovely things they came my way occasionally and consecrated wafers didn't so you can understand how much the picture puzzled me a bishop giving a naked old man five shillings in a church with angels fluttering overhead and a lion sleeping in the foreground it was obscure it was horribly obscure he turned away from the picture and confronted his hostess who was standing a little way behind him smiling enigmatically and invitingly obscure he repeated but so is everything so is life in general and you he stepped towards her you in particular am i she lifted her limpid eyes at him oh how her heart was beating how hard it was to be the fastidious lady calmly satisfying her caprice how difficult it was to be accustomed to this sort of thing what was going to happen next what happened next was that the complete man came still closer put his arms round her as though he were inviting her to the foxtrot and began kissing her with a startling violence his beard tickled her neck shivering a little she brought down the magnolia petals across her eyes the complete man lifted her up walked across the room carrying the fastidious lady in his arms and deposited her on the rosy catafalque of the bed lying there with her eyes shut she did her best to pretend she was dead gumbrell had looked at his wrist-watch and found that it was six o'clock already he prepared himself to take his departure wrapped in a pink kimono she came out into the hall to wish him farewell when shall i see you again rosy he had learnt that her name was rosy she had recovered her great lady's equanimity and detachment and was able to shrug her shoulders and smile how should i know she asked implying that she could not foresee what her caprice might be an hour hence may i write then and ask one of these days if you do know she put her head on one side and raised her eyebrows doubtfully at last nodded yes you can write she permitted good said the complete man and picked up his wide hat she held out her hand to him with stateliness and with a formal gallantry he kissed it he was just closing the front door behind him when he remembered something he turned round i say he called after the retreating pink kimono 
it's rather absurd but how can i write i don't know your name i can't just address it rosy the great lady laughed delightedly this had the real capriccio flavour wait she said and she ran into the sitting-room she was back again in a moment with an oblong of pasteboard there she said and dropped it into his great coat pocket then blowing a kiss she was gone the complete man closed the door and ascended the stairs well well he said to himself well well he put his hand in his coat pocket and took out the card in the dim light of the staircase he read the name of it with some difficulty mrs james but no but no he read again straining his eyes there was no question of it mrs james shearwater mrs james shearwater that was why he had vaguely known the name of bloxham gardens mrs james shear step after step he descended ponderously good lord he said out loud good lord but why had he never seen her why did shearwater never produce her now he came to think of it he hardly ever spoke of her why had she said the flat wasn't theirs it was he had heard shearwater talk about it did she make a habit of this sort of thing could shearwater be wholly unaware of what she was really like but for that matter what was she really like he was halfway down the last flight when with a rattle and a squeak of hinges the door of the house which was only separated by a short lobby from the foot of the stairs opened revealing on the doorstep shearwater and a friend eagerly talking i take my rabbit the friend was saying he was a young man with dark protruding eyes and staring doggy nostrils very eager lively and loud i take my rabbit and i inject into it the solution of eyes pulped eyes of another dead rabbit you see gumbel's first instinct was to rush up the stairs and hide in the first likely-looking corner but he pulled himself together at once he was a complete man and complete men do not hide moreover he was sufficiently disguised to be quite unrecognizable he stood where he was and listened to the conversation the rabbit continued the young man with his bright eyes and staring sniffing nose he looked like a poacher's terrier ready to go barking after the first white tail that passed his way the rabbit naturally develops the appropriate resistance develops a specific anti-eye to protect itself i then take some of its anti-eye serum and inject it into my female rabbit i then immediately breed from her he paused well asked shearwater in his slow ponderous way he lifted his great round head inquiringly and looked at the doggy young man from under his bushy eyebrows the doggy young man smiled triumphantly the young ones he said emphasizing his words by striking his right fist against the extended palm of his left hand the young ones are born with defective sight thoughtfully shearwater pulled at his formidable moustache hm he said very slowly very remarkable you realize the full significance of it asked the young man we seem to be effecting the germ plasm directly we have found a way of making acquired characteristics pardon me said grumble he had decided that it was time to be gone he ran down the stairs and across the tiled hall he pushed his way firmly but politely between the talkers heritable continued the young man imperturbably eager speaking through and over and round the obstacle damn said shearwater the complete man had trodden on his toe sorry he added absent-mindedly apologizing for the injury he had received gumbrell hurried off along the street if we really have found out a technique for influencing the germplasm directly he heard the doggy young man saying but he was already too far away to catch the rest of the sentence there are many ways he reflected of spending an afternoon the doggy young man refused to come in he had to get in his game of tennis before dinner shearwater climbed the stairs alone he was taking off his hat in the little hall of his own apartment and rosie came out of the sitting-room with a tray full of tea things well he asked kissing her affectionately on the forehead well people to tea only one rosie replied i'll go and make you a fresh cup she glided off rustling in her pink kimono towards the kitchen shearwater sat down in the sitting-room he had brought home with him from the library the fifteenth volume of the biochemical journal there was something in it he wanted to look up he turned over the pages ah here it was he began reading rosie came back again here's your tea she said he thanked her without looking up the tea grew cold on the little table at his side lying on the sofa rosie pondered and remembered had the events of the afternoon she asked herself really happened they seemed very improbable and remote now in this studious silence she couldn't help feeling a little disappointed was it only this so simple and obvious she tried to work herself up into a more exalted mood she even tried to feel guilty but there she failed completely 
she tried to feel rapturous but without much more success still he certainly had been a most extraordinary man such impudence and at the same time such delicacy and tact it was a pity she couldn't afford to change the furniture she saw now that it wouldn't do at all she would go and tell aunt aggie about the dreadful middle-classness of her art and craftiness she ought to have an empire chaise longue like madame recamier she could see herself lying there dispensing tea like a delicious pink snake he called her that well really now she came to think of it all again it had been too queer too queer what's a hedonist she suddenly asked shearwater looked up from the journal of biochemistry what he said a hedonist a man who holds that the end of life is pleasure a conscientious hedonist ah that was good this tea is cold shearwater remarked you should have drunk it before she said the silence renewed and prolonged itself rosy was getting much better shearwater reflected as he washed his hands before supper and not interrupting him when he was busy this evening she had really not disturbed him at all or at most only once and that not seriously there had been times in the past when the child had really made life almost impossible there were those months at the beginning of their married life when she thought she would like to study physiology herself and be a help to him he remembered the hours he had spent trying to teach her elementary facts about the chromosomes it had been a great relief when she abandoned the attempt he had suggested she go in for stenciling patterns on government linen such pretty curtains and things one could make like that but she hadn't taken very kindly to the idea there had followed a long period when she seemed to have nothing to do but prevent him from doing anything ringing him up at the laboratory invading his study sitting on his knee or throwing her arms round his neck or pulling his hair or asking ridiculous questions when he was trying to work shearwater flattered himself that he had been extremely patient he had never got cross he had just gone on as though she weren't there as though she weren't there hurry up he heard her calling the soup's getting cold coming he shouted back and began to dry his large blunt hands she seemed to have been improving lately and to-night to-night she had been a model of non-existence he came striding heavily into the dining-room rosie was sitting at the head of the table ladling out the soup with her left hand she held back the flowing pink sleeve of her kimono so that it should not trail in the plates or the tureen her bare arm showed white and pearly through the steam of lentils how pretty she was he could not resist the temptation but coming up behind her bent down and kissed her rather clumsily on the back of her neck rosie drew away from him really jim she said disapprovingly at meal-times the fastidious lady had to draw the line at these ill-timed tumbling familiarities and what about work-times shearwater asked laughing still you were wonderful this evening rosie quite wonderful he sat down and began eating his soup not a sound all the time i was reading or at any rate only one sound so far as i remember the great lady said nothing but only smiled a little contemptuously and with a touch of pity she pushed away the plate of soup unfinished and planted her elbows on the table slipping her hands under the sleeves of her kimono she began lightly delicately with the tips of her fingers to caress her own arms how smooth they were how soft and warm and how secret under the sleeves and all her body was as smooth and warm was as soft and secret still more secret beneath the pink folds like a warm serpent hidden away secretly secretly End of chapter nine chapter ten of antic hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten mr boldero liked the idea of the patent small clothes he liked it immensely he said immensely there's money in it he said mr boldero was a small dark man of about forty-five active as a bird and with a bird's brown beady eyes a bird's sharp nose he was always busy always had twenty different irons in the fire at once was always fresh clear-headed never tired he was also always unpunctual always untidy he had no sense of time or of order but he got away with it as he liked to say he delivered the goods or rather the goods in the convenient form of cash delivered themselves almost miraculously it always seemed to him 
he was like a bird in appearance but in mind Gumbel found after having seen him once or twice he was like a caterpillar he ate all that was put before him he consumed a hundred times his own mental weight every day other people's ideas other people's knowledge they were his food he devoured them and they were at once his own all that belonged to other people he annexed without a scruple or a second thought quite naturally as though it were already his own and he absorbed it so rapidly and completely he laid public claim to it so promptly that he sometimes deceived people into believing that he had really anticipated them in their ideas that he had known for years and years the things they had just been telling him and which he would at once airily repeat to them with the perfect assurance of one who knows knows by instinct as it were by inheritance at their first luncheon he had asked gumbel to tell him all about modern painting gumbel had given him a brief lecture before the savoury had appeared on the table mr boldera was talking with perfect familiarity of picasso and durin he almost made it understood that he had a fine collection of their works in his drawing-room at home being a trifle deaf however he was not very good at names and gumbel's all too tactful corrections were lost on him he could not be induced to abandon his picasso in favour of any other version of the spaniard's name picasso why he had known all about picasso since he was a schoolboy picasso was an old master already mr boldero was very severe with the waiters and knew so well how things ought to be done at a good restaurant that gumbel felt sure he must recently have lunched with some meticulous gormandizer of the old school and when the waiter made as though to serve them with brandy in small glasses mr boldero was so passionately indignant that he sent for the manager do you mean to tell me he shouted in a perfect frenzy of righteous anger that you don't yet know how brandy ought to be drunk perhaps it was only last week that he himself gumbrell reflected had learned to aerate his cognac in gargantuan beakers meanwhile of course the patent small clothes were not neglected as soon as he had been told about the things but mr boldero began speaking of them with a perfect and practised familiarity they were already his mentally his and it was only mr boldero's generosity that prevented him from making the small clothes more effectively his own if it weren't for the friendship and respect which i feel for your father mr gumbel he said twinkling genially over the brandy i'd just annex your small clothes bag in baggage just annex them ah but they're my patent said gumbel or at least they're in process of being patented the agents are at work mr boldero laughed do you suppose that would trouble me if i wanted to be unscrupulous i'd just take the idea and manufacture our article you'd bring an action i'd have it defended with all the professional erudition that could be brought you'd find yourself let in for a case that might cost thousands and how would you pay for it you'd be forced to come to an agreement out of court mr gumbel that's what you'd have to do and a damn bad agreement it would be for you i can tell you mr boldero laughed very cheerfully at the thought of the badness of this agreement but don't be alarmed he said i shan't do it you know gumbel was not wholly reassured tactfully he tried to find out what terms mr boldero was prepared to offer him. mr boldero was nebulously vague they met again in gumbel's rooms the contemporary drawings on the walls reminded mr boldero that he was now an art expert he told gumbel all about it in gumbel's own words every now and then it was true mr boldero made a little slip bacasso for example remained unshakably bacasso but on the whole the performance was most impressive it made gumbel feel very uncomfortable however while it lasted for he recognized in this characteristic of mr boldero a horrible character of himself he too was an assimilator more discriminating no doubt more tactful knowing better than mr boldero how to turn the assimilated experience into something new and truly his own 
but still a caterpillar definitely a caterpillar he began studying mr boldero with a close and disgustful attention as one might pore over some repulsive memento mori it was a relief when mr boldero stopped talking art and consented to get down to business cumbra was wearing for the occasion the sample pair of small clothes which mr bojanus had made for him for mr boldero's benefit he put them so to speak through their paces he allowed himself to drop with a bump on to the floor arriving there bruiseless and unjarred he sat in complete comfort for minutes at a stretch on the edge of the ornamental iron fender in the intervals he paraded up and down before mr boldero like a mannequin a trifle bulgy said mr boldero but still he was taking it all round favourably impressed it was time he said to begin thinking of details they would have to begin by making experiments with the bladders to discover a model combining as mr boldero put it maximum efficiency with minimum bulge when they had found the right thing they would have it made in suitable quantities by any good rubber firm as for the trousers themselves they could rely for those on sweated female labour in the east end cheap and good said mr boldero it sounds ideal said gumbel and then said mr boldero there's our advertising campaign on that i may say he went on with a certain solemnity will depend the failure or success of our enterprise i consider it of the first importance quite said gumbel nodding importantly and with intelligence we must set to work said mr boldero scientifically gumbel nodded again we have to appeal mr boldero went on so glibly that gumbel felt sure he must be quoting somebody else's words to the great instincts and feelings of humanity they are the sources of action they spend the money if i may put it like that that's all very well said gumbel but how do you propose to appeal to the most important of the instincts i refer as you may well imagine to sex i was just going to come to that said mr boldero raising his hand as though to ask for a patient hearing alas we can't i don't see any way of hanging our small clothes on the sexual peg then we are undone said gumbel too dramatically no no mr boldero was reassuring you make the error of the viennese you exaggerate the importance of sex after all my dear mr gumbel there is also the instinct of self-preservation there is also he leaned forward wagging his finger the social instinct the instinct of the herd true both of them as powerful as sex what are the professor's famous censors but forbidding suggestions from the herd without made powerful and entrenched by the social instinct within gumbel had no answer mr boldero continued smiling so that we shall be all right if we stick to self-preservation and the herd rub in the comfort and the utility the hygienic virtues of our small clothes that will catch their self-preservatory feelings aim at their dread of public opinion at their ambition to be one better than their fellows and their terror of being different at all the ludicrous weaknesses a well-developed social instinct exposes them to we shall get them if we set to work scientifically mr boldero's bird-like eyes twinkled very brightly we shall get them he repeated and he laughed a happy little laugh full of such a childlike diabolism such an innocent gay malignity that it seemed as though a little leprechaun had suddenly taken the financier's place in gumbrell's best armchair gumbrell laughed too for this leprechaunish mirth was infectious we shall get them he echoed oh i'm sure we shall if you said about it mr boldero mr boldero acknowledged the compliment with a smile that expressed no false humility it was his due and he knew it i'll give you some of my ideas about the advertising campaign he said just to give you a notion you can think them over quietly and make suggestions yes yes said gumbrel nodding mr boldero cleared his throat we shall begin he said by making the most simple elementary appeal to their instinct of self-preservation we shall point out that the patent small clothes are comfortable that to wear them is to avoid pain 
a few striking slogans about comfort that's all we want very simple indeed it doesn't take much to persuade a man that it's pleasanter to sit on air than on wood but while we're on the subject of hard seats we shall have to glide off subtly at a tangent to make a flank attack on the social instincts and joining the tip of his forefinger to the tip of his thumb mr boldero moved his hand delicately sideways as though he were sliding it along a smooth brass rail we shall have to speak about the glories and the trials of sedentary labour we must exalt its spiritual dignity and at the same time condemn its physical discomforts the seat of honour don't you know we could talk about that the seats of the mighty the seat that rules the office rocks the world all those lines might be made something of and then we could have little historical chats about thrones how dignified but how uncomfortable they've been we must make the bank clerk and the civil servant feel proud of being what they are and at the same time feel ashamed that being such splendid people they should have to submit to the indignity of having blistered hindquarters in modern advertising you must flatter your public not in the oily abject tradesmanlike style of the old advertisers crawling before clients who were their social superiors that's all over now it's we who are the social superiors because we've got more money than the bank clerks and the civil servants our modern flattery must be manly straightforward sincere the admiration of equal for equal all the more flattering as we aren't equals mr boldero laid a finger to his nose they are dirt and we are capitalists he laughed cumberland laughed too it was the first time that he had ever thought of himself as a capitalist and the thought was exhilarating we flatter them went on mr boldero we say that honest work is glorious and ennobling which it isn't it's merely dull and cretinizing and then we go on to suggest that it would be finer still more ennobling because less uncomfortable if they wore gumbrell's patent small clothes you see the line gumbrell saw the line after that said mr boldero we get on to the medical side of the matter the medical side mr gumbrell that's the most important nobody feels really well nowadays at any rate nobody who lives in a big town and does the kind of loathsome work that the people we're catering for does keeping this fact before our eyes we have to make it clear that only those can expect to be healthy who wear pneumatic trousers that will be a little difficult won't it questioned gumbrell not a bit of it mr boldero laughed with an infectious confidence all we have to do is to talk about the great nerve centres of the spine the shocks they get when you sit down too hard the wearing exhaustion to which long protracted sitting on unpadded seats subjects them we'll have to talk very scientifically about the great lumbar ganglia if there are such things which i really don't pretend to know we'll even talk almost mystically about the ganglia you know that sort of ganglion philosophy mr boldero went on parenthetically very interesting it is sometimes i think we could put in a lot about the dark powerful sense life sex life instinct life which is controlled by the lumbar ganglion how important it is that that shouldn't be damaged that already our modern conditions of civilization tend unduly to develop the intellect and the thoracic ganglia controlling the higher emotions that we're wearing out growing feeble losing our balance in consequence and that the only cure if we are to continue our present mode of civilized life is to be found in gumbrell's patent small clothes mr boldero brought his hand with an emphatic smack on to the table as he spoke as he fairly shouted these last words magnificent said gumbrell with genuine admiration this sort of medical and philosophical dope mr boldero went on is always very effective if it's properly used the public to whom we are making our appeal is of course almost absolutely ignorant on these or indeed on almost all other subjects it is therefore very much impressed by the unfamiliar words particularly if they have such a good juicy sound as the word ganglia there was a young man of east anglia whose loins were a tangle of ganglia murmured gumbrell 
improvisatore precisely said mr boldero precisely you see how juicy it is well as i say they are impressed and they are also grateful they are grateful to us for having given them a piece of abstruse unlikely information which they can pass on to their wives or to such friends as they know don't read the paper in which our advertisement appears can pass on airily don't you know with easy erudition as though they'd known all about ganglia from their childhood and they'll feel such a flow of superiority as they hand on the metaphysics and the pathology that they'll always think of us with affection they'll buy our breeks and they'll get other people to buy that's why mr boldera went off again on an instructive tangent that's why the day of secret patent medicines is really over it's no good saying you have rediscovered some secret known only in the past to the egyptians people don't know anything about egyptology but they have an inkling that such a science exists and that if it does exist it's unlikely that patent medicine makers should have found out facts unknown to the professors at the universities and it's much the same even with secrets that don't come from egypt people know there is such a thing as medical science and they again feel it's improbable that manufacturers should know things ignored by the doctors the modern democratic advertiser is entirely above board he tells you all about it he explains that the digestive juices acting on bismuth give rise to the disinfectant acid he points out that lactic ferment gets destroyed before it reaches the large intestine so that metchnikoff's cure generally won't work and he goes on to explain that the only way of getting the ferment there is to mix it with starch and paraffin starch to feed the ferment on paraffin to prevent the starch being digested before it gets to the intestine and in consequence he convinces you that a mixture of starch paraffin and ferment is the only thing that's any good at all consequently you buy it which you would never have done without the explanation in the same way mr gumbel we mustn't ask people to take our trousers on trust we must explain scientifically why these trousers will be good for their health and by means of the ganglia as i pointed out we can even show that the trousers will be good for their souls and the whole human race at large and as you probably know mr gumbel there is nothing like a spiritual message to make things go combine spirituality with practicality and you fairly got them got them i may say on toast and that's what we can do with our trousers we can put a message into them a big spiritual message decidedly he concluded we shall have to work those ganglia all we can i'll undertake to do that said gumbel who felt very buoyant and self-assured mr boldero's hydrogenous conversation had blown him up like a balloon and i'm sure you'll do it well said mr boldero encouragingly there is no better training for modern commerce than a literary education as a practical business man i always uphold the ancient universities especially in their teaching of the humanities gumbel was much flattered at the moment it seemed supremely satisfying to be told that he was likely to make a good business man the business man took on a radiance began to glow as it were with a phosphorescent splendour then it's very important continued mr boldero to play on their snobbism to exploit that painful sense of inferiority which the ignorant and ingenuous always feel in the presence of the knowing we've got to make our trousers the thing socially right as well as merely personally comfortable we've got to imply somehow that it's bad form not to wear them we've got to make those who don't wear them feel rather uncomfortable like the film of charlie chaplin's where he's the absent-minded young man about town who dresses for dinner immaculately from the waist up white waistcoat tail coat stiff shirt top hat and only discovers when he gets down into the hall of the hotel that he's forgotten to put on his trousers we've got to make them feel like that that's always very successful you know those excellent american advertisements about young ladies whose engagements are broken off because they perspire too freely or have an unpleasant breath how horribly uncomfortable those make you feel we've got to do something of the same sort for our trousers or more immediately applicable would be those tailors advertisements about correct clothes 
good clothes make you feel good you know the sort of line and then those grave warning sentences in which you're told that a correctly cut suit may make the difference between an appointment gained and an appointment lost an interview granted and an interview refused but the most masterly examples i can think of mr boldera went on with growing enthusiasm are those american advertisements of spectacles in which the manufacturers first assume the existence of a social law about goggles and then proceed to invoke all the sanctions which fall on the head of the committer of a solecism upon those who break it it's masterly for sport or relaxation they tell you as though it was a social axiom you must wear spectacles of pure tortoise shell for business tortoise shell rims and nickel earpieces lend incisive poise incisive poise we must remember that for our ads mr gumbrell gumbrell's patent small clothes lend incisive poise to business men for semi-evening dress shell rims with gold earpieces and gold nose bridge and for a full dress gold mounted rimless pence-nez are refinement itself and absolutely correct thus we see a social law has been created according to which every self-respecting myope or astigmat must have four distinct pairs of glasses think if he should wear the all-shell sports model with full dress revolting solecism the people who read advertisements like that begin to feel uncomfortable they have only one pair of glasses they are afraid of being laughed at thought low class and ignorant and suburban and since there are few who would not rather be taken in adultery than in provincialism they rush out to buy four new pairs of spectacles and the manufacturer gets rich mr gumbrell now we must do something of the kind with our trousers imply somehow that they are correct that you're undressed without that your fiancée would break off the engagement if she saw you sitting down to dinner on anything but air mr boldera shrugged his shoulders vaguely waved his hand it may be rather difficult said gumbrell shaking his head it may mr boldera agreed but difficulties are made to be overcome we must pull the string of snobbery and shame it's essential we must find out methods for bringing the weight of public opinion to bear mockingly on those who do not wear our trousers it is difficult at the moment to see how it can be done but it will have to be done it will have to be done mr boldera repeated emphatically we might even find a way of invoking patriotism to our aid english trousers filled with english air for englishmen a little far-fetched perhaps but there might be something in it gumbel shook his head doubtfully well it's one of the things we've got to think about in any case said mr boldera we can't afford to neglect such powerful social emotions as these sex as we've seen is almost entirely out of the question we must run the rest therefore as hard as we can for instance there's the novelty business people feel superior if they possess something new which their neighbours haven't got the mere fact of newness is an intoxication we must encourage that sense of superiority brew up that intoxication the most absurd and futile objects can be sold because they're new not long ago i sold four million patent soap dishes of a new and peculiar kind the point was that you didn't screw the fixture into the bathroom wall you made a hole in the wall and built the soap dish into a niche like a holy water stoop my soap dishes possess no advantages over other kinds of soap dishes and they cost a fantastic amount to install but i managed to put them across simply because they were new four million of them mr boldero smiled with satisfaction at the recollection we shall do the same i hope with our trousers people may be shy of being the first to appear in them but the shyness will be compensated for by the sense of superiority and elation produced by the consciousness of the newness of the things quite so said gumbrell and then of course there's the economy slogan one pair of gumbrell's patent small clothes will outlast six pairs of ordinary trousers that's easy enough so easy that it's really uninteresting mr boldero waved it away we shall have to have pictures said gumbrell parenthetically he had an idea oh of course i believe i know of the very man to do them gumbrell went on his name's lippiot a painter you've probably heard of him heard of him exclaimed mr boldero he laughed but who hasn't heard of lydgate lippiot lipgate i mean of course 
i think he'd be the very man said gumbrell i'm certain he would said mr boldero not a whit behindhand gumbrell was pleased with himself he felt he had done some one a good turn poor old lippiot be glad of the money gumbrell remembered also his own fiver and remembering his own fiver he also remembered that mr boldero had as yet made no concrete suggestion about terms he nerved himself at last to suggest to mr boldero that it was time to think of this little matter ah how he hated talking about money he found it so hard to be firm in asserting his rights he was ashamed of showing himself grasping he always thought with consideration of the other person's point of view poor devil could he afford to pay and he was always swindled and always conscious of the fact lord how he hated life on these occasions mr boldero was still evasive i'll write you a letter about it he said at last gumbrell was delighted yes do he said enthusiastically do he knew how to cope with letters all right he was a devil with the fountain pen it was these personal hand-to-hand -hand combats that he couldn't manage he could have been he always felt such a ruthless critic and satirist such a violent unscrupulous polemical writer and if ever he committed his autobiography to paper how breathtakingly intimate how naked naked without so much as a healthy sunburnt to colour the whiteness how quiveringly a sensitive jelly it would be all the things he had never told any one would be in it confession at long range if anything it would be rather agreeable yes do write me a letter he repeated do mr boldero's letter came at last and the proposals it contained were derisory a hundred pounds down and five pounds a week when the business should be started five pounds a week and for that he was to act as a managing director writer of advertisements and promoter of foreign sales gumbel felt thankful that mr boldero had put the terms in a letter if they had been offered point-blank across the luncheon-table he would probably have accepted them without a murmur he wrote a few neat sharp phrases saying that he could not consider less than five hundred pounds down and a thousand a year mr boldero's reply was amiable would mr grumble come and see him see him well of course it was inevitable he would have to see him again some time but he would send the complete man to deal with the fellow a complete man matched with a leprechaun there could be no doubt as to the issue dear mr boldero he wrote back i should have come to talk over matters before this but i have been engaged during the last days in growing a beard and until this has come to maturity i cannot as you will easily be able to understand leave the house by the day after to-morrow however i hope to be completely presentable and shall come to see you at your office at about three o'clock if that is convenient to you i hope we shall be able to arrange matters satisfactorily believe me dear mr boldero yours very truly theodore gumbrell jr the day after to-morrow became in due course to-day splendidly bearded and rabelaisianly brought in his whipcord toga gumbrell presented himself at mr boldero's office in queen victoria street i should hardly have recognized you exclaimed mr boldero as he shook hands how it does alter you to be sure does it the complete man laughed with a significant joviality won't you take off your coat no thanks said gumbel i'll keep it on well said the leprechaun leaning back in his chair and twinkling bird-like across the table well repeated gumbel on a different tone from behind the stooks of his corn-like beard he smiled feeling serenely strong and safe i'm sorry we should have disagreed said mr boldero so am i the complete man replied but we shan't disagree for long he added with significance and as he spoke the words he brought down his fist with such a bang that the ink-pots on mr boldero's very solid mahogany writing-table trembled and the pens danced while mr boldero himself started with a genuine alarm he had not expected them and now he came to look at him more closely this young gumbrel was a great hulking dangerous-looking fellow he had thought he would be easy to manage how could he have made such a mistake gumbrel left the office with mr boldero's cheque for three hundred and fifty pounds in his pocket and an annual income of eight hundred his bruised right hand was extremely tender to the touch he was thankful that a single blow had been enough End of chapter ten Chapter 11 of Antique Hay. 
by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven cumberl had spent the afternoon at bluxham gardens his chin was still sore from the spirit gum with which he had attached to it the symbol of the complete man he was feeling also a little fatigued rosy had been delighted to see him st jerome had gone on solemnly communicating all the time his father had gone out to dine and gumbrell had eaten his rump steak and drunk his bottle of stout alone he was sitting now in front of the open french windows which led from his father's work-room on to the balcony with a block on his knee and a fountain pen in his hand composing advertisements for the patent small clothes outside in the plain trees of the square the birds had gone through their nightly performance but gumbrell had paid no attention to them he sat there smoking sometimes writing a word or two sunk in the quagmire of his own drowsy and comfortable body the flawless weather of the day had darkened into a blue may evening it was agreeable merely to be alive he sketched out two or three advertisements in the grand idealistic transatlantic style he imagined one in particular with a picture of nelson at the head of the page and england expects printed large beneath it england duty these are solemn words that was how it would begin these are solemn words and we use them solemnly as men who realize what duty is and who do all that in them lies to perform it as englishmen should the manufacturers is a sacred trust the guide and ruler of the modern world he has like the monarch of other days responsibilities towards his people he has a duty to fulfil he rules but he must also serve we realize our responsibilities we take them seriously gumbrell's patent small clothes have been brought into the world that they may serve our duty towards you is a duty of service our proud boast is that we perform it but besides his duty towards others every man has a duty towards himself what is that duty it is to keep himself in the highest possible state of physical and spiritual fitness gumbrell's patent small clothes protect the lumbar ganglia after that it would be plain medical and mystical sailing as soon as he got to the ganglia gumbrell stopped writing he put down the block sheathed his pen and abandoned himself to the pleasures of pure idleness he sat he smoked his cigar in the basement two floors down the cook and the house parlour-maid were reading one the daily mirror the other the daily sketch for them her majesty the queen spoke kindly words to crippled female orphans the jockeys tumbled at the jumps cupid was busy in society and the murderers who had disemboweled their mistresses were at large above him was the city of models was a bedroom a servant's bedroom an attic of tanks and ancient dirt the roof and after that two or three hundred light years away a star of the fourth magnitude on the other side of the party wall on his right a teeming family of jews led their dark compact jewish lives with a prodigious intensity at this moment they were all passionately quarrelling beyond the wall on the left lived the young journalist and his wife to-night it was he 
who had cooked the supper the young wife lay on the sofa feeling horribly sick she was going to have a baby there could be no doubt about it now they had meant not to have one it was horrible and outside the birds were sleeping in the trees the invading children from the slum tumbled and squealed ships meanwhile were walloping across the atlantic freighted with more cigars rosie at this moment was probably mending shearwater's socks gumbrel sat and smoked and the universe arranged itself in a pattern about him like iron filings round a magnet the door opened and the house parlour-maid intruded shearwater upon his lazy felicity abruptly in her unceremonious old way and hurried back to the daily sketch shearwater this is very agreeable said gumbrel come and sit down he pointed to a chair clumsily filling the space that two ordinary men would occupy shearwater came zigzagging and lurching across the room bumped against the work table and the sofa as he passed and finally sat down in the indicated chair it suddenly occurred to gumbrel that this was rosie's husband he had not thought of that before could it be in the marital capacity that he presented himself so unexpectedly now after this afternoon he had come home rosie had confessed all ah but then she didn't know who he was he smiled to himself at the thought what a joke perhaps shearwater had come to complain to him of the unknown complete man to him it was delightful anon the author of all those ballads in the oxford book of english verse the famous italian painter ignoto gumbrel was quite disappointed when his visitor began to talk of other themes than rosy sunk in the quagmire of his own comfortable guts he felt good humouredly obscene the dramatic scabrousness of the situation would have charmed him in his present mood good old shearwater but what an ox of a man if he gumbrel took the trouble to marry a wife he would at least take some interest in her shearwater had begun to talk in general terms about life what could he be getting at gumbrel wondered what particulars were ambushed behind these generalizations there were silences shearwater looked he thought very gloomy under his thick moustache the small pouting babyish mouth did not smile the candid eyes had a puzzled tired expression in them people are queer he said after one of his silences very queer one has no idea how queer they are cumbrell laughed but i have a very clear idea of their queerness he said every one's queer and the ordinary respectable bourgeois people are the queerest of the lot how do they manage to live like that it's astonishing when i think of all my aunts and uncles he shook his head perhaps it's because i'm rather incurious said shearwater one ought to be curious i think i've come to feel lately that i've not been curious enough about people the particulars began to peep alive and individual out of the vagueness like rabbits gumbrel saw them in his fancy at the fringe of a wood quite he said encouragingly quite i think too much of my work shearwater went on frowning too much physiology there's also psychology people's minds as well as their bodies one shouldn't be limited not too much at any rate people's minds he was silent for a moment i can imagine he went on at last as in the tone of one who puts a very hypothetical case i can imagine 
one's getting so much absorbed in somebody else's psychology that one could really think of nothing else the rabbits seemed ready to come out into the open that's a process said gumbel with middle-aged jocularity speaking out of his private warm morass that's commonly called falling in love there was another silence shearwater broke it to begin talking about mrs viviche he had lunched with her three or four days running he wanted gumbel to tell him what she was really like she seems to me a very extraordinary woman he said like everybody else said gumbel irritatingly it amused him to see the rabbits scampering about at last i've never known a woman like that before gumbel laughed you'd say that of any woman you happened to be interested in he said you've never known any women at all he knew much more about rosie already than shearwater did or probably ever would shearwater meditated he thought of mrs Viviche, her cool pale critical eyes her laughter faint and mocking her words that pierced into the mind goading it into thinking unprecedented thoughts she interests me he repeated i want you to tell me what she's really like he emphasized the word really as though there must in the nature of things be a vast difference between the apparent and the real mrs Viviche. most lovers gumbro reflected picture to themselves in their mistresses a secret reality beyond and different from what they see every day they are in love with somebody else their own invention and sometimes there is a secret reality and sometimes reality and appearance are the same the discovery in either case is likely to cause a shock i don't know he said how should i know you must find out for yourself but you knew her you know her well said shearwater almost with anxiety in his voice not so well as all that shearwater sighed profoundly like a wail in the night he felt restless incapable of concentrating his mind was full of a horrible confusion a violent eruptive bubbling up from below had shaken its calm clarity to pieces all this absurd business of passion he had always thought it nonsense unnecessary with a little strength of will one could shut it out women only for half an hour out of the twenty-four but she had laughed and his quiet his security had vanished i can imagine he had said to her yesterday i can imagine myself giving up everything work and all to go running round after you and do you suppose i should enjoy that mrs Viviche had asked it would be ridiculous he said it would be almost shameful and she had thanked him for the compliment and at the same time he went on i feel that it might be worth it it might be the only thing his mind was confused full of new thoughts it's difficult he said after a pause arranging things very difficult i thought i had arranged them so well i never arrange anything said gumbo very much the practical philosopher i take things as they come and as he spoke the words suddenly he became rather disgusted with himself he shook himself he climbed up out of his own morass it would be better perhaps if i arranged things more he added render therefore unto caesar the things which are caesar's said shearwater as though to himself and to god and to sex and to work there must be a working arrangement he sighed again everything in proportion in proportion he repeated as though the word were magical and had power in proportion who's talking about proportion they turned round in the doorway gumbel senior was standing 
smoothing his ruffled hair and tugging at his beard his eyes twinkled cheerfully behind his spectacles poaching on my architectural ground he said this is sheer water cumberl junior put in and explained who he was the old gentleman sat down proportion he said i was just thinking about it now as i was walking back you can't help thinking about it in these london streets where it doesn't exist you can't help pining for it there are some streets oh my god and gumbrell senior threw up his hands in horror it's like listening to a symphony of cats to walk along them senseless discords and a horrible disorder all the way and the one street that was really like a symphony by mozart how busily and gleefully they are pulling it down now another year and there'll be nothing left of regent street they'll only be a jumble of huge hideous buildings at three-quarters of a million apiece a concert of bobdignagian cats order has been turned into a disgusting chaos we need no barbarians from outside they are on the premises all the time the old man paused and pulled his beard meditatively gumbrell junior sat in silence smoking and in silence shearwater revolved within the walls of his great round head his agonizing thoughts of mrs Vavish. it has always struck me as very curious gumbrell senior went on that people are so little affected by the vile and discordant architecture around them suppose now that all these brass bands of unemployed ex-soldiers that blow so mournfully at all the street corners were suddenly to play nothing but a series of senseless and devilish discords why the first policeman would move them on and the second would put them under arrest and the passers-by would try to lynch them on their way to the police station there would be a real spontaneous outcry of indignation but when at these same street corners the contractors run up enormous palaces of steel and stone that are every bit as stupid and ignoble and inharmonious as ten brass bandsmen each playing a different tune in a different key there is no outcry the police don't arrest the architect the passing pedestrians don't throw stones at the workmen they don't notice that anything's wrong it's odd said gumbrell senior it's very odd very odd gumbrell junior echoed the fact is i suppose gumbrell senior went on smiling with a certain air of personal triumph the fact is that architecture is a more difficult and intellectual art than music music that's just a faculty you're born with as you might be born with a snub nose but the sense of plastic beauty though that's of course also an inborn faculty is something that has to be developed and intellectually ripened it's an affair of the mind experience and thought have to draw it out there are infant prodigies in music but there are no infant prodigies in architecture gumbrell senior chuckled with a real satisfaction a man can be an excellent musician and a perfect imbecile but a good architect must also be a man of sense a man who knows how to think and to profit by experience now as almost none of the people who pass along the streets in london or any other city of the world do know how to think or to profit by experience it follows that they cannot appreciate architecture the innate faculty is strong enough in them to make them dislike discordy music but they haven't the wits to develop that other innate faculty the sense of plastic beauty which would enable them to see and disapprove of the same barbarism in architecture come with me gumbrell senior added getting up from his chair and i'll show you something that will illustrate what i've been saying something you'll enjoy too nobody's seen it yet he said mysteriously as he led the way upstairs it's only just finished after months and years it'll cause a stir when they see it when i let them see it if ever i do that is the dirty devils gumbrell senior added good-humouredly on the landing of the next floor he paused felt in his pocket took out a key and unlocked the door of what should have been the second best bedroom 
Gumbrell Jr. wondered, without very much curiosity, what the new toy would turn out to be. Shearwater wondered only how he could possess Mrs. Lavish. Come on, called Gumbrell Sr. from inside the room. He turned on the light. They entered. It was a big room, but almost the whole of the floor was covered by an enormous model, twenty feet long by ten or twelve wide, of a complete city, traversed from end to end by a winding river, and dominated at its central point by a great dome. Gumbrell Jr. looked at it with surprise and pleasure. Even Shearwater was roused from his bitter ruminations of desire to look at the charming city spread out at his feet. It's exquisite, said Gumbrell Jr. What is it? The capital of Utopia, or what? Delighted, Gumbrell Sr. laughed. Don't you see something rather familiar in the dome? he asked well i had thought grumble jr hesitated afraid that he might be going to say something stupid he bent down to look more closely at the dome i had thought it looked rather like st paul's and now i see that it is st paul's quite right said his father and this is london i wish it were grumble jr laughed it's london as it might have been if they'd allowed wren to carry out his plans of rebuilding after the great fire and why didn't they allow him to shearwater asked chiefly said gumbrell senior because as i've said before they didn't know how to think or profit by experience wren offered them open spaces and broad streets he offered them sunlight and air and cleanliness he offered them beauty order and grandeur he offered to build for the imagination and the ambitious spirit of man so that even the most bestial vaguely and remotely as they walked those streets might feel that they were of the same race or very nearly as michelangelo that they too might feel themselves in spirit at least magnificent strong and free he offered them all these things he drew a plan for them walking in peril among the still smouldering ruins but they preferred to re-erect the old intricate squalor they preferred the medieval darkness and crookedness and beastly irregular quaintness they preferred holes and crannies and winding tunnels they preferred foul smells sunless stagnant air phthisis and rickets they preferred ugliness and pettiness and dirt they preferred the wretched human scale the scale of the sickly body not of the mind miserable fools but i suppose the old man continued shaking his head we can't blame them his hair had blown loose from its insecure anchorage with a gesture of resignation he brushed it back into place we can't blame them we should have done the same in the circumstances undoubtedly people offer us reason and beauty but we will have none of them because they don't happen to square with the notions that were grafted into our souls in youth that have grown there and become a part of us experientia docet nothing falser so far as most of us are concerned was ever said you no doubt my dear theodore have often in the past made a fool of yourself with women gumbrell jr made an embarrassed gesture that half denied half admitted the soft impeachment shearwater turned away painfully reminded of what for a moment he had half forgotten gumbrell senior swept on will that prevent you from making as great a fool of yourself again to-morrow it will not it will most assuredly not gumbrell senior shook his head the inconveniences and horrors of the pox are perfectly well known to every one but still the disease flourishes and spreads several million people were killed in a recent war and half the world ruined but we all busily go on in courses that make another event of the same sort inevitable experientia docet experientia doesn't and this is why we must not be too hard on these honest citizens of london who fully appreciating the inconveniences of darkness disorder and dirt manfully resisted any attempt to alter conditions which they had been taught from childhood onwards to consider as necessary right and belonging inevitably to the order of things we must not be too hard we are doing something even worse ourselves knowing by a century of experience how beautiful how graceful how soothing to the mind is an ordered piece of town planning 
we pull down almost the only specimen of it we possess and put up in its place a chaos of portland stone that is an offence against civilization but let us forget about these old citizens and the labyrinth of ugliness and inconvenience which we have inherited from them and which is called london let us forget the contemporaries who are making it still worse than it was come for a walk with me through this ideal city look and gumbrell senior began expounding it to them in the middle there of that great elliptical piazza at the eastern end of the new city stands four square the royal exchange pierced only with small dark windows and built of rough ashlars of the silvery portland stone the ground floor serves as a massy foundation for the huge pilasters that slide up between base and capital past three tiers of pedimented windows upon them rest the cornice the attic and the balustrade and on every pier of the balustrade a statue holds up its symbol against the sky four great portals rich with allegory admit to the courtyard with its double tier of coupled columns its cloister and its gallery the statue of charles the martyr rides triumphantly in the midst and within the windows one guesses the great rooms rich with heavy garlands of plaster panelled with carved wood ten streets give on to the piazza and at either end of its ellipse the water of sumptuous fountains ceaselessly blows aloft and falls commerce in that to the north of the exchange holds up her cornucopia and from the midst of its grapes and apples the master jet leaps up from the teats of all the ten useful arts grouped with their symbols about the central figure there spouts a score of fine subsidiary streams the dolphins the sea-horses and the tritons sport in the basin below to the south the ten principal cities of the kingdom stand in a family round the mother london who pours from her urn an inexhaustible tins ranged round the piazza are the goldsmith's hall the office of excise the mint the post office their flanks are curved to the curve of the ellipse between pilasters their windows look out on to the exchange and the sister statues on the balustrades beckon to one another across the intervening space two master roads of ninety feet from wall to wall run westwards from the exchange newgate ends the more northern vista with an arc of triumph whose three openings are deep shadowy and solemn as the entries of caverns the guild hall and the halls of the twelve city companies in their livery of rose-red brick with their lacings of white stone at the coins and round the windows lend to the street an air of domestic and comfortable splendour and every two or three hundred paces the line of the houses is broken and in the indentation of a square recess there rises conspicuous and insular the fantastic tower of a parish church spire out of dome octagon on octagon diminishing upwards cylinder on cylinder round lanterns lanterns of many sides towers with airy pinnacles clusters of pillars linked by incurving cornices and above them four more clusters and above once more square towers pierced with pointed windows spires uplifted on flying buttresses spires bulbous at the base the multitude of them beckons familiar and friendly on the sky from the other shore or sliding along the quiet river you see them all you tell over their names and the great dome swells up in the midst overtopping them all the dome of st paul's the other master street that goes westward from the piazza of the exchange slants down towards it the houses are of brick plain-faced and square arcaded at the base so that the shops stand back from the street and the pedestrian walks dry-shod under the harmonious succession of the vaultings and there at the end of the street at the base of a triangular space formed by the coming together of this with another master street that runs eastwards to tower hill there stands the cathedral to the north of it is the deanery and under the arcades are the booksellers shops from st paul's the main road slopes down under the swaggering italianate arches of ludgate past the wide line planted boulevards that run north and south within and without the city wall to the edge of the fleet ditch widened now into a noble canal 
on whose paved banks the barges unload their freights of country stuff leaps it on a single flying arch to climb again to a round circus a little to the east of temple bar from which in a pair of diagonally superimposed crosses eight roads radiate three northwards towards holborn three from the opposite arc towards the river one eastward to the city and one past lincoln's and fields to the west the piazza is all of brick and the houses that compose it are continuous above the ground floor level for the roads lead out under archways to one who stands in the centre at the foot of the obelisk that commemorates the victory over the dutch it seems a smooth well of brickwork pierced by eight arched conduits at the base and diversified above by the three tiers of plain unornamented windows who shall describe all the fountains in the open places all the statues and monuments in the circus north of london bridge where the four roads come together stands a pyramid of nymphs and tritons river goddesses of polyolbium sea gods of the island beaches bathing in a ceaseless tumble of white water and here the city griffin spouts from its beak the royal lion from between its jaws st george at the foot of the cathedral rides down a dragon whose nostrils spout not fire but the clear water of the new river in front of the india house four elephants of black marble endorsed with towers of white blow through their upturned trunks the copious symbol of eastern wealth in the gardens of the tower sits charles the second enthroned among a troop of muses cardinal virtues graces and hours the tower of the customs house is a pharos a great water-gate the symbol of naval triumph spans the fleet at its junction with the thames the river is embanked from blackfriars to the tower and at every twenty paces a gravestone angel looks out from the piers of the balustrade across the water gumbrell senior expounded his city with passion he pointed to the model on the ground he lifted his arms and turned up his eyes to suggest the size and splendour of his edifices his hair blew wispily loose and fell into his eyes and had to be brushed impatiently back again he pulled at his beard his spectacles flashed as though they were living eyes looking at him gumbrell junior could imagine that he saw before him the passionate and gesticulating silhouette of one of those old shepherds who stand at the base of peronese's ruins demonstrating obscurely the prodigious grandeur and the abjection of the human race End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of antique hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve you is it you she seemed doubtful gumbrell nodded it's me he reassured her i've shaved that's all he had left his beard in the top right-hand drawer of the chest of drawers among the ties and the collars emily looked at him judicially i like you better without it she decided at last you look nicer oh no i don't mean to say you weren't nice before she hastened to add but you know gentler she hesitated it's a silly word she said but there it is sweeter that was the unkindest cut of all milder and more melancholy he suggested well if you like to put it like that emily agreed he took her hand and raised it to his lips i forgive you he said he could forgive her anything for the sake of those candid eyes anything for the grave serious mouth anything for the short brown hair that curled oh but never seriously never gravely with such a hilarious extravagance round her head he had met her or rather the complete man flushed with his commercial triumphs as he returned from his victory over mr boldero had met her at the national gallery 
old masters young mistresses coleman had recommended the national gallery he was walking up the venetian room feeling as full of swaggering vitality as the largest composition of berenice when he heard gigglingly whispered just behind him his open sesame to new adventure beaver he spun round on his tracks and found himself face to face with two rather startled young women he frowned ferociously he demanded satisfaction for the impertinence they were both he noticed of gratifyingly pleasing appearance and both extremely young one of them the elder it seemed and the more charming as he had decided from the first of the two was dreadfully taken aback blushed to the eyes stammered apologetically but the other who had obviously pronounced the word only laughed it was she who made easy the forming of an acquaintance which ripened half an hour later over the teacups and to the strains of the most classy music on the fifth floor of lyons's strand corner house their names were emily and molly emily it seemed was married it was molly who let that out and the other had been angry with her for what was evidently an indiscretion the bald fact that emily was married had at once been veiled with mysteries surrounded and protected by silences whenever the complete man asked a question about it emily did not answer and molly only giggled but if emily was married and the elder of the two molly was decidedly the more knowledgeable about life mr macuptan would certainly have set her down as the more civilized emily didn't live in london she didn't seem to live anywhere in particular at the moment she was staying with molly's family at kew he had seen them the next day and the day after and the day after that once at lunch to desert them precipitately for his afternoon with rosie once at tea in kew gardens once at dinner with a theatre to follow and an extravagant taxi back to kew at midnight the tame decoy allays the fears of the shy wild birds molly who was tame who was frankly a flirting little wanton had served the complete man as a decoy for the ensnaring of emily when molly went away to stay with friends in the country emily was already inured and accustomed to the hunter's presence she accepted the playful attitude of gallantry which the complete man at the invitation of molly's rolling eyes and provocative giggle had adopted from the first as natural and belonging to the established order of things with giggling molly to give her a lead she had gone in three days much further along the path of intimacy than by herself she would have advanced in ten times the number of meetings it seems funny she had said the first time they met after molly's departure it seems funny to be seeing you without molly it seemed funnier with molly said the complete man it wasn't molly i wanted to see molly's a very nice dear girl she declared loyally besides she's amusing and can talk and i can't i'm not a bit amusing it wasn't difficult to retort to that sort of thing but emily didn't believe in compliments oh quite genuinely not he set out to make the exploration of her and now that she was inured to him no longer too frightened to let him approach now moreover that he had abandoned the jocular insolences of the complete man in favour of a more native mildness which he felt instinctively was more suitable in this particular case she laid no difficulties in his way she was lonely and he seemed to understand everything so well in the unknown country of her spirit and her history she was soon going eagerly before him as his guide 
she was an orphan her mother she had hardly remembered her father died of influenza when she was fifteen one of his business friends used to come and see her at school take her out for treats and give her chocolates she used to call him uncle stanley he was a leather merchant fat and jolly with a rather red face very white teeth and a bald head that was beautifully shiny when she was seventeen and a half he asked her to marry him and she had said yes but why gumbrel asked why on earth he repeated he said he'd take me round the world it was just when the war had come to an end round the world you know and i didn't like school i didn't know anything about it and he was very nice to me he was very pressing i didn't know what marriage meant didn't know she shook her head it was quite true but not in the least and she had been born within the twentieth century it seemed a case for the text-books of sexual psychology mrs emily x born in nineteen o one was found to be in a state of perfect innocence and ignorance at the time of the armistice eleventh november nineteen eighteen etc and so you married him she had nodded and then she had covered her face with her hands she had shuddered the amateur uncle now professionally a husband had come to claim his rights drunk she had fought him she had eluded him had run away and locked herself into another room on the second night of her honeymoon he gave her a bruise on the forehead and a bite on the left breast which had gone on septically festering for weeks on the fourth more determined than ever he seized her so violently by the throat that a blood vessel broke and she began coughing bright blood over the bedclothes the amateur uncle had been reduced to send for a doctor and emily had spent the next few weeks in a nursing home that was four years ago her husband had tried to induce her to come back but emily had refused she had a little money of her own she was able to refuse the amateur uncle had consoled himself with other and more docile nieces and has nobody tried to make love to you since then he asked oh lots of them have tried and not succeeded she shook her head i don't like men she said they're hateful most of them they are brutes ah kayo what she asked puzzled am i a brute too and behind his beard suddenly he felt rather a brute no said emily after a little hesitation you're different at least i think you are though sometimes she added candidly sometimes you do and say things which make me wonder if you really are different the complete man laughed don't laugh like that she said it's rather stupid you're perfectly right said gumbrel it is and now did she spend her time he continued the exploration well she read a lot of books for most of the novels she got from boots seemed to her rather silly too much about the same thing always love the complete man gave a shrug such is life well it oughtn't to be said emily and then when she was in the country and she was often in the country taking lodgings here and there in little villages weeks and months at a time she went for long walks molly couldn't understand why she liked the country but she did she was very fond of flowers she liked them more than people she thought i wish i could paint she said if i could i'd be happy for ever just painting flowers but i can't paint she shook her head i've tried so often such dirty ugly smudges come out on the paper and it's all so lovely in my head so lovely out in the fields gumbrel began talking with erudition about the flora of west surrey where you could find butterfly orchis and green man and the bee the wood where there was actually wild columbine growing the best localities for butcher's broom the outcrops of clay where you get wild daffodils all this odd knowledge came spouting up into his mind and from some underground source of memory flowers he never thought about flowers nowadays from one year's end to the other but his mother had liked flowers every spring and summer they used to go down to stay at their cottage in the country all their walks all their drives in the governess cart had been hunts after flowers and naturally the child had hunted with all his mother's ardour 
he had kept books of pressed flowers he had mummified them in hot sand he had drawn maps of the country and coloured them elaborately with different coloured inks to show where the different flowers grew how long ago all that was horribly long ago many seeds had fallen in the stony places of his spirit to spring luxuriantly up into stalky plants and wither again because they had no deepness of earth many had been sown there and had died since his mother scattered the seeds of the wild flowers and if you want sundew he wound up you'll find it in the punch bowl under hind head or round about frensham the little pond you know not the big but you know all about them emily exclaimed in delight i'm ashamed of my poor little knowledge and you must really love them as much as i do Gumbel did not deny it. they were linked henceforth by a chain of flowers but what else did she do oh of course she played the piano a great deal very badly but at any rate it gave her pleasure beethoven she liked beethoven best more or less she knew all the sonatas though she could never keep up anything like the right speed in the difficult parts Gumbrel had again shown himself wonderfully at home aha he said i bet you can't shake that low b in the last variation but one of opus one o six so that it doesn't sound ridiculous and of course she couldn't and of course she was glad that he knew all about it and how impossible it was in the cab as they drove back to kew that evening the complete man had decided it was time to do something decisive the parting kiss more of a playful sonorous bust than a serious embracement that was already in the protocol as signed and sealed before her departure by a giggling molly it was time the complete man considered that the salute should take on a character less formal and less playful one two three and decisively as they passed through hammersmith broadway he risked the gesture emily burst into tears he was not prepared for that though perhaps he should have been it was only by imploring only by almost weeping himself that gumbrel persuaded her to revoke her decision never never to see him again i thought you were different she sobbed and now now please please he entreated he was on the point of tearing off his beard and confessing everything there and then but that on second thoughts would probably only make things worse please i promise in the end she had consented to see him once again provisionally in kew gardens on the following day they were to meet at the little temple that stands on the hillock above the valley of the heathers and now duly they had met the complete man had been left at home in the top right-hand drawer along with the ties and collars she would prefer he guessed the mild and melancholy one he was quite right she had thought him sweeter at a first glimpse i forgive you he said and kissed her hand i forgive you hand in hand they walked down towards the valley of the heaths i don't know why you should be forgiving me she said laughing it seems to me that i ought to be doing the forgiving after yesterday she shook her head at him you made me so wretched ah but you've already done your forgiving you seem to take it very much for granted said emily don't be too sure but i am sure said gumbel i can see emily laughed again i feel happy she declared so do i how green the grass is green green after these long damp months it glowed in the sunlight as though it were lighted from inside and the trees the pale high clot pole trees of the english spring the dark symmetrical pine trees islanded here and there on the lawns each with its own separate profile against the sky and its own shadow impenetrably dark or freckled with moving lights on the grass at its feet they walked on in silence gumbel took off his hat breathed the soft air that smelt of the greenness of the garden there are quiet places also in the mind he said meditatively but we built bandstands and factories on them deliberately to put a stop to the quietness we don't like the quietness all the thoughts all the preoccupations in my head round and round continually he made a circular motion with his hand and the jazz bands the music hall songs the boys shouting the news what's it for what's it all for to put an end to the quiet to break it up and disperse it to pretend at any cost it isn't there ah but it is it is there in spite of everything at the back of everything lying awake at night sometimes not restlessly but serenely waiting for sleep the quiet re-establishes itself piece by piece all the broken bits all the fragments of it we've been so busily dispersing all day long 
it re-establishes itself an inward quiet like this outward quiet of grass and trees it fills one it grows a crystal quiet a growing expanding crystal it grows it becomes more perfect it is beautiful and terrifying yes terrifying as well as beautiful for one's alone in the crystal and there's no support from outside there's nothing external and important nothing external and trivial to pull oneself up by or to stand on superiorly contemptuously so that one can look down there's nothing to laugh at or feel enthusiastic about but the quiet grows and grows beautifully and unbearably and at last you are conscious of something approaching it is almost a faint sound of footsteps something inexpressibly lovely and wonderful advances through the crystal nearer nearer and oh inexpressibly terrifying for if it were to touch you if it were to seize and engulf you you'd die all the regular habitual daily part of you would die there would be an end of bandstands and whizzing factories and one would have to begin living arduously in the quiet arduously in some strange unheard-of manner nearer and nearer come the steps when one can't face the advancing thing one daren't it's too terrifying it's too painful to die quickly before it is too late start the factory wheels bang the drum blow up the saxophone think of the women you'd like to sleep with the schemes for making money the gossip about your friends the last outrage of the politicians anything for a diversion break the silence smash the crystal to pieces there it lies in bits it is easily broken hard to build up and easy to break and the steps now those have taken themselves off double quick double quick they were gone at the first flowing of the crystal and by this time the lovely and terrifying thing is three infinities away at least and you lie tranquilly on your bed thinking of what you'd do if you had ten thousand pounds and of all the fornications you'll never commit he thought of rosie's pink underclothes you make things very complicated she said after a silence cumbrell spread out his great coat on a green bank and they sat down leaning back his hands under his head he watched her sitting there beside him she had taken off her hat there was a stir of wind in those childish curls and at the nape at the temples where the hair had sleeved out thin and fine the sunlight made little misty halos of gold her hands clasped round her knees she sat quite still looking out across the green expanses at the trees at the white clouds on the horizon there was quiet in her mind he thought she was native to that crystal world for her the steps came comfortingly through the silence and the lovely thing brought with it no terrors it was all so easy for her and simple ah so simple so simple like the higher purchase system on which rosie had bought her pink bed and how simple it was too to puddle clear waters and unpeddle every flower every wild flower by god one ever passed in a governess cart at the heels of a barrel-bellied pony how simple to spit on the floors of churches si pregnant di non sputare simple to kick one's legs and enjoy oneself dutifully in pink underclothing perfectly simple it's like the arietta don't you think said emily suddenly the arietta of opus one eleven and she hummed the first bars of the air don't you feel it's like that what's like that everything said emily to-day i mean you and me these gardens and she went on humming cumbrell shook his head too simple for me he said emily laughed ah but then think how impossible it gets a little farther on she agitated her fingers wildly as though she were trying to play the impossible passages it begins easily for the sake of poor imbeciles like me but it goes on it goes on more and more fully and subtly and abstrusely and embracingly but it's still the same movement the shadows stretched farther and farther across the lawns and as the sun declined the level light picked out among the grasses innumerable stipplings of shadow and in the paths that had seemed under the more perpendicular rays as level as a table a thousand little shadowy depressions and sun-touched mountains were now apparent cumbrell looked at his watch good lord he said we must fly he jumped up quick quick but why we shall be late he wouldn't tell her for what wait and see was all that emily could get out of him by her questioning they heard out of the gardens and in spite of her protests he insisted on taking a taxi into town i've such a lot of unearned increment to get rid of he explained the patent small clothes seemed at the moment remoter than the farthest stars End of chapter twelve
Chapter Thirteen of Antique Hay by Aldous Huxley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen. In spite of the taxi, in spite of the gobbled dinner, they were late. The concert had begun. Never mind," said Gumbel. "We shall get in in time for the menuetto. It's then that the fun really begins." sour grapes said emily putting her ear to the door it sounds to me simply too lovely they stood outside like beggars waiting abjectly at the doors of a banqueting hall stood and listened to the snatches of music that came out tantalizingly from within a rattle of clapping announced at last that the first movement was over the doors were thrown open hungrily they rushed in the sclopus quartet and a subsidiary viola were bowing from the platform there was a chirrup of tuning then preliminary silence sclopus nodded and moved his bow the minuetto of mozart's g minor quintet broke out phrase after phrase short and decisive with every now and then a violent sforzando chord startling in its harsh and sudden emphasis minuetto all civilization mr murkaptan would have said was implied in the delicious word the delicate pretty thing ladies and precious gentlemen fresh from the wit and gallantry of quillet haunted sofa stepping gracefully to a pattern of airy notes to this passion of one who cries out to this obscure and angry argument with fate how would they grumble wondered how would they have tripped it how pure the passion how unaffected clear and without plot or pretension the unhappiness of that slow movement which followed blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god pure and unsullied pure and unmixed unadulterated not passionate thank god only sensual and sentimental in the name of earwig amen pure pure worshippers have tried to rape the statues of the gods the statuaries who made the images were generally to blame and how delicious they too an artist can suffer and in the face of the whole albert hall with what an effective gesture and grimace but blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god the instruments come together and part again long silver threads hang aerially over a murmur of waters in the midst of muffled sobbing a cry the fountains blow their architecture of slender pillars and from basin to basin the waters fall from basin to basin and every fall makes somehow possible a higher leaping of the jet and at the last fall the mounting column springs up into the sunlight and from water the music has modulated up into a rainbow blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god they shall make god visible to to other eyes blood beats in the ears beat 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 a slow drum in the darkness beating in the ears of one who lies wakeful with fever with the sickness of too much misery it beats unceasingly in the ears in the mind itself body and mind are indivisible and in the spirit blood painfully throbs sad thoughts droop through the mind a small pure light comes swaying down through the darkness comes to rest resigning itself to the obscurity of its misfortune there is resignation but blood still beats in the ears blood still painfully beats though the mind has acquiesced and then suddenly the mind exerts itself throws off the fever of too much suffering and laughing commands the body to dance the introduction to the last movement comes to its suspended throbbing close there is an instant of expectation and then with a series of mounting trochees and a downward hurrying step after tiny step in triple time the dance begins irrelevant irreverent out of key with all that has gone before the man's greatest strength lies in his capacity for irrelevance in the midst of pestilences wars and famines he builds cathedrals and a slave he can think the irrelevant and unsuitable thoughts of a free man the spirit is slave to fear and beating blood at the mercy of an obscure and tyrannous misfortune but irrelevantly it elects to dance in triple measure a mounting skip a patter of descending feet the g minor quintet is at an end the applause rattles out loudly enthusiasts stand up and cry bravo and the five men on the platform rise and bow their acknowledgments 
great sclopus himself receives his share of the plaudits with a weary condescension weary are his poached eyes weary his disillusioned smile it is only his due he knows but he has had so much clapping so many lovely women he has a roman nose a colossal brow and though the tawny musical mane does much to conceal the fact no back to his head Corofalo, the second fiddle is black beady-eyed and pot-bellied the convex reflections of the electroliers slide back and forth over his polished bald head as he bends again again in little military salutes pepper keck two metres high bows with a sinuous politeness his face his hair are all of the same greyish buff colour he does not smile his appearance is monolithic and grim not so exuberant meddler who sweats and smiles and embraces his jello send lays his hand to his heart and bows almost to the ground as though all this hullabaloo were directed only at him as for poor little mr jenkins the subsidiary viola he has slid away into the background and feeling that this is really the sclopus's show and that he a mere intruder has no right to any of these demonstrations he hardly bows at all but only smiles vaguely and nervously and from time to time makes a little spasmodic twitch to show that he isn't really ungrateful or haughty as you might think but that he feels in the circumstances the position is a little embarrassing it is hard to explain strange said gumbel to think that those ridiculous creatures could have produced what we've just been hearing the poached eye of sclopus lighted on emily flushed and ardently applauding he gave her all to herself a weary smile he would have a letter he guessed to-morrow morning signed your little admirer in the third row she looked a choice little piece he smiled again to encourage her emily alas had not even noticed she was applauding the music did you enjoy it he asked as they stepped out into a deserted bond street did i emily laughed expressively no i didn't enjoy she said enjoy isn't the word you enjoy eating ices it may be happy it's unhappy music but it made me happy gumbrell hailed a cab and gave the address of his rooms in great russell street happy he repeated as they sat there side by side in the darkness he too was happy where are we going she asked to my rooms said gumbrell we shall be quiet there he was afraid she might object to going there after yesterday but she made no comment some people think that it's only possible to be happy if one makes a noise she said after a pause i find it's too delicate and melancholy for noise being happy is rather melancholy like the most beautiful landscape like those trees and the grass and the clouds and the sunshine to-day from the outside said gumbel it even looks rather dull they stumbled up the dark staircase to his rooms gumbel lit a pair of candles and put the kettle on the gas ring they sat together on the divan sipping tea in the rich soft light of the candles she looked different more beautiful the silk of her dress seemed wonderfully rich and glossy like the petals of a tulip and on her face on her bare arms and neck the light seemed to spread an impalpable bright bloom on the wall behind them their shadows ran up towards the ceiling enormous and profoundly black how unreal it is gumbrell whispered not true this remote secret room these lights and shadows out of another time and you out of nowhere and i out of a past utterly remote from yours sitting together here together and being happy that's the strangest thing of all being quite senselessly happy it's unreal unreal but why said emily why it's here and happening now it is real it all might vanish at any moment he said emily smiled rather sadly it'll vanish in due time she said quite naturally not by magic it'll vanish the way everything else vanishes and changes but it's here now they gave themselves up to the enchantment the candles burned two shining eyes of flame without a wink minute after minute but for them there were no longer any minutes emily leaned against him her body held in the crook of his arm her head resting on his shoulder he caressed his cheek against her hair sometimes very gently he kissed her forehead or her closed eyes if i'd known you years ago she sighed but i was a silly little idiot then i shouldn't have noticed any difference between you and anybody else 
emily spoke again after another timeless silence there must never be anybody else never the shadow of anybody else there never will be anybody else said gumbel emily smiled and opened her eyes looked up at him ah not here she said not in this real unreal room not during this eternity but there will be other rooms just as real as this not so real not so real he bent his face towards hers she closed her eyes again and the lids fluttered with a sudden tremulous movement at the touch of his light kiss for them there were no more minutes but time passed time passed flowing in a dark stream stanchlessly as though from some profoundly mysterious wound in the world's side bleeding bleeding for ever one of the candles had burned down to the socket and the long smoky flame wavered unsteadily the flickering light troubled their eyes the shadows twitched and stirred uneasily emily looked up at him what's the time she said gumbel looked at his watch it was nearly one o'clock too late for you to get back he said too late emily sat up ah the enchantment was breaking was giving way like a film of ice beneath a weight like a web before a thrust of the wind they looked at one another what shall i do she asked you could sleep here gumbel answered in a voice that came from a long way away she sat for a long time in silence looking through half-closed eyes at the expiring candle flame gumbel watched her in an agony of suspense was the ice to be broken the web work finally and forever torn the enchantment could still be prolonged the eternity renewed he felt his heart beating in his breast he held his breath it would be terrible if she were to go now it would be a kind of death the flame of the candle flickered more violently leaping up in a thin long smoky flare sinking again almost to darkness emily got up and blew out the candle the other still burned calmly and steadily may i stay she asked will you allow me he understood the meaning of her question and nodded of course he said of course is it as much of course as all that when i say so he smiled at her the eternity had been renewed the enchantment prolonged there was no need to think of anything now but the moment the past was forgotten the future abolished there was only this secret room and the candlelight and the unreal impossible happiness of being two now that this peril of a disenchantment had been averted it would last for ever he got up from the couch crossed the room he took her hands and kissed them shall we sleep now she asked gumbrell nodded do you mind if i blow out the light and without waiting for his answer emily turned gave a puff and the room was in darkness he heard the rustling of her undressing hastily he stripped off his own clothes pulled back the coverlet from the divan the bed was made and ready he opened it and slipped between the sheets a dim greenish light from the gas lamp in the street below came up between the parted curtains illuminating faintly the farther end of the room against this tempered darkness he could see her silhouetted standing quite still as if hesitating on some invisible brink emily he whispered i'm coming emily answered she stood there unmoving a few seconds longer then overstepped the brink she came silently across the room and sat down on the edge of the low couch gumbel lay perfectly still without speaking waiting in the enchanted timeless darkness emily lifted her knees slid her feet in under the sheet and stretched herself out beside him her body in the narrow bed touching his gumbel felt that she was trembling trembling a sharp involuntary start a little shudder another start you're cold he said and slipping one arm beneath her shoulders he drew her limp and unresisting towards him she lay there pressed against him gradually the trembling ceased quite still quite still in the calm of the enchantment the past is forgotten the future abolished there is only this dark and everlasting moment a drugged and intoxicated stupor of happiness possessed his spirit a numbness warm and delicious lay upon him and yet through the stupor he knew with a dreadful anxious certainty that the end would soon be there like a man on the night before his execution he looked forward through the endless present he foresaw the end of his eternity and after everything was uncertain and unsafe very gently he began caressing her shoulder her long slender arm drawing his finger-tips lightly and slowly over her smooth skin slowly from her neck over her shoulder lingeringly round the elbow to her hand again again he was learning her arm the form of it was part of the knowledge now of his finger-tips his fingers knew it as they knew a piece of music as they knew mozart's twelfth sonata for example and the themes that crowd so quickly one after another at the beginning of the first movement played themselves serially 
glitteringly in his mind they became a part of the enchantment through the silk of her shift he learned her curving side her smooth straight back in the ridge of her spine he stretched down touched her feet her knees under the smock he learned her warm body lightly slowly caressing he knew her his fingers he felt could build her up a warm and curving statue in the darkness he did not desire her to desire would have been to break the enchantment he let himself sink deeper and deeper into his dark stupor of happiness she was asleep in his arms and soon he too was asleep End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of antic hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen mrs Vavish descended the steps into king street and standing there on the pavement looked dubiously first to the right and then to the left little and loud the taxis rolled by on their white wheels the long-snouted limousines passed with a sigh the air smelt of watered dust tempered in mrs vavish's immediate neighbourhood by those memories of italian jasmines which were her perfume on the opposite pavement in the shade two young men looking very conscious of their grey top-hats marched gravely along life mrs vavish thought looked a little dim this morning in spite of the fine weather she glanced at her watch it was one o'clock soon one would have to eat some lunch but where and with whom mrs vavish had no engagements all the world was before her she was absolutely free all day long yesterday when she declined all those pressing invitations the prospect had seemed delightful liberty no complications no contacts a pre-adamite empty world to do what she liked in but to-day when it came to the point she hated her liberty to come out like this at one o'clock into a vacuum it was absurd it was appalling the prospect of immeasurable boredom opened before her steps after steps of ennui horizon beyond horizon forever the same she looked again to the right and again to the left finally she decided to go to the left slowly walking along her private knife edge between her personal abysses she walked towards the left she remembered suddenly one shining day like this in the summer of nineteen seventeen when she had walked along this same street slowly like this on the sunny side with tony lamb all that day that night it had been one long good-bye he was going back the next morning less than a week later he was dead never again never again there had been a time when she could make herself cry simply by saying those two words once or twice under her breath never again never again she repeated them softly now but she felt no tears behind her eyes grief doesn't kill love doesn't kill but time kills everything kills desire kills sorrow kills in the end the mind that feels them wrinkles and softens the body while it still lives rots it like a meddler kills it too at last never again never again instead of crying she laughed laughed aloud the pigeon-breasted old gentleman who had just passed her twirling between his finger and thumb the ends of a white military moustache turned round startled could she be laughing at him never again murmured mrs Vavish. i beg your pardon 
queried the martial gentleman in a rich port winey cigarry voice mrs vavish looked at him with such wide-eyed astonishment that the old gentleman was quite taken aback a thousand apologies dear lady thought you were addressing hum hum he replaced his hat squared his shoulders and went off smartly left right bearing preciously before him his pigeon breast poor thing he thought poor young thing talking to herself must be cracked must be off her head or perhaps she took drugs that was more likely that was much more likely most of them did nowadays vicious young women lesbians drug fiends nymphomaniacs dipsos thoroughly vicious nowadays thoroughly vicious he arrived at his club in an excellent temper never again never never again mrs vavish would have liked to be able to cry st james's square opened before her romantically under its trees the statue pranced the trees gave her an idea she might go down into the country for the afternoon take a cab and drive out out goodness only knew where to the top of a hill somewhere box hill leith hill holmberry hill ivinghoe beacon any hill where one could sit and look out over plains one might do worse than that with one's liberty but not much worse she reflected mrs vavish had turned up towards the northern side of the square and was almost at its northwestern corner when with a thrill of genuine delight with a sense of the most profound relief she saw a familiar figure running down the steps of the london library theodore she hallooed faintly but penetratingly from her inward deathbed gumbrel she waved her parasol gumbrel halted looked round came smiling to meet her how delightful he said but how unfortunate why unfortunate asked mrs vavish am i of evil omen unfortunate gumbrel explained because i've got to catch a train and can't profit by this meeting ah no theodore said mrs vavish you're not going to catch a train you're going to come and lunch with me providence has decreed it you can't say no to providence i must gumbrel shook his head i've said yes to somebody else to whom ah said gumbrel with a coy and saucy mysteriousness and where are you going in your famous train ah again gumbrel answered how intolerably tiresome and silly you are mrs vavish declared one would think you were a sixteen-year-old schoolboy going out for his first assignation with a shop girl at your age gumbrel she shook her head smiled agonizingly and with contempt who is she what sordid pick-up not sordid in the least protested gumbrel but decidedly a pick-up eh a banana skin was lying like a bedraggled starfish in the gutter just in front of where they were standing mrs vavish stepped forward and with the point of her parasol lifted it carefully up and offered it to her companion merci gumbrel bowed she tossed the skin back again into the gutter in any case she said the young lady can wait while we have luncheon gumbrel shook his head i've made the arrangement he said emily's letter was in his pocket she had taken the loveliest cottage just out of robert's bridge in sussex ah but the loveliest imaginable for the whole summer he could come and see her there he had telegraphed that he would come to-day this afternoon by the two o'clock from charing cross mrs vavish took him by the elbow come along she said there's a post office in that passage going from german street to piccadilly you can wire from there your infinite regrets these things always improve with a little keeping there will be raptures when you do go to-morrow gumbrel allowed himself to be led along what an insufferable woman you are he said laughing instead of being grateful to me for asking you to luncheon oh i am grateful said gumbrel and astonished he looked at her mrs vavish smiled and fixed him for a moment with her pale and troubled eyes 
she said nothing still gumbrell went on i must be at charing cross by two you know but we're lunching at Verrie's. gumbrell shook his head they were at the corner of german street mrs Vavish halted and delivered her ultimatum the more impressive for being spoken in that expiring voice of one who says in articulo the final and supremely important things we lunch at various theodore or i shall never never speak to you again but be reasonable myra he implored if only he told her that he had a business appointment imbecile to have dropped those stupid hints in that tone i prefer not to be said mrs Levish. gumbrell made a gesture of despair and was silent he thought of emily and her native quiet among the flowers in a cottage altogether too cottagey with honeysuckles and red ramblers and hollyhocks though on second thoughts none of them would be blooming yet would they happily in white muslin extracting from the cottage piano the easier sections of the arietta a little absurd perhaps when you considered her like that but exquisite but adorable but pure of heart and flawless in her bright pellucid integrity complete as a crystal in its faceted perfection she would be waiting for him expecting him and they would walk through the twiddly lanes or perhaps there would be a governess cart for hire with a fat pony like a tub on legs to pull it they would look for flowers in the woods and perhaps he would still remember what sort of noise a white throat makes or even if he didn't remember he could always magisterially say he did that's a white throat emily do you hear the one that goes tweedly weedly weed leedy dee i'm waiting said mrs Vavish, patiently however grumble looked at her and found her smiling like a tragic mask after all he reflected emily would still be there if he went down to-morrow it would be stupid to quarrel with myra about something that was really when he came to think of it not of enormous importance it was stupid to quarrel with any one about anything and with myra and about this particularly so in this white dress patterned with flowing arabesques of black she looked he thought more than ever enchanting there had been times in the past the past leads on to the present no but in any case she was excellent company well he said sighing decisively let's go and send my wire mrs de Viche made no comment and traversing german street they walked up the narrow passage under the lee of wren's ball barn of st james's to the post-office i shall pretext a catastrophe said gumbrell as they entered and going to the telegraph desk he wrote slight accident on way to station not serious at all but a little indisposed come same train to-morrow he addressed the form and handed it in a little what asked the young lady behind the bars as she read it through prodding each successive word with the tip of her blunt pencil a little indisposed said gumbrell and he felt suddenly very much ashamed of himself a little indisposed no really that was too much he'd withdraw the telegram he'd go after all ready asked mrs Vavish, coming up from the other end of the counter where she had been buying stamps gumbrell pushed a florin under the bars a little indisposed he said hooting with laughter and he walked towards the door leaning heavily on his stick and limping slight accident he explained what is the meaning of this clownery mrs Vavish inquired what indeed gumbrell had limped up to the door and stood there holding it open for her he was taking no responsibility for himself it was the clown's doing and the clown poor creature was non compo not entirely there and couldn't be called to account for his actions he limped after her towards piccadilly guida cato quara bile in cinque giorni mrs Vavish laughed how charming that always is in the italian papers the fickle lady the jealous lover the stab the colpo di rivoltella the mere anglo-saxon black eye all judged by the house surgeon at the misericordia curable in five days and you my poor gumbrell are you curable in five days that depends said gumbrell there may be complications mrs Vavish waved her parasol a taxi came swerving to the pavement's edge in front of them meanwhile she said you can't be expected to walk at various they lunched off lobsters and white wine fish suppers gumbrell quoted jovially from the restoration fish suppers will make a man hop like a flea through the whole meal he clowned away in the most inimitable style the ghost of a governess cart rolled along the twiddly lanes of robert's bridge 
but one can refuse to accept responsibility a clown cannot be held accountable and besides when the future and the past are abolished when it is only the present instant whether enchanted or unenchanted that counts when there are no causes or motives no future consequences to be considered how can there be responsibility even for those who are not clowns he drank a great deal of hock and when the clock struck two and the train had begun to snort out of charing cross he could not refrain from proposing the health of viscount lascelles after that he began telling mrs vaviche about his adventure as a complete man you should have seen me he said describing his beard i should have been bowled over you shall see me then said gumbrell ah what a don giovanni la si darum la mano la mi dire di si vieni non latano partiam vi ben mio da qui and they came they came without hesitation no vorrie e non vorrie no mi trema un poco il cor straight away felice io so sorry mrs vaviche sang very faintly under her breath from a remote bed of agony ah happiness happiness a little dull someone had wisely said when you looked at it from outside an affair of duets at the cottage piano of collecting specimens hand in hand for the hortus siccus a matter of integrity and quietness ah but the history of the young woman who was married four years ago exclaimed gumbrell with clownish rapture and remains to this day a virgin what an episode in my memoirs in the enchanted darkness he had learned her young body he looked at his fingers her beauty was a part of their knowledge on the tablecloth he drummed out the first bars of the twelfth sonata of mozart and even after singing her duet with the don he continued she is still virgin there are chaste pleasures sublimated sensualities more thrillingly voluptuous with the gesture of a restaurant-keeper who praises the specialty of the house he blew a treacly kiss than any of the grosser deliriums what is all this about asked mrs vaviche grumble finished off his glass i am talking esoterically he said for my own pleasure not yours but tell me more about the beard mrs vaviche insisted i like the beard so much all right said gumbrell let us try to be unworthy with coherence they sat for a long time over their cigarettes it was half-past three before mrs vaviche suggested they should go almost time she said looking at her watch to have tea one damn meal after another and never anything new to eat and every year one gets bored with another of the old things lobster for instance how i used to adore lobster once but to-day well really it was only your conversation theodore that made it tolerable gumbel put his hand to his heart and bowed he felt suddenly extremely depressed and wine i used to think orvieto so heavenly but this spring when i went to italy it was just a bad muddy sort of vouvre and those soft caramels they call fiats i used to eat those till i was sick i was at the sixth stage before i had finished one of them this time in rome mrs vavie shook her head disillusion after disillusion they walked down the dark passage into the street we'll go home said mrs vavie i really haven't the spirit to do anything else this afternoon to the commissionaire who opened the door of the cab she gave the address of her house in st james's will one never recapture the old thrills she asked rather fatiguedly as they drove slowly through the traffic of regent street not by chasing after them said gumbrell in whom the clown had quite evaporated if one sat still enough they might perhaps come back of their own accord there would be the faint sound as it were of feet approaching through the quiet it isn't only food said mrs Vavish, who had closed her eyes and was leaning back in her corner so i can well believe it's everything nothing's the same now i feel it never will be never more croaked gumbrell never again mrs Vavish echoed never again there were still no tears behind her eyes did you ever know tony lamb she asked no gumbrell answered from his corner what about him mrs Vavish did not answer what indeed about him she thought of his very clear blue eyes and the fair bright hair that had been lighter than his brown face brown face and neck red-brown hands and all the rest of his skin was as white as milk i was very fond of him she said at last that's all he was killed in nineteen seventeen just about this time of the year it seems a very long time ago don't you think does it gumbrell shrugged his shoulders i don't know the past is abolished vive mea lesbia if i weren't so horribly depressed i'd embrace you that would be some slight compensation for my 
he tapped his foot with the end of his walking-stick my accident you're depressed too one should never drink at luncheon said gumbel it wrecks the afternoon one should also never think of the past and never for one moment consider the future these are treasures of ancient wisdom but perhaps after a little tea he leaned forward to look at the figures on the taximeter for the cab had come to a standstill after a nip of the tannin stimulant he threw open the door we may feel rather better mrs vavish smiled excruciatingly for me she said as she stepped out on to the pavement even tannin has lost its virtues now mrs vavish's drawing-room was tastefully in the movement the furniture was upholstered in fabrics designed by dufy racehorses and roses little tennis players clustering in the midst of enormous flowers printed in grey and ochre on a white ground there were a couple of lamp shades by bala on the pale rose stippled walls hung three portraits of herself by three different and entirely incongruous painters a selection of the usual oranges and lemons and a rather forbidding contemporary nude painted in two tones of green and how bored i am with this room and all these beastly pictures exclaimed mrs Vavish. as she entered she took off her hat and standing in front of the mirror above the mantelpiece smoothed her coppery hair you should take a cottage in the country said gumbrell buy a pony and a governess cart and drive along the twiddly lanes looking for flowers after tea you opened the cottage piano and suiting his action to the words gumbrell sat down at the long-tailed bluthner and you play you play very slowly and with parodied expressiveness he played the opening theme of the arietta you wouldn't be bored then he said turning round to her when he had finished ah wouldn't i said mrs Vavish. and with whom do you propose that i should share my cottage any one you like said gumbrell his fingers hung as though meditating over the keys but i don't like any one cried mrs Vavish, with a terrible vehemence from her deathbed ah now it had been said the truth it sounded like a joke tony had been dead five years now those bright blue eyes ah never again all rotted away to nothing then you should try said gumbrell whose hands had begun to creep softly forward into the twelfth sonata you should try but i do try said mrs Vavish, her elbows propped on the mantelpiece her chin resting on her clasped hands she was looking fixedly at her own image in the glass pale eyes looked unwaveringly into pale eyes the red mouth and its reflection exchanged their smiles of pain she had tried it revolted her now to think how often she had tried she had tried to like some one any one as much as tony she had tried to recapture to re-evoke to revivify and there had never been anything really but a disgust i haven't succeeded she added after a pause the music had shifted from f major to d minor it mounted in leaping anapes to a suspended chord ran down again mounted once more modulating to c minor then through a passage of trembling notes to a flat major to the dominant of d flat to the dominant of c to c minor and at last to a new clear theme in the major then i'm sorry for you said gumbrell allowing his fingers to play on by themselves he felt sorry too for the subjects of mrs Vavish's desperate experiments she mightn't have succeeded in liking them for their part poor devils they in general only too agonizingly liked her only too he remembered the cold damp spots on his pillow in the darkness those hopeless angry tears you nearly killed me once he said only time kills said mrs Vavish, still looking into her own pale eyes i've never made any one happy she added after a pause never any one she thought except tony and tony they had killed shot him through the head even the bright eyes had rotted like any other carrion she too had been happy then never again a maid came in with the tea things ah the tannin exclaimed gumbrell with enthusiasm and broke off his playing the one hope of salvation he poured out two cups and picking up one of them he came over to the fireplace and stood behind her sipping slowly at the pale brewage and looking over her shoulder at their two reflections in the mirror la si darum he hummed if only i had my beard he stroked his chin and with the tip of his forefinger brushed up the drooping ends of his moustache you'd come trembling like zerlina in under its golden shadow mrs Vavige smiled i don't ask for anything better she said what more delightful part felice io so sorry bati bati o bel mazzetto enviable zerlina the servant made another silent entry a gentleman she said called mr shearwater would like tell him i'm not at home said mrs Vavish, without looking round 
there was a silence with raised eyebrows gumbrell looked over mrs levisha's shoulder at her reflection her eyes were calm and without expression she did not smile or frown gumbrell still questioningly looked in the end he began to laugh End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of antique hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen they were playing that latest novelty from across the water what's he to hecuba sweet sweet and piercing the saxophone pierced into the very bowels of compassion and tenderness pierced like a revelation from heaven pierced like the angel's treacly dart into the holy theresa's quivering and ecstasiated flank more ripely and roundly with a kindly and less agonizing voluptuousness the cello meditated those mohammedan ecstasies that last under the green palms of paradise six hundred in her arable ears apiece into this charged atmosphere the violin admitted refreshing draughts of fresh air cool and thin like the breath from a still damp squirt and the piano hammered and rattled away unmindful of the sensibilities of the other instruments banged away all the time reminding every one concerned in a thoroughly business-like way that this was a cabaret where people came to dance the fox-trot not a baroque church for female saints to go into ecstasies in not a mild happy valley of tumbling hurry at each recurrence of the refrain the four negroes of the orchestra or at least the three of them who played with their hands alone for the saxophonist always blew at this point with a redoubled sweetness enriching the passage with a warbling contrapuntal soliloquy that fairly wrung the entrails and transported the pierced heart broke into melancholy and drawling song what's he to hecuba nothing at all that's why there'll be no wedding on wednesday week way down in old bengal what unspeakable sadness said gumbrell as he stepped stepped through the intricacies of the trot eternal passion eternal pain les chants de ses pères sont les chants les plus beaux et j'en sais des mortels qui sont de peur sanglot rum tittle hum tum pom pom amen what's he to hecuba nothing at all nothing mark you nothing 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 repeated mrs Levish. i know all about that she sighed i'm nothing to you said gumbrell gliding with skill between the wall and the charybdis of a couple dangerously experimenting with a new step you are nothing to me thank god and yet here we are two bodies with but a single thought a beast with two backs a perfectly united centaur trotting trotting they trotted what see to hecuba the grinning blackamoors repeated the question reiterated the answer on a tone of frightful unhappiness the saxophone warbled on the verge of anguish the couples revolved marked time stepped and stepped with an habitual precision as though performing some ancient and profoundly significant rite some were in fancy dress for this was a gala night at the cabaret young women disguised as calipigus florentine pages blue breeched gondoliers black breeched toreadors circulated moonlike round the hall clasped sometimes in the arms of arabs or white clowns or more often of untravestied partners the faces reflected in the mirrors were the sort of faces one feels one ought to know by sight the cabaret was artistic what's he to hecuba mrs Levish murmured the response almost piously as though she were worshipping almighty and omnipresent nil i adore this tune she said this divine tune it filled up a space it moved it jigged it set things twitching in you it occupied time it gave you a sense of being alive divine tune divine tune 
she repeated with emphasis and she shut her eyes trying to abandon herself trying to float trying to give nil the slip ravishing little toreador that said gumbel who had been following the black breeched travesty with affectionate interest mrs lavish opened her eyes nil was unescapable with peers cotton you mean your tastes are a little common my dear theodore green-eyed monster mrs lavish laughed when i was being finished in paris she said mademoiselle always used to urge me to take fencing lessons c'est un exercise très gracieux et puis mrs lavish mimicked a passionate earnestness et puis ça développe le bassin your toreador gumbel looks as though she must be a champion with the foils quel bassin hush said gumbel they were abreast of the toreador and her partner piers cotton turned his long grey hound's nose in their direction how are you he asked across the music they nodded and you ah writing such a book cried piers cotton such a brilliant brilliant flashing book the dance was carrying them apart like a smile of false teeth he shouted across the widening gulf and disappeared in the crowd what's he to hecuba lachrymosely the hilarious blackamoors chanted their question mournfully pregnant with his foreknown reply nil omnipresent nil world soul spiritual informer of all matter nil in the shape of a black breeched moon basined toreador nil the man with the grey hound's nose nil as four blackamoors nil in the form of a divine tune nil the faces the face as one ought to know by sight reflected in the mirrors of the hall nil this gumbrel whose arm is round one's waist whose feet step in and out among one's own nothing at all that's why there'll be no wedding no wedding at st george's hanover square o oh, desperate experiment with nil viviche that charming boy that charming nothing at all engaged at the moment in hunting elephants hunting fever and carnivores among the tiki tiki pygmies that's why there'll be no wedding on wednesday week for lycidas is dead dead ere his prime for the light strawy hair not a lock left the brown face the red-brown hands and the smooth boy's body milk-white milk-warm are nothing at all nothing now at all nil these five years and the shining blue eyes as much nil as the rest always the same people complained mrs Vaviche, looking round the room the old familiar faces never any one knew where's the younger generation gumbrel we are old theodore there are millions younger than we are where are they i'm not responsible for them said gumbel i'm not even responsible for myself he imagined a cottagey room under the roof with a window near the floor and a sloping ceiling where you were always bumping your head and in the candlelight emily's candid eyes her grave and happy mouth in the darkness the curve under his fingers of her firm body why don't they come and sing for their supper mrs Vaviche went on petulantly it's their business to amuse us they are probably thinking of amusing themselves gumbrel suggested well then they should do it where we can see them what's he to hecuba nothing at all gumbrel clownishly sang the room in the cottage had nothing to do with him he breathed mrs Vaviche's memories of italian jasmines laid his cheek for a moment against her smooth hair nothing at all happy clown way down in old bengal under the green paradisiac palms among the ecstatic mystagogues and the saints who scream beneath the divine caresses the music came to an end the four negroes wiped their glistening faces the couples fell apart gumbrel and mrs Vaviche sat down and smoked a cigarette end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of antique hay by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain 
chapter sixteen the blackamoors had left the platform at the end of the hall the curtains looped up at either side had slid down cutting it off from the rest of the room making two worlds gumbrel elegantly and elusively put it where only one grew before and one of them a better world he added too philosophically because unreal there was the theatrical silence the suspense the curtains parted again on a narrow bed on a bier perhaps the corpse of a woman the husband kneels beside it at the foot stands the doctor putting away his instruments in a beribboned pink cradle reposes a monstrous baby the husband margaret margaret the doctor she is dead the husband margaret the doctor of septicemia i tell you the husband i wish that i too were dead the doctor but you won't to-morrow the husband to-morrow but i don't want to live to see to-morrow the doctor you will to-morrow the husband margaret margaret wait for me there i shall not fail to meet you in that hollow vale the doctor you will not be slow to survive her the husband christ have mercy upon us the doctor you would do better to think of the child the husband rising and standing menacingly over the cradle is that the monster the doctor no worse than others the husband begotten in a night of immaculate pleasure monster may you live loveless in dirt and impurity the doctor conceived in lust and darkness may your own impurity always seem heavenly monster in your own eyes the husband murderer slowly die all your life long the doctor the child must be fed the husband fed with what the doctor with milk the husband her milk is cold in her breasts the doctor there are still cows the husband tubercular short horns calling let short in the horn be brought voices off short in the horn short in the horn fadingly short in the the doctor in nineteen hundred and twenty one twenty seven thousand nine hundred and thirteen women died in childbirth the husband but none of them belong to my harem the doctor each of them was somebody's wife the husband doubtless but the people we don't know are only characters in the human comedy we are the tragedians the doctor not in the spectator's eyes the husband do i think of the spectators ah margaret margaret the doctor the twenty seven thousand nine hundred and fourteenth the husband the only one the doctor but here comes the cow short in the horn is let in by a yokel the husband ah good short in the horn he pats the animal she was tested last week was she not the yokel ay sir the husband and found tubercular no the yokel even in the udders may it please you the husband excellent milk me the cow sir into this dirty wash pot the yokel i will sir he milks the cow the husband her milk her milk is cold already all the woman in her children curdled within her breasts ah jesus what miraculous galactagogues will make it flow again the yokel 
the wash-pot is full sir the husband then take the cow away the yokel come short in the horn come up good short in the horn he goes out with the cow the husband pouring the milk into a long tubed feeding bottle here's for you monster to drink your own health in he gives the bottle to the child curtain a little ponderous perhaps said gumbrel as the curtain came down but i like the cow mrs Vavish opened her cigarette case and found it empty gumbrel offered her one of his she shook her head i don't want it in the least she said yes the cow was in the best pantomime tradition gumbrel agreed ah but it was a long time since he had been to a christmas pantomime not since dan lino's days all the little cousins the uncles and aunts on both sides of the family dozens and dozens of them every year they fill the best part of a row in the dress circle at drury lane and buns were stickily passed from hand to hand chocolates circulated the grown-ups drank tea and the pantomime went on and on glory after glory under the shining arch of the stage hours and hours and the grown-ups always wanted to go away before the harlequinade and the children felt sick from eating too much chocolate or wanted with such extreme urgency to go to the w c that they had to be let out trampling and stumbling over everybody else's feet and every stumble making the need more agonizingly great in the middle of the transformation scene and there was dan lino inimitable dan lino dead now as poor york no more than a mere skull like anybody else's skull and his mother he remembered used to laugh at him sometimes till the tears ran down her cheeks she used to enjoy things thoroughly with a whole heart i wish they'd hurry up with the second scene said mrs Vavish. if there's anything that bores me it's en tracte. most of one's life is en tracte, said gumbel whose present mood of hilarious depression seemed favourable to the enunciation of apothems none of your cracker mottoes please protested mrs Vavish. all the same she reflected what was she doing now but waiting for the curtain to go up again waiting with what unspeakable weariness of spirit for the curtain that had rung down ten centuries ago on those blue eyes that bright strawy hair and the weathered face thank god she said with an expiring earnestness here's the second scene the curtain went up in a bald room stood the monster grown now from an infant into a frail and bent young man with bandy legs at the back of the stage a large window giving on to a street along which people pass the monster solace the young girls of sparta they say used to wrestle naked with naked spartan boys the sun caressed their skins till they were brown and transparent like amber or a flask of olive oil their breasts were hard their bellies flat they were pure with the chastity of beautiful animals their thoughts were clear their minds cool and untroubled i spit blood into my handkerchief and sometimes i feel in my mouth something slimy soft and disgusting like a slug and i have coughed up a shred of my lung the rickets from which i suffered in childhood have bent my bones and made them old and brittle all my life i have lived in this huge town whose domes and spires are wrapped in a cloud of stink that hides the sun the slug dank tatters of lung that i spit out are black with the soot i have been breathing all these years i am now come of age long expected one and twenty has made me a fully privileged citizen of this great realm of which the owners of the daily mirror the news of the world and the daily express are noble peers somewhere 
i must logically infer there must be other cities built by men for men to live in somewhere in the past in the future a very long way off but perhaps the only street improvement schemes that ever really improve the streets are schemes in the minds of those who live in them schemes of love mostly ah here she comes the young lady enters she stands outside the window in the street paying no attention to the monster she seems to be waiting for somebody she is like a pear tree in flower when she smiles it is as though there were stars her hair is like the harvest in an eclogue her cheeks are all the fruits of summer her arms and thighs are as beautiful as the soul of st catherine of siena and her eyes her eyes are plumless with thought and limpidly pure like the water of the mountains the young lady if i wait till the summer sail the crepe de chine will be reduced by at least two shillings a yard and on six camisoles that will mean a lot of money but the question is can i go from may till the end of july with the underclothing i have now the monster if i knew her i should know the universe the young lady my present ones are so dreadfully middle class and if roger should by any chance the monster or rather i should be able to ignore it having a private universe of my own the young lady if if he did well it might be rather humiliating with these i have like a servant's almost the monster love makes you accept the world it puts an end to criticism the young lady his hand already the monster dare i dare i tell her how beautiful she is the young lady on the whole i think i'd better get it now though it will cost more the monster desperately advancing to the window as though to assault a battery beautiful beautiful the young lady looking at him ha 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 the monster but i love you flowering pear tree i love you golden harvest i love you fruitage of summer i love you body and limbs with the shape of a saint's thought the young lady redoubles her laughter ha 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 the monster taking her hand you cannot be cruel he is seized with a violent paroxysm of coughing which doubles him up which shakes and torments him the handkerchief he holds to his mouth is spotted with blood the young lady you disgust me she draws away her skirts so that they shall not come in contact with him the monster but i swear to you i love i he is once more interrupted by his cough the young lady please go away in a different voice ah roger she advances to meet a snub-nosed lover with curly hair and a face like a groom's who passes along the street at this moment roger i've got the motor-bike waiting at the corner the young lady let's go then roger pointing to the monster what's that the young lady oh it's nothing in particular both roar with laughter roger escorts her out patting her familiarly on the back as they walk along the monster looking after her there's a wound under my left pap she has deflowered all women i cannot lord whispered mrs Davish how this young man bores me i confess replied gumbel i have rather a taste for moralities there is a pleasant uplifting vagueness about these symbolical generalized figures which pleases me you were always charmingly simple-minded said mrs Vavish. but who's this as long as the young man isn't left alone on the stage i don't mind another female figure has appeared in the street beyond the window it is the prostitute her face painted in two tones of red white green blue and black is the most tasteful of nature mort the prostitute hello ducky 
the monster hello the prostitute are you lonely the monster yes the prostitute would you like me to come in to see you the monster very well the prostitute shall we say thirty bob the monster as you like the prostitute come along then she climbs through the window and they go off together through the door on the left of the stage the curtains descend for a moment then rise again the monster and the prostitute are seen issuing from the door at which they went out the monster taking out a cheque-book and a fountain pen thirty shillings the prostitute thank you not a cheque i don't want any cheques how do i know it isn't the dud one that they'll refuse payment for at the bank ready money for me thanks the monster but i haven't got any cash on me at the moment the prostitute well i won't take a cheque once bitten twice shy i can tell you the monster but i tell you i haven't got any cash the prostitute well all i can say is here i stay till i get it and what's more if i don't get it quick i'll make a row the monster but this is absurd i offer you a perfectly good check the prostitute and i won't take it so there the monster well then take my watch it's worth more than thirty bob he pulls out his gold half hunter the prostitute thank you and get myself arrested as soon as i take it to the pop shop no i want cash i tell you the monster but where the devil do you expect me to get it at this time of night the prostitute i don't know but you've got to get it pretty quick the monster you're unreasonable the prostitute aren't there any servants in this house the monster yes the prostitute well go and borrow it from one of them the monster but really that would be too low too humiliating the prostitute all right i'll begin kicking up a noise i'll go to the window and yell till all the neighbors are woken up and the police come to see what's up you can borrow it from the copper then the monster you really won't take my check i swear to you it's perfectly all right there's plenty of money to meet it the prostitute oh shut up no more dilly-dallying give me my money at once or i'll start the row one two three she opens her mouth wide as if to yell the monster all right he goes out the prostitute nice state of things we're coming to when young rips try and swindle us poor girls out of our money mean stinking skunks i'd like to slit the throats of some of them the monster coming back again here you are he hands her money the prostitute examining it thank you dear any other time you're lonely the monster no no the prostitute where did you get it finally the monster i woke the cook the prostitute goes off into a peal of laughter well so long ducky she goes out the monster sola somewhere there must be love like music love harmonious and ordered two spirits two bodies moving contrapuntally together somewhere the stupid brutish act must be made to make sense must be enriched must be made significant lust like diabelli's waltz a stupid air turned by a genius into three and thirty fabulous variations somewhere oh dear sighed mrs Vavish. charming gumbel protested love like sheets of silky flame like landscapes brilliant in the sunlight against the background of purple thunder like the solution of a cosmic problem like faith crikey said mrs Vavish. somewhere somewhere but in my veins creep the maggots of the pox really really mrs Vavish shook her head too medical crawling towards the brain crawling into the mouth burrowing into the bones insatiably the monster threw himself to the ground and the curtain came down and about time too declared mrs Vavish. charming gabriel stuck to his guns charming charming there was a disturbance near the door mrs Vavish looked round to see what was happening and now on top of it all she said here comes coleman raving with an unknown drunk have we missed it coleman was shouting have we missed all the lovely bloody farce lovely bloody his companion repeated with drunken raptures and he went into fits of uncontrollable laughter he was a very young boy with straight dark hair and a face of hellenic beauty now distorted with tipsiness 
coleman greeted his acquaintances in the hall shouting a jovial obscenity to each and bumbril gumbril he exclaimed catching sight of him at last in the front row and hetaira myra he pushed his way through the crowd followed unsteadily by his young disciple so you're here he said standing over them and looking down with an enigmatic malice in his bright blue eyes where's the physiologue am i the physiologue's keeper asked gumbril he's with his glands and his hormones i suppose not to mention his wife he smiled to himself where the hormones there moan i said coleman skidding off sideways along the slippery word i hear by the way that there's a lovely prostitute in this play you've missed her said mrs Vavish. what a misfortune said coleman we've missed the delicious trawl he said turning to the young man the young man only laughed let me introduce by the way said coleman this is dante he pointed to the dark-haired boy and i am virgil we're making a round tour or rather a descending spiral tour of hell but we're only at the first circle so far these allegory are two damned souls though not as you might suppose paolo and francesca the boy continued to laugh happily and uncomprehendingly another of these interminable entr'actes complained mrs Vavish. i was just saying to theodore here that if there's one thing i dislike more than another it's a long entr'acte would hers ever come to an end and if there's one thing i dislike more than another said the boy breaking silence for the first time with an air of the greatest earnestness it's it's one thing more than another and you're perfectly right in doing so said coleman perfectly right i know the boy replied modestly when the curtain rose again it was on an aged monster with a black patch over the left side of his nose no hair no teeth and sitting harmlessly behind the bars of an asylum the monster asses apes and dogs milton called them that he should have known somewhere there must be men however the variations on diabelli proved it brunelleschi's dome is more than the magnification of cleo de Morode's breast somewhere there are men with power living reasonably like our mythical greeks and romans living cleanly the images of the gods are their portraits they walk under their own protection the monster climbs onto a chair and stands in the posture of a statue jupiter father of gods a man i bless myself i throw bolts at my own disobedience i answer my own prayers i pronounce oracles to satisfy the questions i myself propound i abolish all tetters poxes blood-spitting rotting of bones with love i recreate the world from within europa puts it in to squalor leda does away with tyranny danae tempers stupidity after establishing these reforms in the social sewer i climb i climb up through the manhole out of the manhole beyond humanity for the manhole even the manhole is dark though not so dingy as the dog hole it was before i altered it up through the manhole towards the air up up and the monster suiting the action to his words climbs up the runged back of his chair and stands by a miraculous feat of acrobacy on the topmost bar i begin to see the stars through others eyes than my own more than dog already i become more than man i begin to have inklings of the shape and sense of things upwards upwards i strain i peer i reach aloft the balanced monster reaches strains and peers and i seize i seize as he shouts these words the monster falls heavily head foremost to the floor he lies there quite still after a little time the door opens and the doctor of the first scene enters with the warder the warder i heard a crash the doctor who has by this time become immensely old and has a beard like father tim's it looks as though you were right he examines the monster the warder he was for ever climbing on to his chair the doctor well he won't any more his neck's broken the warder you don't say so the doctor i do the warder well i never the doctor have it carried down to the dissecting room the warder i'll send for the porters at once exeunt severally and curtain well said mrs Vavish, i'm glad that's over the music struck up again saxophone and jello with the thin draught of the violin to cool their ecstasies 
and the thumping piano to remind them of business cumberland and mrs Vavish slid out into the dancing crowd revolving as though by force of habit these substitutes for the genuine copulative article said coleman to his disciple are beneath the dignity of hell-hounds like you and me charmed the young man laughed he was attentive as though at the feet of socrates coleman had found him in a night-club where he had gone in search of zoe found him very drunk in the company of two formidable women fifteen or twenty years his senior who were looking after him half maternally out of pure kindness of heart half professionally for he seemed to be carrying a good deal of money he was incapable of looking after himself coleman had pounced on him at once claimed an old friendship with the youth was too tipsy to be able to deny and carried him off there was something he always thought peculiarly interesting about the spectacle of children tobogganing down into the cesspools i like this place said the young man tastes differ coleman shrugged his shoulders the german professors have catalogued thousands of people whose whole pleasure consists in eating dung the young man smiled and nodded rather vaguely is there anything to drink here he asked too respectable coleman answered shaking his head i think this is a bloody place said the young man ah but some people like blood and some like boots and some like long gloves and corsets and some like birch rods and some like sliding down slopes and can't look at michelangelo's knife on the medici tombs without dying the little death because the statue seems to be sliding and some but i want something to drink insisted the young man coleman stamped his feet waved his arms a boire a boire he shouted like the newborn gargantua nobody paid any attention the music came to an end cumberland and mrs Vavish reappeared dante said coleman calls for drink we must leave the building yes anything to get out of this said mrs Vavish. what's the time cumberland looked at his watch half past one mrs Vavish sighed can't possibly go to bed she said for another hour at least they walked out into the street the stars were large and brilliant overhead there was a little wind that almost seemed to come from the country cumberland thought so at any rate he thought of the country the question is where said coleman you can come to my bordello if you like but it's a long way off and zoe hates us all so much she'll probably set on us with a meat chopper if she's back again that is though she may be out all night zoe mu sa agapo shall we risk it to me it's quite indifferent said mrs Vavish, faintly as though wholly preoccupied with expiring or there's my place cumberland said abruptly as though shaking himself awake out of some dream but you live still farther don't you said coleman with venerable parents and so forth one foot in the grave and all that shall we mingle hornpipes with funerals he began to hum chopin's funeral march at three times its proper speed and seizing the younger stranger in his arms two stepped two or three turns of the pavement then released his hold and let him go reeling against the area railings no i don't mean the family mansion said gumbel i mean my own rooms they are quite near in great russell street i never knew you had any rooms theodore said mrs Vavish. nobody did why should they know now because the wind seemed almost a country wind there's drink there he said splendid cried the young man they were all splendid people there's some gin said gumbel capital aphrodisiac coleman commented some light white wine diuretic and some whisky the great emetic said coleman come on and he struck up the march of the fascisti giovanezza giovanezza primavera di bellezza the noise went fading down the dark empty streets the gin the white wine and even for the sake of the young stranger who wanted to sample everything the emetic whisky were produced i like your room said mrs Vavish, looking around her and i resent your secrecy about them theodore drink puppy coleman refilled the boy's glass here's to secrecy gumbrel proposed shut it tightly keep it dark covered up be silent prevaricate lie out like he laughed and drank do you remember he went on those instructive advertisements of eno's fruit salt they used to have when we were young there was one little anecdote about a doctor who advised the hypochondriacal patient who had come to consult him to go and see grimaldi the clown and the patient answered i am grimaldi do you remember no said mrs Vavish, and why do you oh i don't know or rather i do know gumbrel corrected himself and laughed again the young man suddenly began to boast 
i lost two hundred pounds yesterday playing chemin de fer he said and looked round for applause coleman patted his curly head delicious child he said you're positively hogarthian angrily the boy pushed him away what are you doing he shouted then turned and addressed himself once more to the others i couldn't afford it you know not a bloody penny of it not my money either he seemed to find it exquisitely humorous and that two hundred wasn't all he added almost expiring with mirth tell coleman how you barred his beard theodore grumble was looking intently into his glass as though he hoped to see in its pale mixture of gin and sauterne visions as in a crystal of the future mrs lavish touched him on the arm and repeated her injunction oh that said gumbrell rather irritably no it isn't an interesting story oh yes it is i insist said mrs lavish commanding peremptorily from her deathbed gumbrell drank his gin and sauterne very well then he said reluctantly and began i don't know what my governor will say the young man put in once or twice but nobody paid any attention to him he relapsed into a sulky and it seemed to him very dignified silence under the warm jolly tipsiness he felt a chill of foreboding he poured out some more whisky gumbrell warmed to his anecdote expiringly mrs vavish laughed from time to time or smiled her agonizing smile coleman whooped like a redskin and after the concert to these rooms said gumbrell well let everything go into the mud leave it there and let the dogs lift their hind legs over it as they pass ah the genuine platonic fumblers commented coleman i am grimaldi grumble laughed further than this it was difficult to see where the joke could go there on the couch where mrs vavish and coleman were now sitting she had lain sleeping in his arms towsing in elizabethan said coleman unreal eternal in the secret darkness a night that was an eternal parenthesis among the other nights and days i feel i'm going to be sick said the young man suddenly he had wanted to go on silently and haughtily sulking but his stomach declined to take part in the dignified game good lord said gumbrell and jumped up but before he could do anything effective the young man had fulfilled his own prophecy the real charm about debauchery said coleman philosophically is its total pointlessness futility and above all its incredible tediousness if it really were all rose as an exhilaration as these poor children seem to imagine it would be no better than going to church or studying the higher mathematics i should never touch a drop of wine or another harlot again it would be against my principles i told you it was emetic he called to the young man and what are your principles asked mrs vavish oh strictly ethical said coleman you're responsible for this creature said gumbrell pointing to the young man who was sitting on the floor near the fireplace cooling his forehead against the marble of the mantelpiece you must take him away really what a bore his nose and mouth were all wrinkled up with disgust i'm sorry the young man whispered he kept his eyes shut and his face was exceedingly pale but with pleasure said coleman what's your name he asked the young man and where do you live my name is porteus murmured the young man good lord said gumbrell letting himself fall on to the couch beside mrs vavish that's the last straw End of chapter sixteen